Chapter 78 Ike and I had arranged a system of signals so we could communicate without anyone knowing it. It was a crude code, and it couldn't convey much in the way of information, but it worked. When I needed to send him a message, I would put three rocks on the roof of my shelter. He would see them and open the door to the catwalks, and I would sneak up to his guardhouse. We'd set up a signal that he could send as well, one that would tell me Ike needed to talk to me. He had only used it once before, so I was very surprised when I found the empty pouch of an MRE lying in the mud near a certain yellow brick pillar. I glanced upward involuntarily, as if I expected to see him up there, as if I expected him to be waiting for me, waving and jumping up and down. Of course, he wasn't there. It would get him in a lot of trouble to be seen even making eye contact with a positive, much less talking to one. So I lowered my eyes and went about my business. But that night, I told Luke I needed him to run an errand. I needed a new blanket. The one I lay on at night was full of holes. Summer was coming to an end, and the nights were getting colder. I found an unused food receipt and said he could trade it for a new blanket. Right now? It's already dark out, he said. All the stores will be closed. For this, I said, shaking the receipt, they'll open back up. Please, Luke. I nearly froze last night. Maybe he suspected something was up, but he didn't say anything. He left on my invented errand. I really did need a new blanket, but I could have waited. And I hurriedly dressed and went to the door of the shelter to wait for Ike. I didn't have to wait long. Ike shone his flashlight down on me from above, and I moved quickly and quietly to the guardhouse with its televisions and its controls for all the camp's power. It was a room I had become familiar with, just another part of the camp, for all its difference from the shelters and sheds below. This time, Kylie was there, which always made me glad, at least until I got a good look at her. She was sitting on a stool in front of the television screens, her hands folded in her lap. The blue and orange glow from the screens made long colored shadows across her eyes and highlighted the scar across her nose. I couldn't believe how beautiful she looked, just sitting there, but beautiful like a statue or a sculpture. There was no life in her face, her posture. Like an optical illusion, her beauty faded as I studied her. I started to see what the camp had done to her. Her hair was filthy, and her clothes were in tatters. There were fresh bruises on her forearms. You've been in a fight, I said. You got bruises like that from trying to protect your head when someone was kicking you. I should know. She glanced up at me. She didn't say anything. She just sat there looking at me, blinking occasionally. She was very far gone. I thought she wanted to say something, but the words wouldn't come. Something very bad had happened, I thought, and my stomach clenched in nausea. Kylie's armor was nothing new to me. I knew she could make herself a zombie if it meant surviving in a world full of pain and horror. But this was worse than it had ever been. She wasn't just a zombie. She was dead for all intents and purposes. Ike filled me in on what was going on. After that first time, that time she came up here and you guys talked, he said. She and I set up a system like the one you and I have. If she ever needed me, she just had to put some rocks out in a certain pattern and I would see it. Sure, I said. I shook my head to clear it. I mean, thank you, Ike. It means a lot to me that you're looking out for her. He shrugged. I know you run a big risk every time you contact us, I said. Believe me, I'd be dead right now if not for you. I guess, whatever. As I was saying, I set up the system with her, but she never used it. I would have fed her, got her stuff, whatever, but she never signaled me. Until yesterday. I went down to find her, and she was like this, though. I don't know what she wanted. She must have wanted it pretty bad, but now she can't even tell me what it is. I came and got you because I figured you might know. He shook his head. Listen, we've only got a few minutes before I have to send you back. Maybe you can talk to her. I nodded. I went over and squatted down in front of Kylie, where she couldn't help but see me. I reached up and touched one of her hands. She didn't pull it away, but she didn't move it either. It's me, Kylie. It's Finn. Stones. Her face didn't change, but her lips moved. She said, Stones, though so softly I could barely hear it. After a second, 
her brow furrowed as if she was trying desperately to remember something. Finnegan, she said. Finn. That's right. Finn. I need. She stopped. I waited for her to finish the thought, but she didn't. What do you need, Kylie? What did you want to tell me? Very slowly, she nodded. She had it now. Oh, right. It was about Heather, she said. And she did something very weird. She gave a little self-conscious laugh and reached up and pulled her hair down over her eyes. It was the gesture of a normal teenage girl, maybe one a few years younger than Kylie. I thought it might have been something she would have done before she became a positive, before she was abducted in the wilderness. You know, Heather? Mystified as I was, I knew this had to be important. I do know her. How's she doing? I asked. Kylie had said at our last meeting that Heather was having trouble getting used to the camp. She's sick, Kylie said, pulling her shoulders up around her ears. Something inside her seemed to have broken. She's sick, and I think she's going to die. Oh, and she joined a cult, Kylie continued. I thought you should know. Then she looked up at Ike. He jumped. He didn't know her as well as I did, and I guess she unnerved him. That's all, she said to him. You can take me back now. Chapter 79 She stood up and headed over toward Ike, clearly done with what she'd come for. What? No, wait, I said. I grabbed her arm and pulled her around until she was looking at me. She offered no resistance. What do you mean? She's sick, like, with a fever, or, or... I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to ask if Heather was suffering from bad headaches. She was a positive. If she was infected, if she was about to zombie out, Kylie's voice was perfectly flat as she told me what had happened. There were some women who didn't like us. They said we were stuck up. I don't know what that means. They waited for us by our workplace one night, and they beat us up. It wasn't too bad. Adair did worse sometimes. I had to look away and bite my lip. I'd brought the two of them here to this place. It didn't matter in the slightest that I'd thought it would be better. I'd gotten them into this. I was okay, but she got it worse. Heather, I mean. She had a big cut on her arm, where one of them kicked her hard enough to break the skin. It was just a cut, but then it got worse. It got all red and purple, and then it started to smell really bad. Then she got feverish, and yesterday morning she couldn't get up. I told her if she didn't get up and come to work, she couldn't eat, but she didn't listen to me. Jesus. I could only imagine how frightened Heather must have been. And with no one there to comfort her but Kylie, who wasn't exactly a model of tact. I went to work without her. My boss hit me because she said I was responsible for Heather, and now we were short a worker. It didn't hurt all that much. Kylie, you said she joined a cult. What did you mean? Yes, Kylie said. She seemed to struggle to get the words out. These people, they worship a... a skeleton. Some women came, and they said Heather was going to die. They could tell. Heather started crying, but they hushed her, and one of them stroked her forehead and told her it was all right that she was going to die, but that that was a good thing, that it could be a wonderful thing. They carried her away. That was the last time I saw her. Then I put the signal out for your friend, except I can't remember why I did that. I looked up at Ike. I have to stop this, I told him. Why are you looking at me? He asked. Take me over there. Take me down into the female camp right now. Oh, oh, no. Oh, fuck no, Ike said, shaking his head. Oh, no. Do you have any idea what would happen if I let a male into the female population? I would be court-martialed. Do you even know what a court-martial is? I'm sure it's bad, but Ike, a girl's life depends on this. We have to do it. He started to protest again. 
There was no time for it. No time to explain to him how much I owed Heather, how much I needed to do this. I rushed out of the guardhouse and across the catwalks, running toward the female camp. Ike came running after me, his rifle in his hands. I think he wanted to shoot me, to stop me, to keep me from getting any farther. But something in our past, our old friendship, stopped him. Which column do I want? I demanded when he caught up with me. I was over the female camp by that point, looking down into the murk. It looked very much like the male camp, of course. There could only be so many possible variations on corrugated tin and scrap lumber. Just like in the male camp, the catwalks ran over every part of it, supported by yellow brick pillars. One of them had to be hollow, with a spiral staircase inside. The guards would need some way to get down there. This is it, Finn. This is it. You stop now. He had his rifle in his hands, and it was pointed at me. I'd seen him shoot my mother, but somehow I knew he would never shoot me. The deal we had? You take another step and that's over. No more MREs. No more late night visits. You're fucking up a good thing. You can't be over here. You think my CO doesn't know that I help you out sometimes? They know? My bosses tolerate a little bit of rule breaking, Ike said. They put up with a tiny bit of it for whatever reason, but they won't let this go. Come on, Ike. This, he said, gesturing at the female camp with his rifle. This is not okay. This is not fucking okay. You head back now. You go back to your crappy little house right now, or we're done. I studied his face, trying to determine just how serious he was. Pretty serious by the look of it. But I had to do what I had to do. Fine, I said. I take the latter option. What? You take me down there, into the female camp so I can help my friend, and then our arrangement is over. You never have to worry about me again. Chapter 80 Ike took me down the hollow column and unlocked the door at its bottom. When you come back, knock three times and I'll open this up for you and take you back to your own place. A little light burned inside the hollow column, and I could see just how grim his face had become. You know you can't bring her back with you. I know. Kylie came down the stairs behind us, and for a second, I thought Ike would shoot her, he was so jumpy. But instead, he just shook his head and switched off the light. He opened the door for us, and we headed out into the female camp. In the dark, in the mud, it should have looked exactly like the male camp. It had all the same elements and was just as featureless as my side of the camp, but it was just different enough to be creepy. Everything was in the wrong place, the shelters clumped in strange patterns. They had a well for fresh water, right in the middle of their camp. It added up to make me feel like all of reality had been strangely twisted. That, or I was just afraid of being caught. Kylie led me to a shelter near the wall. This is where the sick women go, she said. We saw no one on our way there, but when we arrived, I was shocked to see a little light coming from inside. I glanced through a crack between two planks of crumbling wood and saw candles burning inside. You have candles? I whispered. How did you get candles? We make them, she said. That's what we do for work here. Candles and soap, and we patch up old clothes. Sometimes we steal some of what we make. Another weird thing. I'd assumed the female camp was hard at work putting together circuit boards, just like the male camp. But Luca told me that sometimes the work changed, and that it wouldn't always be circuit boards. I guess the army needed other things, too. I knew nothing, then, of the old division of labor that had been disappearing even before the crisis, the idea that there was such a thing as woman's work, as opposed to that done by men. It seemed that someone in the camp's administration still thought that way. Whatever. It didn't matter. I wasn't here to learn about the female camp. I found the door of the makeshift shelter and stepped inside. A group of women were kneeling on the floor together, in front of a foot-high statue of a human skeleton. It looked like it was made of wax and had been carefully, if inexpertly, sculpted. I could make out the various bones and even tiny carved teeth in the miniature skull. 
One of the women looked up and saw me, and she gasped. The others jumped up and pressed back, moving away from the door. The only exposure to men these women had since coming to the camp had been the leering suggestions of the men who pressed up against the fence between the two camps, the ones who called out rude suggestions all day long, the ones who shouted out their fantasies of what they would do if they ever got through that fence. The women I was facing now must have thought I was there to ravage the lot of them. I might have corrected them, but the last thing I wanted was for them to think I was safe, that they could shout at me to get out, and I would. I needed to do this quickly and quietly, and if that meant scaring them, I was okay with that. Heather, I said. Where's Heather? They didn't say a word, but one of them, younger than the rest, glanced toward a little alcove at the back of the shed. I pushed past her and headed back there, Kylie in tow. I knew I was in the right place when the smell hit me. Flies buzzed angrily and swarmed around my face as I pushed aside a threadbare curtain and looked in on Heather. She was lying on a makeshift mattress of piled blankets, and a candle burned by her head. The sleeve of her shirt had been torn away to expose the wound on her right arm. It was festering, and badly. Weeping pustules had formed all around the gash, and I could see black veins under her greenish skin. As I knelt down beside her, I could hear her laboring for breath, and I could see that her eyes, while open, weren't focusing on anything. Heather, I said. I grabbed her hand, her left hand with its plus sign tattoo. Heather, it's me, Finnegan. I've come to get you out of here. It's the least I could do. Kai, Kai, Heather gasped. Kylie's here too. She came and got me. I know she isn't the warmest of people, but she does care about you, Heather. She wanted to save you. Kylie, she managed to pant. Kylie, why? You know, know what I want. It's going to be okay, I told Heather. I know, know it is. Came to, to save me? From what? These people out there, I said, pointing back toward the main room. I'm not sure what they think they're doing here. They're helping me die, Heather said. Her eyes were fever bright. I started to shake my head, but she had more to say. Die the right way, she said, nodding a little. Die? So, somebody- She coughed, then had a single spasm that seemed like it would shatter her fragile body. So, somebody else can live. What? I couldn't understand. If I die now, then somebody else doesn't have to. That's nuts, Heather. That's nonsense. It doesn't work that way. I don't know what they've been telling you, but if you die like this, you just, you just die. But if you fight this thing, if we can get you some medicine, you could live. Make it through your time in the camp, and then you can go home. Don't you want to see your family again? Your old friends? Not going to happen. This way, this way I do something good. Something important. Not just survival, Heather told me. She looked so very weak and tired. Something more? There has to be something more in a life. These women who taught you that? She squeezed my hand. I could barely feel it, but I could see the angelic smile on her face. They didn't teach me. Anything you did, Finnegan. I... what? When you sacrificed yourself, went with Red Kate so we could get here. You didn't know. You thought this place was safe. I... I... Showed me... What a life is worth. I tried to argue with her further, 
but it was no use. Talking had worn her out, and soon her eyelids were drooping, and she stopped speaking altogether. I turned to Kylie then and glared at her. Why hadn't she sent for me sooner? Why had she waited until Heather was about to die? But of course it wasn't Kylie's fault. Kylie was just convenient. I knew if I lashed out at her, she wouldn't fight back. I stopped myself before I could say anything I might regret and hurried out into the main room. The women there were still pressed up against the walls, staying as far away from me as possible. True hatred is a rare thing, even in this desperate world. But I hated those women. I hated everything they believed, everything they'd created. I would gladly have torn down their wax skeleton and stamped on it. If it had been in my power, I would have eradicated their little religion from the earth. She's going to die for nothing, I told them. Your belief is false. Your idol means nothing. Of course, one of them said. It's only an image. Something to focus on while we pray. We know death looks nothing like that. I shook my head. You're full of crap. This idea that you can somehow transfer life, give it to somebody else, it's crap. The woman who had spoken gave me the same sweet smile Heather had shown. You can't know that. You can't prove it. Suddenly I couldn't handle it anymore. I couldn't look at these women and argue with them as if they were rational people. I stormed out of their shelter and back to the hollow column, fuming all the way. I knocked, and Ike let me in. Neither of us said a word as he escorted me back to the mail camp. When I got back down to my own patch of mud, he closed the door in the column behind me. I heard its lock turn with a terrible finality, and I was alone. Chapter 81 I could not stop thinking about Heather, lying in candlelight, lying there, waiting to die. I tried to think of other things, but I couldn't get the images out of my mind. Kylie, so far gone, she'd lost the power of speech. How long before she stopped eating? Would she go and kneel in front of the skeleton idol? Would she offer up her life? Maybe she'd give it to me. Or Luke. Or somebody in California none of us would ever meet. The reed bends. The oak breaks. She was supposed to be a survivor. She had built that armor to protect herself. But maybe even reeds break if the wind blows hard enough. I felt so helpless, so powerless. I knew I had to do something, something to help Heather, to convince Kylie that there was some reason to hope, to keep living. But what could I possibly do? It was hard to concentrate on work. My productivity dropped, and twice I broke a circuit board by plugging the component into the wrong slot. The first time, Fetter refused to let me eat. The second time, he said I was in for a beating. A bad one this time. I thought about the last one, which barely left me able to move. I was filled with the need to attack, to run at Fetter and hurt him before he could hurt me, as stupid as I knew the impulse was. I considered running away, but there was nowhere I could go, nowhere I could get away from him. As he stomped toward me, every muscle in my body cringed, and I thought, no, thought is the wrong word. What went through my head then was nothing short of animal instinct. I ducked my head, put out my arms, and threw myself at him, aiming my skull right for his stomach. I think I was trying to knock the wind out of him, but that suggests I had some kind of plan. In my brain, there were visions of getting him on his back and tearing into his guts with my fingernails, tearing out his still beating heart and holding it over my head like a prize. The reality, of course, was a lot more prosaic. I did hit him, and I did knock the wind out of him, but Fetter had strength to spare. He wrapped one arm around my waist and picked me up like a bag of potatoes. I'd lost a lot of weight in the camp, and I don't think he even had a strain to carry me like that. He stepped outside the work shelter and dropped me on my head in the mud. My head bent forward under my own weight, and I saw black spots swim before my vision. 
I managed to twist around, enough that I could look up. All I could see was Fetter's massive boot, caked in stinking mud, lifting up over my face. He was going to do it. He was really going to do it this time, stomp on my face, maybe crush my skull. When he'd beaten me before, it was almost clinical. I think that when I stood up to him, when I attacked him, I'd finally made him mad. Now, I was going to pay for it. Maybe with my life. Except it didn't come to that. Fetter! Someone shouted. The boot lowered to the ground beside my head. Fetter looked to his right. Fuck off, Maggie. This is none of your business. Don't be so hasty. A new guy walked into my field of view. I'd seen Mackie before, though I'd never spoken to him. He was a big guy, like Fetter, maybe not quite so big. He was a boss with his own work crew. That was how you got to be a boss, by being big enough to thrash your workers. Other than that, I knew nothing about him. How about I take this kid off your hands? Mackie asked. How about he comes to work for me? Looks like you're through with him. I'm not through until he's a puddle of blood and guts, Fetter said. Yet I could tell he had some respect for Mackie, that he wouldn't kill me until they'd finished their negotiation. He won't be much use to me dead, Mackie pointed out. Listen, I'll trade you. Any one of my guys for this one. Fetter looked confused, but not like he was deep in thought. We have a deal? Mackie asked. He reached down and hauled me to my feet. I still felt a little dizzy, but it wasn't too bad. I get one more punch, Fetter said, for my aggravation. Mackie mused that over for a second. Yeah, okay. Then Fetter punched me in the stomach so hard I couldn't eat for three days. I fell backward and landed on my ass in the mud and just lay there vomiting for a while. When I was done, Fetter was already gone. Mackie dragged me to my feet and took me back to his shelter, where he told me to lie down until he came for me. I tried very hard to go to sleep, because you don't feel pain when you're asleep. The problem with that idea is that if you're hurting enough, it keeps you awake. By the time Mackie came for me, the boredom was almost as bad as the pain. He stepped inside the shelter and looked down at me frowned like he wondered if he'd made a good deal with Fetter. Then he shrugged and helped me stand up. Come on, he said. Where are we going? To talk to some people, he told me. People who were very interested in you all of a sudden. Chapter 82 He took me to a shelter, a big one. You could stand up straight inside. There were no beds in it, just a table with some mismatched chairs. A deck of cards lay on the table, and I immediately thought of Luke's deck with its missing card. I wondered if Mackie might want to trade. But that wasn't why he'd brought me there. At first, we were alone inside the shelter, but soon it started to fill up with other people. They were big guys, covered in muscles, so well fed. Some of them had noses that looked like they'd been knocked to one side or bad scars. They'd been in lots of fights. None of them looked scared or tired or sick. I soon realized who they were. They were the bosses of all the work crews in the male camp. All of them. Fetter came in last of all, scowling at me, but he came. Mackie nodded at each one of the bosses as they came in. He slapped a couple of them on the back shared a laugh with one. It was clear to me he'd summoned his fellow bosses in for a meeting, and that I was the only item on the agenda. This is him, Mackie said. That was it. No preamble, no small talk. This is the guy who went up on the catwalks. I lifted my hands in protest. What? No way, I said. Mackie gave me a significant look. It was clear that if I lied to him now, there would be consequences. Maybe he would give me back to Fetter. You were seen, Mackie said. A couple of nights ago, one of my workers was out taking a piss. He saw you up there. I don't know how you got up on the catwalks. Maybe they have a pole with a hook and they lift you up there. One of the other bosses, I didn't know his name, broke out laughing. 
That's impossible, he said. Mackie gestured at me, as if it were my turn to talk. I just blinked at him. I'm sure he wanted me to say how I got up to the catwalks, but I kept my mouth shut. There was a lot of muscle in that room. I'll admit to being intimidated. Obviously, it's not impossible, Mackie said. We know it isn't. We've seen girls up there sometimes. What? The boss, the one who had laughed, asked. Mackie ignored him and turned to me. You know one of the guards, right? Is one of the guards gay? Are you fucking a guard? You watch the catwalks at night? I asked, instead of answering. Mackie frowned at me, like I'd disappointed him. We run this place, and there are people who'd love to see us eat shit and die, so we keep our eyes open, okay? Now answer the damn questions. You know a guard up there? Yeah, a friend of mine from... from before I came here, I admitted. Mackie nodded. Now we're getting somewhere. Finnegan's the guy you were talking about? Fetter asked. You could have told me it was one of mine. Why? So you would have known not to trade him to me? He's mine now, Mackie pointed out. So shut up. He looked around at the gathered bosses. I called you here because we need to figure out how to make this work for us. How we're going to benefit from it. They've got good food up there, one of the others said. Better than we get. There was a general murmur of assent. He could bring girls over here, someone else said. I mean, if they can go up on the cab walks, they can come down on this side, right? I won't do that, I said. I'd let them grind me to a paste before I started pimping for them. Not that I could have anyway. Ike was done with me. My access to the catwalks was over and done with. I didn't tell the bosses as much. You work for me now, Mackie pointed out. You'll do what I say. I can't. You can beat me, but I can't, I said. Mackie frowned. I think we're scaring him, he said. You guys, get out of here. The bosses just grumbled for a second and didn't move. I said get the fuck out of here, Mackie roared, and that got them moving. When they were gone, when it was just the two of us in the shelter, he gestured for me to sit down at the table. I sank gratefully into a chair. I'm not like Fetter, he said. I nodded. I'm not going to beat you up for working slow. I figured out a long time ago, people with broken arms can't work at all. So don't be so scared of me, okay? I must have frowned at that because he laughed. Look, I get it, he told me. You've had shit luck since you got here, and Fetter has got you sleeping with both eyes open. You think bosses are all about exploiting their people. Well, fine. That is part of it. But some of us, the smarter ones, we try to protect our people, too. Make their lives a little better. A happy worker is a productive worker. I can make your life here pretty easy. Maybe I believed him a little, but that just made me angry. How? I asked. Are you going to shoo the flies away from me? Are you going to give me someplace dry to sleep at night? That's not how things work here. Look, life is shit. But if you go along, you get along, right? I fumed for a while after he said that. I'd heard it one too many times. I refuse to accept that. Life doesn't have to be like this, I told him. I felt like Caxton was right behind me, one hand on my shoulder. If we all agreed, if we decided tomorrow we didn't have to live like this, things would change. They would get better. Yeah, see, that's the hard part, Mackie said. Getting people to agree on things. You even talk to anybody in this camp? You ask if the sky is blue, you'll get six different answers. I shook my head. You say you want to make life better for your workers? You're in charge here. You said that too. Then it's your responsibility to change things. You and all the bosses. He smirked at me like I was crazy. Look, just tell me you'll snag some of that good guard food the next time you go up on the catwalks, okay? That's all I need to hear for right now. I said nothing of the kind. I walked out of the shelter then, and he didn't try to stop me. Chapter 83 I started working for Mackie after that, and nothing much changed at all. He didn't beat me. 
That was nice. But I was still working the same shift, in the same dismal conditions. At the end of every work shift, he would tell me to stay behind, and he would ask me when I was going up on the catwalks. I told him I couldn't help him there, that I was done with the catwalks and the guards. But he didn't believe me. I kept pressuring him to organize the workers, to improve our conditions. He had one response to that. How? he would ask. And then something did change. One day, he asked that question, and I had an answer. I had a plan. I could see it all in my head, all the steps laid out in order. I'd felt helpless before, but Mackie wasn't helpless. The bosses weren't helpless, not if they worked together. He'd thought that by acquiring me, he would gain access to the catwalks. Instead, it seemed I had acquired him. A way to talk to the only real power in the camp, down at the level of the mud. A boss who would listen. So that day when he asked, how, I had an answer. I laid it all out for him. I showed him how it could work. How we could make it work if we just stuck together. How we could get concessions from the guards. Basic health care. Maybe I could save Heather's life. More food. Who knew how many lives that would make better? I could see in his eyes as I explained it that he almost believed it could work. Almost. In the end, he said he would think about it. He made a point of telling me he doubted he would get a yes, but he said he would take it to the other bosses. I walked back to the shelter I shared with Luke that evening, and for the first time since I'd come to the camp, I felt like life was worth living. Like maybe everything could be okay, that it would be okay. Like we had a chance. Luke and I stayed up late playing card games. We didn't work together anymore, but we were still friends, and I was absurdly grateful to him for that, for being kind to me when I needed it the most. I found myself smiling so much my face hurt. Late, when we should have been in bed, I needed to pee. I put down my cards and went outside, headed for the latrines. Before I got even halfway there, though, I stopped, froze in place. A light was shining down on me from the catwalks. Chapter 84 It turned out Ike wasn't done with me, after all. I was excited. This was great news, that Ike was still my friend and my ally. I was thrilled with my new plan. I felt like I could actually achieve something. I desperately wanted to talk to Ike about it, see if he had any thoughts, any way he could help me. But he wouldn't let me talk. He had news for me that couldn't wait. He just broke it to me plain. Your friend Heather died last night, he said. Oh. I sat down on the floor. It wasn't something I could control. I sat down because my legs wouldn't work anymore. Oh, I moaned. It was dangerously close to a wail. I'm, um, sorry, he said. Oh, I said. Oh, no. I didn't choose to make those sounds. Listen, Finn. You have to keep it down, Ike said. If somebody hears you... But I couldn't stop. For a long time, I just sat there making plaintive noises, rubbed at my face, at my shaved head. Heather. Dead. I was going to save her. I'd tried so hard to save her. She hadn't wanted to be saved in the end. She'd wanted to die as some kind of sacrifice. Some gift she would give to someone she might not even know. She thought her death could have some meaning if her life didn't. She died not blaming me for what happened to her. She died thinking I was some great teacher who'd shown her the way to true wisdom. That made it so much worse. And Kylie. What this would do to Kylie. The thoughts were so dense in my head I couldn't breathe. Eventually... I wiped the tears off my cheeks and carefully, slowly, I stood up. Listen, Ike said. What we said before, last time, I mean, when I said we were through, that wasn't true. It was never going to be true. I'll keep bringing you up here when I can. I'll keep helping you however I can. 
I think he was just so alarmed by my grief, he would have done anything to get me to stop wailing and blubbering. I don't think he meant me to hear what I heard then. Help me, I said. You want to help me? Yeah, Finn, look. Ike, I need your help. I need it badly, and it's going to be tricky for you. Maybe dangerous, but I need it. Truly. My big plan had to move forward. There was no doubt in my mind. Heather's death just made it all the more important, more meaningful than ever. And if it failed, and I got myself killed in the process, I would take Ike down with me if I had to. No more going along to get along. Things had to change. Chapter 85 The next day my plan went into effect, except I wasn't the one leading the charge. At the end of second shift, when I'd finished assembling so many circuit boards for Mackie that my fingers were bruised, I stepped out of the workshed with no thought in my mind but getting a food voucher for a stale sandwich. So you could say I was very surprised when I found Fetter out there. He was standing on an old rotten crate and shouting at everybody who walked past. Nobody goes to work tomorrow, he said. When the whistle blows, you just stay wrapped up in your nice warm sheets. No first shift, no second shift. Nobody works. Not until we get better food. I could only stare. My fellow workers listened or just walked away or did what they were going to do. But I stood there, staring. Because Fetter had somehow decided to put my grand plan into effect. By himself. The whole point of the thing had been to get all the bosses behind the plan all at the same time, to make sure every work crew refused to go to work, to stop the production of circuit boards entirely so the army couldn't fix its helicopters. I figured that was the only way to make them listen, to make them agree to our demands. I had worked up a whole list of those, ways to make the camp better, to make our lives more tolerable. First on the list was basic health care for the positives in the camp. Better food was on my list too, but it came farther down. Fetter apparently had reprioritized. Two sandwiches every damned day, he shouted. And more meat. We're starving down here. Nobody goes to work tomorrow. I saw Luke. He'd just come off his own work shift. He watched Fetter for a while, then came over to me and said, He must have gone crazy. What does he think he's going to achieve other than getting shot? Yeah, I said. Listen, I have to find Mackie. I ran to my new boss's shelter. He was in there reading a tattered magazine, something about a sport nobody had played since before the crisis. Have you seen what Fetter's doing? I asked Mackie. He got up and went outside. He scowled. God damn it, he said. He jumped the gun. We were still talking about this, about whether or not it would work. You were? I asked, somewhat surprised. Yeah. Believe it or not, some of us bosses think maybe you have a brain in your head, he told me. Looks like Fetter was going to vote yes. I figure he got ahead of himself because he wanted the credit for making this work. Maybe he thought it would make him king of the camp or something. The idea chilled me to my marrow. He grabbed a positive who was standing nearby. You, he said. Who do you work for? Michelson, the guy replied. Go get him and tell him to get all the other bosses together. When the guy had run off, I asked Mackie, What are you going to do? We're going to support Fetter. Help him out. What? I've been in a lot of fights, Finnegan, and I learned one thing. Once you're in it, don't look back. Hesitating gets you killed. I don't like how this started, but it's started, and we'll never get a second chance. Chapter 86 I don't know if any of the positives in that camp understood what a strike was. None of us knew anything about labor or capital or negotiations, but we all grasped the idea pretty quickly. The next morning, only about half of the workers showed up for first shift. None of the bosses did. The workers went inside their work sheds, and maybe they put circuit boards together, and maybe they just sat there waiting to be told what to do. I don't know. I was part of the strike. 
I was out there talking to people all day, trying to convince them not to work. I went from shelter to shelter, wherever they would let me in, and explained what we were doing and what we hoped to gain. A lot of the positives I talked to just stared at me, like they didn't understand, like it made no sense. Some were supportive, though not very many. Still, when the whistle blew for second shift, only a trickle of workers headed over to the work sheds. Mostly, it was the older guys, the ones who barely knew where they were. But among them were most of the shopkeepers, I noticed. The guys who ran the local economy, trading food vouchers or old magazines for clothes or toilet paper. I saw the guy who had sold me my shoes, and the one who had refused to give me clothes when I was naked until Luke vouched for me. Why aren't they on our side? I asked. They have as much to gain as anybody else. I was over by Mackie's shelter at the time, taking a quick break, eating an old sandwich so I would have the strength to continue my rabble-rousing. Mackie came out and leaned on the wall of his shelter and stared down the shopkeepers. One of them even turned around in shame and went back to his store. They think they have something to lose, Mackie explained to me. If nobody works, nobody has food vouchers, which means they've got nothing to trade, he shrugged. We don't need them. We need everybody, I said. We won't get everybody, but maybe we'll get enough. The next day the first shift whistle blew, and less than a quarter of the positives obeyed its call. Second shift was even less receptive. Fetter stood on his crate and shouted up at the catwalks that we would work only if they listened to his demands. His personal demands. Fetter was quite clear on that. There was a lot of groaning and complaining. People who didn't work didn't get food vouchers. They threatened Fetter, but of course, he just thrashed a couple of them and they quieted down. Others came to me and asked if I actually thought this was going to work. They went to Mackie and asked him if I was crazy. Somehow, people had figured out this wasn't just Fetter's game. In a quiet moment, I asked Mackie if he'd been telling people as much. He just smiled and said, Somebody's coming out of this as king of the camp. Somebody you know real well, Finnegan. Don't worry. Your part in this won't be forgotten. I didn't care. I had no desire to be remembered as some great agitator. I just wanted to make sure nobody else died like Heather. The next morning, we all stood around waiting for the first shift whistle to sound. It never did. Instead, the guards responded to us. Chapter 87 Loudspeakers blared to life all around the camp. A wail of feedback made sure every single positive would be listening. Due to the recent breakdown in discipline, a voice told us, there will be no work shifts today. There will also be no food distribution. A few of the positives shouted back, nothing coherent, just defiance or rage. The things people called out had nothing to do with having their rations cut off. Something had changed in the camp. Something ugly was building just below the surface of things. It was going to take only one more push to make it come out in the open. That push came, but not in any way I expected. Will patient Fetter please present and identify himself at the center of the male camp? He will be given 15 minutes to do so. That shut people up. The loudspeakers had drawn us all out of our shelters, and now we were standing around in clumps and knots of filthy humanity. We all craned our necks around, looking for Fetter. Where was he? What did the guards want with him? Fetter was no coward. It took only a few minutes for him to show himself. He'd been over by the work sheds. Maybe he'd been over there conspiring with his fellow bosses. He sauntered over to the middle of the camp with a cocky grin on his face, as if he was very pleased with himself for causing all this commotion. He put his fists on his hips and then looked up at the catwalks. For the first time, I looked up there and saw that a number of soldiers had gathered just above the well. What's going on? Luke asked me. I could only shrug. Are you patient Fetter? The loudspeakers asked. It sounded like they needed some kind of official identification. Fetter grinned and said something, then spat into the mud. Some of the positives nearby laughed. 
Maybe Fetter had made some incredibly witty remark. I wasn't close enough to hear it. Pursuant to the Crisis Emergency Powers Act, the loudspeakers said, inciting your fellow positives to riot is a crime considered equal to treason or looting. The penalty is death. Proceed. I'll never forget the look of surprise on Fetter's face. The soldiers up on the catwalk took aim and fired down at him with their assault rifles, shooting him so many times his body jerked and flew about in a kind of horrible spasmodic dance. His blood splattered everyone standing nearby as he fell into the mud. He did not move again. The screaming that followed seemed to go on forever. Positives ran for their shelters, for the work sheds, for any kind of cover. People were trampled in the mad rush. Luke had to grab my arm and pull me backward into our own shelter, where he heaped blankets on top of us as if they could protect us from bullets. I tried to get up, to get out of the shelter, but he just pulled me back down. The second or third time I decided I agreed with him, that I should keep my head down. So it wasn't until after dark that I dared to show my face again. Chapter 88 Luke thought I was crazy. They'll come for blood. Your blood, he said, glaring at me. If you start riling people up again, the guards will blame you for all this. You really couldn't just go along? You couldn't play the game? Sometimes you have to choose a different game, I told him. I felt weightless, like a good breeze could blow me away, high up into the air, where I would never be seen again. I knew perfectly well that my life could be over come morning. Fetter had been so strong, so big and vicious, and now he was gone. There was no reason to expect that I wouldn't be next. But somehow, I didn't care. My life was less important than what was happening here, than what could happen, if the cards played out right. I didn't sleep that night, because I was far too busy. I went around from shelter to shelter. Nobody questioned why I was there or that I had a right to talk to them, though I was met with mostly hostile stares. I told them we didn't have to live like this. I spoke of what we could accomplish in the morning if we worked together. I didn't expect applause or reasoned arguments. I spoke my piece, and then I moved on. There was only one shelter where I didn't try to make my case. It was a shelter full of the sick and the dying. It was just like the one on the female side of the camp, the place where Heather died. I hadn't realized that we had one of those, too. It had never occurred to me. But there it was, the stink, the low whispered prayers, even the skeleton idol. This one was smaller than the one the women prayed to. Instead of carved wax, it was made of twisted wire broken off old circuit boards with three little holes in its face eye sockets, and a grinning maw. The skeleton worshippers had collected Fetter's body from the mud. His corpse lay in state, just below their pathetic little skeleton idol. Positives on their knees prayed before him, maybe for him. Somehow his death, his sacrifice, meant more to them than just any death. Somehow his spectacular public demise was going to mean life for lots of people. I turned away in disgust. But when I turned to go, a boy of no more than twelve grabbed my arm to stop me. When you die, we'll bring you here, Finnegan, he said. It sounded like a promise. Your life will help others. You mean my death, I told him. I knew better than to argue with their faith. They didn't need evidence that their prayers worked, that they had the power to barter with death. They didn't need reasonable arguments to know what they were already sure of. Nor did I ask if they were with me or against me. I would find out soon enough. I moved on. I went to the next shelter down, where a bunch of positives I didn't know were huddled, scared of the night, more scared of what the morning would bring. I gave them my message, like I'd given it to everyone else. I want things to be better, I told them. That's all. I want us to have a chance to make lives for ourselves. We deserve better. We deserve a chance. I explained very carefully how I was going to try to make that happen. They listened, but said nothing. I hadn't expected them to. 
The whole time, overhead in the catwalks, the guards looked down at us, rifles in their hands, watching me go about my business. Chapter 89 In the morning, the work sheds stood empty. The mud around them was deserted. A few positives were out by the stores or the latrine pits, but almost everyone remained inside, in the shelters. For an hour, nobody stirred. I doubt that very many of them were sleeping in. They were just afraid. I couldn't blame them. Especially when the loudspeakers cut through the morning air, just like they had the day before. I wasn't exactly surprised to hear what they had to say. Will patient Finnegan please present himself at the center of the male camp? He will be given fifteen minutes to do so. Jesus, Luke said. I thought they would call for Mackie next. I forced a shrug of nonchalance I didn't quite feel. Maybe they want to hear our demands. Are you kidding? They're just going to shoot you. They're going to shoot anybody who stands up to them, and then what? What will any of it have meant? Things will go back to the way they were. They'll... they'll... I don't know what he saw in my face then, but he stopped talking. It's all right, I told him. I got up and started moving toward the door. Finnegan, please, don't go out there, he begged. But I had to. I had to say what I was going to say. It doesn't matter, I told Luke. They can drag me out of here by force if they need to. They could send their dogs for me. Better this way. I stopped at the entrance to our shelter and looked back at him. Luke, you've been a good friend. That's such a rare thing in this world. I want you to know I appreciate it. He nodded. His eyes were so wide I thought they might bug out of his head. Outside, the sun was blasting down. It was a truly hot summer day, and the mud under my feet was cracked and almost solid. I walked over to the center of the camp in no great hurry, but not dragging my feet either. I didn't want anyone to think I was less brave than Fetter. I had gone from feeling weightless to feeling like I was made of nothing but light. Like I was an image on a television screen. Probably I felt that way because everyone was watching me. When I reached the center of the camp, I stopped and looked up at the guards. A firing squad had gathered up on the catwalks, just as they had for Fetter. If this was how I was going to die, I figured I'd get one last speech in. Or at least I would try. I would keep talking until they shot me down. That would have to be enough. I speak for the camp, I said. Somewhere, inside one of the shelters, someone shouted, Not for me, he doesn't. Someone else laughed. I ignored them. I speak for the camp, I said. For the positives in the male camp. We have a list of demands that I will now present. Pursuant to the Crisis Emergency Powers Act, the loudspeakers said, just as they had before Fetter was killed. Inciting... And then for no reason that I could see, the loudspeakers went silent. Silence filled the camp, though it didn't last. The soldiers up on the catwalks turned to look at one another, as if they were as confused as I was. Positives started emerging from their shelters, looking at me like I'd worked some kind of miracle. It was strange. It made no sense. If I started thinking about it, I knew I would start getting scared. I would run away. So I didn't think about it. The first of those demands, I said, my voice weak with tension. So I raised it and shouted, First of those demands is an immediate resumption of food distribution. Second is the provision of medical care for all positives. Third is... Stop. I looked up at the wall, at the nearest loudspeaker, but the voice I'd heard wasn't amplified. It came from one of the catwalks, from a soldier in a flat cap. He had gold birds on his collar, which I thought must mean he was a high-ranking officer. You, patient Finnegan, come over to the intake center, and we'll talk about this privately. I frowned. I'd expected to be shot by now. My big plan had been to state the list of demands before I was shot. Fortunately, I'd made a contingency plan. No, I said. No, I don't think so. I won't let you murder me in private where nobody can see. I speak for the camp, and the camp has a right to hear what I say. 
More and more of the shelter doors were opening up. Positives started emerging into the sunlight. They moved toward me, toward the well. Not all of them. I hadn't convinced everybody, but at least half the work crews came. Mackie's crew was there. Fetter's old crew, too, which was being run now by a kid younger and no bigger than me. Plenty of others. They moved to stand around me. They didn't shout or cheer or chant slogans, and they didn't make any show of violence. They just came and stood with me, there in the line of fire. Hundreds of them. I speak for the camp, I shouted. We have a list of demands. First of those demands is an immediate resumption of... The officer lifted an arm, as if he was going to issue the order for my execution. I don't know if it was an accident or a guard who got scared, or if it had all been planned out from the beginning, but someone fired a shot. I couldn't see if it hit anyone. It could have been fired into the air. The result, regardless, would have been exactly the same. The camp went insane. Suddenly, every positive in the mail camp was outside, running one direction or another. A great wave of them staggered back as more shots were fired, and I was nearly knocked off my feet and trampled, but somebody grabbed my arm and pulled me up, helped me get running. The noise of the gunshots was impossible to discern from the shouting, the screaming and wailing, the angry demands and the general roar of hundreds of voices all talking at once. The loudspeakers started roaring again, but I couldn't hear what they said. It was utter chaos. Somebody had the idea to start pulling down the shelters. They tore them apart, throwing sheets of corrugated tin and eroded wood into the mud. One of the work sheds came down with a massive crash and a cloud of dust that kept me from seeing even half of what was going on. Luke ran up to me out of the mob and shouted my name three times before I even realized he was talking to me. What are we supposed to do? he asked. Tell us what to do. This is just crazy. Mackie came up on my left. If they keep shooting, they're going to kill half of us in the crossfire, he said. You got some plan to keep us from all getting killed? I could only stare at him. He expected me to take charge, to fix this situation. All I'd wanted to do was present some demands, to try to make life a little better for everyone. Apparently that was enough. I'd stuck my head up, and now I was responsible for everyone. My immediate reaction was to shrug off that mantle, to refuse to serve. But that wasn't who I was. Not anymore. As soon as I'd taken charge of the SUV, as soon as I'd led the girls here, I'd already made my choice. They won't listen to us now. Not while all this is going on, I said, gesturing at the riot around us. It looked like someone had made a pile of broken wood and set it on fire. Meanwhile, the occasional shot still rang out from above us, though thankfully I didn't see any dead bodies. When this dies down, they'll just punish us for what we've done. So we need to think about how to control the damage, Luke said, nodding. No, I told him, no. This is the moment. This is the only chance we're going to get. If we want this to mean anything, we have to move now while things are in chaos. It's the best opportunity we'll ever have, but we need to make sure we don't all get killed in the process. I was just thinking out loud, trying to come up with a brilliant idea in the middle of a riot. But Luke and Mackie nodded like I'd just said something amazing. They were ready to jump if I gave them a direction. We need some kind of cover, I said. Somewhere we can regroup and get people organized. There's nowhere to go, Luke said, waving at the camp full of collapsing shelters. Nowhere to hide in these walls. I stared at him, because what he'd said made perfect sense to me. You're right, I said. We have to leave. Chapter 90 What? Mackie laughed at me. <laughs> leave? Leave where? The camp? We just walk out of here? And how exactly are we supposed to get through the walls? We don't have to. We'll go through the intake center. The one on the western side of camp. Get everybody moving over that way, I told him. How am I supposed to do that? Just think of something, I told him. He shrugged and pushed his way into the crowd, shouting for people to follow him. There's a fence in the way, Luke told me. Any twenty of us could tear that fence down, I pointed out. Not if it's electrified, I smiled. 
no, more than that, I let a big, goofy grin erupt across my face. I've got a plan, I said. Just get everyone over to the fence. This was something I'd been considering for a while. How to keep that fence from being electrified. I'd seen what happened every time a new positive entered the camp. How the ravening mob would press up against the fence only to be driven back when the power was turned on. I knew exactly how to keep that from happening. Not that it would be easy. I ran for cover, dodging around knots of rioting positives, once having to throw myself down into the mud as bullets whizzed over my head. I still hadn't seen any dead bodies, and I thought maybe the guards had been ordered to fire into the mud to scare the positives rather than kill them. But even if that was the case, and it seemed like too much to hope for, it couldn't work forever. Eventually, one of the positives was going to get shot by accident, if not by intention. And if Mackie was successful in getting everyone over to the fence, I had no doubt the guards would use lethal force to protect the camp's containment. I had to work fast. I headed over to the yellow brick pillar that held up the catwalks. People rushed past me, screaming, but none of them bothered to look in my direction. I glanced around one last time to make sure nobody was looking right at me. Then I raised one fist to knock on the side of the pillar. The hidden door popped open as soon as I touched it. Ike must have known that this was the day. He must have left the door unlocked for me the night before, ready for whatever I had planned. If it hadn't been for him, if he hadn't given me that one last chance, it would have been the end of things. It would have been my death. But apparently, even after the end of the world, friendship still counts for something. Chapter 91 I reached the level of the catwalks and, still hiding inside the pillar, looked around for a long time, making sure no guards were nearby. If any of them saw me, I had no doubt they would shoot me without warning. When I was sure it was safe, I climbed out of the pillar and crouched down on the catwalk, trying to get my bearings. I got a good view from up there of just how far the riot had spread. Nearly half the shelters in the mail camp were down by then. Many had been set on fire. A large number of positives had moved toward the western fence, toward the exit from the camp, right where I wanted them. Clearly, Mackie and Luke had been hard at work. I glanced over at the female camp and saw a weird dichotomy. Over there, there was no riot. The women and girls in the female camp were all pressed up against the fence that separated them from the male camp, but they were standing motionless, only able to watch what was going on. I wished I'd had more time, that I could have organized some kind of demonstration over there, but it was too late to think of that. Just then, I had to worry about staying alive for another thirty seconds. I could see a dozen or so guards from where I crouched. None of them were looking at me, they were far too busy watching what was happening below them, their rifles trained on the rioting positives. I kept low and moved fast, weaving a circuitous course that would take me as far from them as possible while still heading toward my main goal, the guardhouse where Ike had fed me MREs from a hot plate, where I'd gotten to see Kylie. I had to cross half the camp to get there, but my luck held. None of the guards so much as glanced in my direction. Inside the guardhouse, I breathed a sigh of relief. The little room full of television monitors was empty, all the guards having been called out to quell the riot. I was alone, with a dozen views of the camp, playing out in silence on the screens. More important, I was alone with the controls that operated the electric fence. They were simple and clearly marked. There was a switch to turn on the power, and a knob to control its voltage. Someone had made a little red X on the dial, which I assumed meant that if it were turned up that high, the charge in the fence would be lethal. The power was switched on, the voltage down at the same level, I presumed, that drove people away from the fence when new positives arrived. I flipped off the switch, but that wouldn't be enough. I had to make sure the guards didn't turn it back on as soon as I left the guardhouse. I cast about the room, looking for something with which to smash the controls, and quickly I found a fire extinguisher big and heavy enough to do the job. I picked up the extinguisher and carried it to the controls, raised it over my head, but that was when my luck ran out. Stop right there! Someone shouted from behind me. 
It was a guard's voice, definitely. Then a shot rang out, and a television screen near my head exploded in shards of glass and sparks. I dropped the fire extinguisher, then turned around to see who had captured me. It was Ike. Chapter 92 Ike, I said very calmly, very low, intending on somehow talking my way out of this situation. Ike, you unlocked the door for me. I knew- Save it, he said. I didn't understand. Ike, I just need- That was when I noticed he wasn't alone. A couple of dozen soldiers were behind him, all of them trying to cram inside the guardhouse. Ike gave me a funny look I couldn't quite figure out. I frowned, and that just made him roll his eyes. You had your chance, Finn. You could have been set up for a nice cushy time here. You could have waited a couple years and gone home. I tried to smile. I doubt it looked very realistic on my face. Things have gone too far for that now. No shit. Come on, step away from there. I know you, Finn. I know you'll try something stupid and heroic and make me kill you just like I had to kill your mom. That's becoming kind of a pattern, isn't it? Was he trying to anger me? Maybe he wanted me to run at him, to give him an excuse to shoot me. I refused to give it to him. I lifted my hands. He sighed and lowered his rifle, just a hair. Okay, come with me. I nodded, not daring to break eye contact. What are you going to do with me? I don't make decisions. I'm a soldier. I do what I'm told and I was not told to explain things to you. Come on. He gestured with his rifle, indicating I should walk out of the guardhouse in front of him. Before we left, he switched the power to the fence back on. He turned the voltage knob all the way up, well past the lethal level. If I'd had a way to contact the rioters below, I could have had them tear down that fence while the power was off. But it was too late for that now. I'd failed. I stepped outside and saw half a dozen rifles aimed right at me. Had they known the whole time that I was up on the catwalks? Had the soldiers wanted me to come up here, where they could get me alone, where they could shoot me and nobody would see? That didn't seem to be the plan. Ike marched me through the cordon of soldiers, each of whom did nothing but scowl at me. We stepped outside onto the open catwalks, where I could hear people screaming in pain below, the soldiers didn't seem to notice the sound. At least they weren't firing down into the camp anymore. The officer, the one with birds on his collar, came out of the guardhouse and stared at me. He nodded at Ike, who saluted back. Then he came and leaned over me until our faces were only inches apart. We've kept this camp in good order for twenty years now, he said. Did you think you were the first rabble-rouser with a list of demands? When I didn't answer, he shook his head. You are not. The people down there have rights. You can't make them live like this. I can't? He asked. I can't? I have to. This camp is a necessity, patient. Segregation of positives from the healthy community is the only way we will ever eradicate the crisis pathogen. He sounded like he was reciting something he'd memorized, just like Kylie sounded sometimes. We don't have the resources to make the camp as comfortable as we might like. Comfortable, I shouted back. This place is hell. The officer lifted his chin. Well, at least you won't have to endure it much longer. You're going to kill me? I asked. Oh, no. That would just make you a martyr. It would probably start a whole new riot. So no, I'm not going to kill you. There's another camp like this one out on the west coast. I'm going to ship you there, make you their problem. I couldn't believe it. I'd been ready to die. I didn't want to die, but I'd accepted it could happen, and that it would be worth it if it improved things in the camp. But to be shipped to the other side of the country, away from everyone I knew, away from Kylie, somehow that seemed worse. Luckily for me, it didn't come to that. The officer started to turn away, started to issue an order to his troops. They didn't get to hear it, though. There was a noise just then, as if a lightning bolt had struck the catwalk under my feet. It made everybody flinch and look around in terror. I happened to look over at the nearest guardhouse, and I saw a funny thing. 
All the television sets in there had gone dark. It was like they had lost electric power, as if Ike kicked my boot. I looked around at him and saw him gesture with his head. He was telling me to what? I shook my head in confusion. Finally, he had to whisper to me, Fences down. The officer had lost all interest in me for the moment. He was pointing at the guardhouse, shouting for his soldiers to go and see what had happened. I didn't waste any more time. I leaned out over the catwalk and saw all the positives down there. The fence is down! I shouted at the top of my lungs. It's down! Hit the fence now, while you've got a chance! I heard a great deal of roaring and shouting, questions and exclamations and simple noises of surprise. Soldiers grabbed me and threw me down on the catwalk, and somebody pointed a gun at me, and somebody else grabbed the barrel of the gun and pushed it away. I ignored the soldiers. I blinked the sun out of my eyes and looked down at the muddy camp. They were moving. The positives were moving, heading for the fence. They hit the fence like a wave, and it just disappeared, torn apart by their combined weight. They started flowing out into the processing center in a great stampede. I saw the fence come down on the female campsite, too, and was glad for it. I hadn't thought to give that instruction. Someone had just thought of it on their own. Perfect. Then a bullet hit the catwalk right between my feet. Not so perfect. Chapter 93 I looked up and saw every soldier in the camp aiming his rifle at me. The officer had said I wasn't going to be killed, but apparently somebody had rethought that decision. Bullets scored the air, and if I had waited even a fraction of a second more, they would have cut me down, torn me to pieces with sheer firepower. I threw myself over the catwalk, knowing perfectly well that no matter how squishy the mud was below, it could still break my neck, knowing only that my chances were better that way than if I just stood there and waited to be shot. I caught one of the luckiest breaks of my lucky life right then. Directly below me wasn't just mud, but the corrugated tin roof of a shelter, one of the few that hadn't been torn down. I hit it hard with my shoulder and felt something crack in my arm, but my head was safe. I rolled down the slope of the roof, I had no choice, and down into the mud. Bullets were still whizzing all around me, chopping up the mud on either side of me. At any moment, one of them could have hit me, and I knew I would be dead. There was no use thinking about that. I got up and I ran, straight for the gap where the fence had been. By the time I arrived, the positives were gone. I hurried through the long hallway and into the processing center beyond. I saw a last few people running out of the door on the far side of the room, but that was all. Otherwise, the big space with its blood sampling stations was empty. It seemed unreal. It seemed like something from a dream. This room looked exactly like the one I'd seen when I first came here, the last place I'd ever felt safe. I think I paused for only a second, for one last look around the place. Maybe I was too terrified to leave. I can't speak very accurately about my mental state at that moment. The point is, I was totally unprepared when someone came out of the door behind me, the door leading back into the camp, I was completely unready for that person to be Ike. He had his rifle in his hands, but at least it wasn't pointed at me. At the same moment, there was a noise like something heavy being dropped, and then lights flickered on high overhead. It looked like power had been restored. The blood sampling machines hummed away for a second, and then all their computer screens lit up. Ike came over toward me. He slung his rifle over his back. Then he pulled something from his belt. It was a knife, and tossed it to me. I caught it, and saw it was the knife I'd taken from Red Kate. The knife with the eagle on the blade. Told you I'd find that, he said. I couldn't believe it. Any of it. You, you powered down the fence, didn't you? I asked. He shrugged and gave me a goofy grin. Yeah, man. You just couldn't take a hint up on the catwalks, huh? Did you think I was actually going to arrest you? I, uh, didn't know. Ike laughed. That red X on the console? They told me on day one, the fence is old and it doesn't work as good as it used to. 
Don't ever turn the power up past that mark or you'll short out the generators. And they were right. Power's back on now, though. They just had to throw a circuit breaker. I didn't know anything about electronics. I just shook my head in disbelief. Thank you, I told him. Don't thank me too much, Ike said. You're really going to just leave? It's just wilderness out there. It's supposed to be suicide if you're on foot. I've seen it. I've seen worse. He sighed. Better go. If the others figure out you're alone down here, they'll kill you. No joke. I believe it. I turned to go, to run after the others. But I couldn't just say goodbye like that. Not after all he'd done for me. So instead, I looked him right in the eye and said, Come with me. Where? he asked. No idea. We stood there staring at each other for a second. Eventually, we both cracked up laughing. I was sure he would turn around and I would never see him again. Instead, he shrugged his shoulders and walked past me. What the hell? he said. For a job where you carry an assault rifle and stuff, army life's just so fucking dull. I figured I could promise him that whatever came next, it wouldn't be boring. Chapter 94 Outside the camp, the positives had torn apart the guard post. This side of the wall, the western side, looked exactly like the place where Caxton had dropped me off. The positives had gathered maybe a quarter mile away, out of range of the soldiers up on the camp's wall. Ike and I hurried out to meet them. Nobody shot at us. Maybe they were too confused about what had just happened. When we met up with the others, there was a great deal of hooting and hollering and slapping me on the back. People flinched away from Ike's uniform until he tore off his shirt and threw it in a ditch. Then he grabbed me up in a hug and everybody cheered. Luke and Mackie both found me and whooped with me and said they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe I'd broken them out. They told me not everyone had come with them. A lot of the older positives, the first generation mostly, had stayed behind. A lot of the women from the female camp had stayed, but several hundred had run when they got the chance. All told, nearly 500 of us left the camp that day. There was one person I really wanted to see. I kept asking if anyone had seen Kylie. I worried she would have been one of the ones who stayed behind. Her emotional armor might not let her take a big, risky jump like fleeing the camp. I was worried I would never see her again. Luke kept asking me questions. What are these people going to eat? Are you really thinking we're going to walk out of here? What about the zombies? What about the army? Where are we going to sleep tonight? They're in a great mood right now, and they love you, but how long do you think that's going to last? A scar across her nose, I kept saying. Longish hair and a scar across her nose. Have you seen her? Mackie came up to me, laughing and whooping. God damn, Finnegan, he said. I thought I was going to be king of the camp. That's what I thought. Now there's no goddamn camp anymore. He picked me up and squeezed me hard, and all I could think to do was ask him about Kylie. She acts kind of, I don't know, dead inside. The last time I saw her, she was wearing this sort of green shirt, a scar across the bridge of her nose. Have you... Fen, she said, because she was suddenly there, standing right in front of me. Her arms were folded across her chest like she was cold. You came, I said, as if I'd given her a personal invitation. I couldn't believe she was really there. Fen, she said again her voice flat, emotionless. Finn, Heather's dead. She died, Finn. I know. I'm so sorry. She nodded once. Then she hauled off and punched me across the jaw, knocking me down. The crowd couldn't seem to decide if this was the funniest thing they'd ever seen or if they wanted to tear her apart for striking their hero. That's for bringing me to that place, she said. I got up slowly, unsure what she was going to do next. She rushed forward and grabbed my face and kissed me, deeply, passionately. She was all there. The armor was down, maybe for the first time. Her arms wrapped around my neck, and I felt her tears running down between both our cheeks. That's for getting me out, she said. Part 4 
Hearth. Chapter 95 And so we headed west, on foot. There were no cars for us, no SUVs to ride in. We went on foot in a land where that was supposed to be suicide. We walked out of that camp because that was the only way out. The positives didn't need any rousing speeches. They didn't need to be told why we were doing this. I led, and they followed. There didn't seem to be any question that I was in charge. Even Mackie just nodded when I gave him commands. I was the miracle worker, the great liberator. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I tried not to let on about that. I'd spent so much mental energy figuring a way to make these people's lives better. I'd been willing to sacrifice myself to free them from the horrors of the camp. It turns out that dying in a blaze of glory is surprisingly easy, but living on, after your moment of triumph, is the hardest thing in the world. Nobody asked me any questions at first. No one asked why I'd taken us west when the majority of the positives had come from cities in the east. If they had asked, all I could tell them was that I'd seen what Pennsylvania was like now, and there was nothing for us there. Pittsburgh, any walled city, would have at best turned us away. A mob of potential zombies knocking at the gate? Most likely, they would have opened fire on us. West was potential. The unknown. Anything could be out there. Red Kate had said the government didn't exert as much control out there, that people could be free in the West. Maybe there was a way to make a life out there. A life for positives. Maybe a better life than what we'd left behind. Maybe. I started walking, with Kylie and Ike and Luke by my side. The rest followed. If they had any ideas about where we should go, what we should do, they didn't share them. They seemed to think I must have something great up my sleeve, some secret plan. I'd given them freedom. I wondered how long that would be enough. Chapter 96 I knew I would never have more goodwill and trust from the positives than I had that first week out of camp. I needed it. I knew a little, just a little, about surviving in the wilderness, but nothing at all about what 500 people were going to need or how to procure it. Luckily, I wasn't alone. As we set off on foot, trying to get some distance between ourselves and the camp while we still had the strength, I had plenty of advisors to help me make decisions. I kept being surprised that none of them just pushed me aside and took charge themselves, considering how much more effective they were. We could have all died in the first few days if a positive I didn't know at all, just some random woman I'd never met, hadn't come to me and told me we needed to start boiling our drinking water. There was no shortage of water in ditches along the side of the road, but I'd been afraid to touch it after what happened to Addison. Boiling the water couldn't make it completely safe, but it killed all the germs and parasites, things I'd barely known existed. Other advisors, some of whom I knew, some I was just meeting for the first time, had their own great suggestions. But the ones I listened to the most often, the ones I came to count on, were the people I already had come to trust with my life. Ike was the big surprise. He'd never seemed very practical-minded to me, but once we were underway, he was simply indispensable. That first night, when we found ourselves standing in a mob on the highway watching the sun go down, it was Ike who said we needed to set up a camp. But we don't have any shelters, or even tents, I pointed out. I think I had planned on just walking through the night. It was what I would have done on my own. The funny thing about a herd of 500 people, though, is that they move much slower than a single man. Some of them were just too weak to go any farther, and I refused to leave them behind. Some were already griping about blisters and sore legs and wondering what they were supposed to eat. A camp is just wherever you sit down, Ike told me. But there are a couple of things that'll make it a lot more bearable. We need to dig latrine pits. We need to set up some kind of watch system. If zombies come in the night, we need to know about it in advance. If one of us goes zombie, 
We need to be ready for that. And we need to get people organized in groups. We need a head count of how many of us there are so we know if anybody goes missing. I just stared at him. Where had he come up with all this? He shrugged. Basic training. It was boring as hell, but they repeated everything until it stuck. Made me memorize stuff I was never going to need at my new job as a soldier. I think most of the time it was just to keep me busy so I didn't wander off. So we made camp that first night, with everyone sleeping under the stars, wrapped in whatever clothes or blankets they'd brought from the camp. Ike's system of watches worked well. Watchers had to stay awake for only an hour, since we had plenty of people to take their places. No zombies appeared, which surprised me a little. A group this big made plenty of noise, and I knew how active the zombies got at night. By morning, I had figured it out, though. It was the army. The medical camp was one of their important assets, and they'd done a thorough job of clearing the land around it. A sort of invisible perimeter surrounded the camp, where there were no zombies at all. Eventually, we would walk past that unseen border, but for the moment, we had a little grace. Chapter 97 In the morning, Mackie came and told me everyone was accounted for. Ike had wanted an inventory of how many people we had, but it had fallen on Mackie and the former bosses to compile it. I wasn't crazy about that. I wanted to throw over the old boss system and let people make decisions for themselves, but I needed some kind of organization, and the bosses were more than happy to step up. Anything that let them hold on to a little of the power they'd lost when we left the medical camp. Just counting heads was something. We can get work crews together if you tell us what we need to get done, Mackie told me. When he'd bought me from Fetter, he'd seen me as a useful tool, somebody who could help make him stronger. Now, he treated me like I was the boss and he was the worker with bright ideas. I knew many of the other bosses, the ones who had beaten their workers for fun, the ones who'd become bosses by dint of muscles, not brains, weren't as willing to accept my authority. They respected Mackie, though, and it became clear he was going to be my highest-ranking officer. It was amazing how fast we recreated old power structures. I thought about what I could do with 500 workers. We need food. We're going to need weapons and tents and a million other things. Medical supplies. Okay. How do we do that? Where do we find that stuff? I rubbed at my face. Well, I said, and paused as if I were thinking. I knew the answer. I didn't like it, but I knew. Well, we're going to have to start looting. I hated the life I'd left behind, the life Adair had taught me about, but it had kept me and the girls alive. The first thing we need is a map. We'll find a gas station, and there'll be maps there. Once we know where we are, we can figure out where the loot will be. Can you get together some people who are strong and fast who can scout ahead? Sure, Mackie said. We're going to need food sooner than that, Luke said. Luke had always questioned me, always pointed out the flaws in my logic. I'm only human, and sometimes it annoyed me to no end. But he was almost always right and I knew if I listened to him, I could avoid some costly mistakes. Plans that made perfect sense in my head rarely worked out smoothly in the real world, and I needed somebody to keep me on my toes. There'll be houses around here somewhere, I said. I stood up in the road and peered north and south. The land here was so flat, I could see for a fair distance. On either side of the highway, I saw nothing but overgrown fields stretching away to the horizon. They could have been great prairies of weed, except for the way they were divided into enormous rectangular plots. This used to be farmland, I said. There have to be farmhouses, stores, something. Mackie, I want you to get together two more groups. Pick people who are sharp, you know, the kind who will keep their eyes open. Send one north, one south to look for any sign of houses. There will be canned food there, stuff we can still eat. Something caught my eye and I looked at the fields again. 
Most of the overgrowth was just green, ragged, and dusty, and distinctly non-edible. But here and there I saw stands of golden tassels blowing in the wind. Wheat. This had been farmland once. The weeds had reclaimed it, but some of the old crops seemed to be making a good show of surviving. They had grown wild and probably wouldn't provide all we needed, but it was something. Luke, find me someone who knows how to make flour and bread. Out of that? Luke said. I mean, I know that's what you make flour out of, but we don't have any ovens or anything else we need. Somebody might know how to get around that, I told him. In the meantime, we need to get everybody else moving, walking. We can keep the pace slow today so the scouting parties can catch up with us later. But the farther we get from that camp, the better. I don't think the army really wants us back at this point, but I don't want to give them a reason to come round us all up. My advisors all nodded and went about the errands I'd given them. For a second, I let myself relax. Maybe this was possible. Maybe I could keep all these people alive. That day we walked no more than seven miles, judging by the mile markers at the side of the highway. The positives weren't used to this kind of active lifestyle, and many of them just refused to go any farther until I personally came over and asked them nicely. I was beginning to see why so many of the powerful people I'd known had used threats and violence as motivators. It would have been so much easier if I could have just bullied the people into moving. But that wasn't right. It would make me as bad as Adair or Fetter or the guards back at the camp, and I refused to lead like that. There was another way to motivate people. You could inspire them. If you gave them something to believe in, they would follow you toward that goal. Now I just needed to think of what that goal would be. That night the scouting parties came back with mixed success. I got my map, a beautiful road atlas, just like the one Adair had annotated. This one was pristine with no red marks to indicate what we were walking into, but it had a full map of Ohio and I could see we wouldn't be traveling through desolate farmland for long. The scouts who went out looking for food turned up some canned goods. It looked like a lot when they hauled it back to camp, but once it was divided up, it didn't go nearly far enough. A lot of people got nothing. I couldn't do much about that except give my share to the scrawniest kid I could find. That got me some smiles and pats on the back, but did little to appease the hungry people who just stared at me. My idea for harvesting the wild wheat turned out to be a dud. A couple of positives turned up who had been gardeners and cooks back before they were exiled from their cities. They took one look at the sheaf of wheat I'd gathered and shook their heads. It needs to be ground down for flour, and I have no idea how to do that, one of them, a young woman, said. The man standing next to her shrugged. That's not the hard part. The hard part would be collecting enough wheat to make even a pound of flour. It would take days to go through these fields and find a significant amount. On the other hand, he said, and he showed me a plant he'd found on his own. It had a straight stalk with finger-like pods hanging from it. Each pod contained a couple of small beans. This is soy. Never heard of it, I told him. He nodded in understanding. I don't think it grows out east. Here it's everywhere, all over these fields. And you can eat it? I asked. You can boil the beans and eat them right out of the pod. They don't taste like much, but they'll fill you up. He shrugged. There's supposed to be other things you can do with it, but I don't know how. I put a hand on his shoulder. Then I looked at the woman standing next to him. This is something. This is huge. I want you to look for any other plants we can use as food. You two could be the ones who keep us alive. Both of their faces lit up at the sound of that. I could see in their eyes that they wanted it. They wanted to be the ones who fed us. Maybe they just knew that whoever came up with food for this camp was going to get a lot of perks. It didn't matter. They had their goal. Two done. 498 to go.
My final advisor was Kylie. When she came to me in the camp that night, I had a lot of questions for her. I knew almost nothing about the women we'd liberated, the former residents of the female camp. She'd lived among them, and she knew who could be trusted with various tasks. She also knew about the special challenges they faced. Some of the men are going to be a problem, I told her. I don't want to scare you, but the way they used to talk about what they would do if they ever got their hands on a girl. Finn, I know what sex is, and I know what rape is, she said. Right. I'd almost forgotten. It's under control, she said. Her mask was on. For a brief moment after we left the camp, she'd been human. The human woman who had cared about Bonnie and Addison and Heather and mourned for them. Now her armor was back up. She needed to survive out here, and she would do whatever it took. Care to tell me how? I asked. You had work crews in your camp. So did we. Our bosses knew what to do. We stay together. We never go any place alone. The men who would hurt us are cowards. They'll prey on a woman who's alone and vulnerable. So we'll make a point of never being alone. Good, I said. I won't let that happen to my people. She just watched my face, like I was something to be studied, something she'd never seen before. We sat in silence for a long time while the camp around us prepared for sleep. The noise of five hundred people took a long time to die out, but as night fell and the sky lit up with stars, something like peace came over us. Sleep here tonight, I told her. Next to me. We can keep each other safe. She nodded. Then she laid out her blankets and settled into them. I showed her how to make a bed on the road surface. I'd already learned that it stayed drier overnight than the softer ground on either side. Then we curled up, back to back. Eventually, slowly, she turned to face me. She held out her hand, and I pulled it around myself, wrapping her around me like a blanket. It just felt so right. Chapter 98 Day by day, things got harder. Though the farmland gave way to small towns, the scouting parties could never seem to bring back enough food for everyone. We took turns eating. All of us were used to a near-starvation diet, but somehow since leaving the camp, the positives had begun to expect more. Maybe because they were walking so much, expending more energy. Or maybe they'd thought escaping the camp would solve all their problems. The grumbling started with just a few individuals, who couldn't or wouldn't put up with the grueling hours of walking, followed by little or no food. They would threaten to just sit down in the road and stop walking. They never actually did it, of course. They were terrified of being left behind. And at first, the people around them would just tell them to shut up and conserve their energy. But eventually, they began to organize. I suppose I'd taught them how to do that. I couldn't very well blame them for wanting to improve their lives. The first group to approach me was a former work crew, led by their former boss. He'd been one of the meaner sort, the bullies. And I'd expected trouble from him, but I hadn't expected his erstwhile workers to stand behind him. They came up to me one night while I was conferring with my advisors. Mackey stood up, very tall, his chest puffed out when he saw them approaching. That's Garrett, he said. This ought to be fun. I looked up from my road atlas and gave Garrett a wave. He wanted a confrontation, so I figured I would make it seem like this meeting was my idea. I need to hear what you're thinking, I told him. A momentary look of confusion crossed his face, but then he glanced over his shoulders at his workers, and that seemed to restore his bluster. We need more food! We all do, I said. Did you come up with some idea how we can get some more? Because I'd love to hear it. No, no, my group here, specifically, we need more food. We need to eat every day. We're already getting weaker, and you need us. I need everyone. I need all the help I can get, I said. I could see him getting frustrated. We're strong. 
We want to stay that way, so when the zombies come or whatever, we can fight them off. You're going to need fighters. I nodded agreeably. Absolutely. In fact, I've been thinking, I need a group to scout ahead and check for threats. We're going to start seeing zombies sooner than we expect, and there could be more human dangers, too. What do you think, Garrett? Are your guys tough enough for the job? It gave me a priceless moment of entertainment to watch him squirm. He desperately wanted to say no, but doing so would make him look weak and invalidate his argument for more food. Eventually, I decided to ease up a little. Of course, while you're scouting ahead, you're likely to come across plenty of canned food in the houses you pass. You'd be welcome to whatever you could find. Garrett wanted to say no, but he'd made the mistake of not coming alone. His workers shouted him down. As they walked away, discussing plans among themselves, Mackie laughed and turned to me. <laughs> Nicely played, he said. And so I got a vanguard and neutralized a threat to my authority. Sadly, it wasn't always that easy. A woman came to me to tell me her friend was sick and getting weaker by the day. She couldn't walk anymore and she needed to eat or she was going to die. I gave her a can of 20-year-old creamed spinach out of the day's pile, far more than one sick person ought to have received, but I remembered how I felt when I heard Heather was sick. Make sure nobody sees her eating this, I said, or they'll be jealous, maybe dangerously jealous. The woman looked a lot less grateful than I had hoped. Even worse, later on, I found out I'd made a sentimental mistake. Kylie came to me that night and told me the truth. There had been no sick friend. The woman had eaten the entire can herself. Unused to so much food in one sitting, she'd thrown most of it back up. That can could have fed four people if it was parceled out correctly. That episode hardened my heart against people claiming sickness, which also turned out to be a mistake, because people really were getting sick. I don't know if it was exhaustion or exposure or what, but one by one people started dropping out of the back of the line as we walked, falling down on the side of the road. Others had to come pick them up and sometimes carry them. Soon enough, we had our first death, and our second the same night, and our third the next morning. Suddenly the agitators, the complainers, weren't being told to shut up. They were getting nods and muttered agreement. A big cohort of them wanted to turn back, to return to the camp. We were only marching to our death, they said. I was leading them nowhere. I was insane. I had fooled them all into leaving the camp in the first place because I wanted them to die. At one point, we passed a car that had been abandoned on the road. Its tires were just rotten tatters, and its chassis was rusted through, so I ignored it. I barely even registered the skeleton in the front seat. Others, however, saw the bones. They lifted them reverently free of the broken windows and wired them together and carried them along with us. And each night, they knelt before that skeleton and prayed. I hoped we'd left that shit behind, I said as I watched them go about their devotions, making their bargains with death. People need something to believe in, Luke told me. For a while, you fit the bill, but... It's been too long since you did something for them. I'm making decisions for them all day long, I said. Without me, they might get a chance to find out what they'll do without you, he interrupted. I'd say you have two days, maybe three, before they decide you're the wrong one to be in charge. Fine, let somebody else take over. It would be a relief, I said. But of course I didn't mean it. Luke could see I didn't, so he let it drop. The next day, the scouting parties came back almost empty-handed, and six more people died, almost at once. The skeleton worshippers looked positively smug. We need something to bring us back together, I said. Mackie and Luke and Ike and Kylie all just looked at me, waiting to hear what I was going to say next. I had nothing. Chapter 99 we are not here to demand food, or that you heal the sick. We know some things are just too much to ask from you. That's a relief, I said. This last committee of supplicants was a mixed bag, men and women, 
a few scrawny children. One of them had been a boss back in the camp, and a couple had been shopkeepers. Now they were just concerned. They were worried, and they'd come to me asking to be heard. I sat down on my blanket and looked at them one by one. They were starving. I could see it in the sharp cheekbones, in the rail-thin arms. I was sure I looked just as bad. They were exhausted. Only a few of them had decent shoes anymore. The rest had their feet wrapped in bloody pieces of fabric. What they were not, for the most part, was angry. Unlike most of the groups that came to me, they didn't look like they wanted a fight. What they did want remained to be seen. This isn't about ultimatums. Their spokesperson was a woman with dreadlocks who was, if no fatter than the rest, slightly taller. Her eyes stayed on my face as she spoke. She took her time. I didn't know her, but I could already tell she was a born leader. I would have to create some new task force or scouting group and put her in charge. It had worked, kind of, so far. We don't want miracles. Okay, I said. Well, thanks for coming by anyway. If you don't mind, we just want to know where we're going. I closed my mouth. So this was it. The big question. The one I couldn't answer. For people like Adair or Red Kate, it wasn't a question that ever needed a real answer. They were happy to just roam the world, looking for whatever it brought them. Some of the positives who walked out of the camp were probably of the same type, born wanderers, survivors who knew that staying in one place too long was going to get them killed. But these people were different. These weren't looters. They weren't, as Red Kate put it, maggots on the corpse of the world. These were people who had been born in cities, who had expected to spend their lives there, gardening and maintaining. Whatever had made them positives, whatever exposure they'd had to the virus, had changed that and uprooted them. But the camp had held out the promise they could go home again. They were on the surface, like me. Wasn't that what I'd been fighting for all this time? A safe place to sleep? Food enough to keep me alive? friends and family around me, and the security of knowing they were likely to be there when I needed them? It's funny. Until that very moment, I'd had no idea how much I'd changed, of how much more I expected from life now. We're going west, I said. The woman with the dreadlocks frowned. That's it? I reached behind me and picked up my road atlas. Eventually, we'll hit Indiana. See? Here, Indiana. And there's something in Indiana we're headed for? The woman asked. I could feel them all tensed up. Feel them like coils bent in my direction, metal springs held back by a loose catch. What I said to them now could make them nod and accept things and go back to their blankets and get ready for the next day's march. All I had to do was say that something was there, some refuge, and they just had to hang in there. I could say that the city of Indianapolis would take us in. I could say there were looter camps where we could make a new life. In other words, I could lie. But I'd been taught one thing along the road, one thing that stuck. You could look at the people who'd come before you, the people who you went to with these questions, and you could do exactly what they'd done. Or you could try to do better. I won't lie to you, I said. That's good, the woman told me. I don't know what's out there. I honestly don't. I just know that West is better than East, because East means going back and pleading with the camp guards to let us back in, to admit we made a bad mistake and we're sorry and we'll be nice children from now on. We'll put up with the mud and flies and the dogs and the guns and everything we left behind. West... I said, trying to make it sound profound, is better than East. It has to be. I'd hoped that would at least stir them, make them nod and bite their lips and think, okay, he's right, and we'll give him a little more time. Even then, I didn't fully understand what hunger and exhaustion could do to rational people. Many of us think East is better than West, she said. 
What do you think? Personally. I think we got food back there for our work, she told me, which wasn't a real answer. That was the point, of course. I had tried to single her out and make this about individual decisions, and she was here to present a unified front. She knew how the game was played as well as I did. So all I could do was give her more honesty. It was the one thing I had in good supply. I'm not your boss, I told her. I'm not your CO. You walk with me because you want to. If you want to be in charge and lead these people back east, it's up to you to convince them to do that. Looks like you've got a head start. One or two people in the crowd chuckled. Well, that was something. I'm going to ask you for a favor, though, I told her. Give me one more day. Walk with me tomorrow. Walk like we did today, to the west. And then tomorrow night, you can make up your mind. She never did say yes. She just shook her head and walked away, and her people followed. Mackie spat on the ground when she was gone. You need to start showing some backbone. People want to be bullied a little. They want to know their place. I smiled at him. You want that? You can head back to camp. Because, I said, rising to my feet, I won't do it like that. I'll lead these people honestly or not at all. That second thing you said, Luke said, is looking pretty likely. We'll see. She didn't say no. A lot can happen in a day. Except for most of that next day, it didn't. We got back to walking, the endless, foot-killing walking. The sun burned us until I wished it would rain, pour down on me, as miserable as that might be, because it would be better than this late summer dry heat. The scouts went out and I waited for them to come back, waited for them to bring me some kind of sign, anything. And then, amazingly enough, they did. It's about three hours away, one of them told me, still panting from having run most of the way back. The rest of his crew had stayed with the thing they'd found. We have about an hour's daylight left, I said, frowning. Keep them walking. It's worth it. I nodded at the scout and sent the order back. We would keep walking, even when night fell. More than one emissary of the disgruntled came hobbling forward to tell me I was on borrowed time, that making them walk all night wasn't going to get me anything. I just smiled and shrugged my shoulders. And then, just after the moon rose, they all saw it, and a noise went up from the throng behind me. Not exactly a jubilant whoop, they were too tired for that, but a sound of thanksgiving all the same. Up ahead, just off the side of the road, was an enormous building behind a parking lot full of abandoned cars. In giant letters over the building's doors read the legend, Food Queen, a grocery store big enough to feed an army. Chapter 100 Inside the food queen was darkness and cool air and row after row after row of shelves standing silent and frozen in time. That didn't last. To be honest, we made a mess of the place. Positives ran up and down the aisles, pushing each other around in shopping carts, shouting with joy. They kicked over the standing displays of fresh food that had long since rotted away to husks and leathery rinds. They swarmed back through the meat department into the stockrooms. Most of them, though, crowded into the canned food aisles, where shelf after shelf of preserved food stood waiting for them. Every can lined up with its label pointed outward. Every can was a little treasure. I used my knife to pop open can after can of peaches and syrup, of corn and water, of soups of every description. Some of the cans had rusted until their contents had leaked and dried out. Some had swollen up so much they burst and their precious food was lost. But most of them, the vast majority, were still intact. Positives pointed out the best used by dates on the cans and laughed to think of times so long ago when people could be picky about freshness and tore open the cans anyway and crammed the food in their mouths, barely taking the time to chew. Even the disciples of the skeleton idol cried with joy, 
Even the grumblers rushed up to slap me on the back and tell me what a hell of a job I was doing. The woman with the dreadlocks just kept shaking her head, but her face was split by an enormous smile. I doubted you, she kept saying. I'm sorry I doubted you. I'd gotten lucky, far luckier than I deserved, and I started to protest, to say I couldn't take the credit, that I didn't make the food queen appear, but Ike pulled me hastily aside and told me to shut up. Everybody knows that, he said, but you don't have to remind them. He had a can of creamed spinach in his hand, and he shoved green goo in my mouth, and I nearly choked as I laughed. I did my best to stay in charge of the party. Don't eat so much you get sick, I told people. This hall has to last us a long time, but it was no use. The people had been hungry for so long they wouldn't stop now. Eventually I gave up and just walked the aisles, giving a word of encouragement here, sharing a bit of excitement there. In one aisle, a couple of positives had set up some empty plastic barrels and made drums of them, beating out a wild and exuberant rhythm. Some women were dancing around them, swaying their hips, lifting their hands in the air. I joined in, and everybody laughed as I tried to keep up with the dancers. In another aisle, a group of positives had set up some folding tables and had constructed something resembling a family meal, with bowls full of food, and even plastic forks and knives, napkins, salt and pepper shakers. It looked so much like something from my lost youth in New York, I wept a bit. They asked me to join them and say grace, and I was happy to oblige. Eventually, when the clamorous riot had settled down to a contented rumble, I climbed up on one of the checkout lanes, up where just about everyone could see me. The dark was lit by flickering candles, and I could see all their faces peering up at me. Luke climbed up far enough to hand me a lit candle of my own, so I could be illuminated as I made my big speech. Except, this wasn't a time for a speech. It was time for celebration. I didn't need to rouse these people. Not that night. I needed to give them something. A reward for freeing themselves and staying free. So I kept it simple. Eat up, folks. Enjoy. We'll sleep here tonight, indoors for once. There was a great deal of cheering at that. And tomorrow? I thought for a moment. No, tomorrow we'll stay here too. No walking tomorrow. That got me a round of applause. A thunderous noise of hands slapping together. They loved the idea of being off their feet, if only for a while. When I climbed back down, Kylie was waiting for me. She took my hand and led me to one side of the store, through aisles of glass cookware and kitchen gadgets, few of which I understood. No one else had bothered to go back there since there was no food to be had. Kylie led me farther, to a door that opened on a tiny office that must have once belonged to the store's manager. She closed the door behind us and locked it. I set my candle carefully on the desk, propping it up so it wouldn't fall over and start a fire. Then I turned around and saw that Kylie was sitting on a wide couch up against one wall. She chewed on her lip as she watched me, waiting for me to do something. I wasn't entirely sure what she had in mind. Adair never kissed me, she said. Not once. Kissing's okay. I moved over to the couch and sat down next to her, feeling more nervous than I had ever felt while looting a zombie-infested suburb. I had no idea what I was doing, but I really, really wanted to do this. I put a hand on her hip, but she picked it up and moved it away. I touched her face, and that seemed to be okay. I kissed her gently, and she wrapped her arms around my neck and pulled me close and kissed me harder. For a long time we did just that, just kissing, and it was innocent until it wasn't anymore, until it grew passionate and wild and I kissed her neck, kissed her throat, kissed the top of her chest. I felt her tense up. I'd gone too far. I'd triggered her, reminded her of something Adair had done once, or some other man who'd seen her as nothing but a doll to play with, a doll that didn't even scream when you squeezed it too hard. I jumped back, away from her, horrified of what I'd done. I'm sorry, I said. I'm so sorry. Kylie, forgive me. I... Shut up, she said. She was breathing very heavily. She stared at the floor, her hands hovering in front of her, shaking. Let me... 
Let me do this because... Because I have to. If we're ever going to be... She shook her head. I wanted us to pretend to be a family once. Remember? I do, I said. I wanted us to pretend to be married. Except I didn't want to just pretend. And if it's ever going to be real, I have to let you do things to me. You want to, don't you? I mean, I'm not ugly to you. She reached up and touched the scar across the bridge of her nose. I took her hand, pulled it away. Then I leaned in and kissed the scar. Her eyes fluttered closed. Then she reached down and unbuttoned her shirt, unhooked her bra. She lifted out one of her breasts and put a hand on the back of my head, pushing my lips down, down until they touched her breast. I kissed her nipple and felt it harden in my mouth. It only lasted a moment. She pulled me away, not too fast, and covered herself up again. That was good. Gentle, she said. Finn, you'll always be gentle with me, won't you? I need that. I need you to be careful with me. I promise, I told her. And I promise that next time we can do a little more, a little at a time. Do you think you can wait? We'll get there. We'll get there together. Of course. She nodded and wrapped her arms around me and held me close. I don't want to be dead inside anymore. I want to be like you. But it's dangerous. I'll protect you, I told her, just like you've protected me. Sleep with me tonight, okay? Not, you know, not... I know, I told her. We'll just sleep. And so we did. Chapter 101 I woke in Kylie's arms the next morning. I thought I'd heard a noise outside the little office, a commotion of some kind, so I disentangled myself from her still-sleeping form and went out to take a look. A lot of the positives were crowded in the back of the store, clutching at one another, while others, mostly the young men, were up front, by the big plate-glass windows that were the only source of light in the Food Queen. So many of them were near the window, I couldn't see what was going on. I elbowed my way through the crowd to get a look and recoiled at what I saw. A zombie was pushed up against the window, smearing its greasy body against the glass. Its long hair was bleached by the sun, and its eyes burned a dull and mindless red. It had been so long since I'd seen a zombie that I'd forgotten how gut-churningly awful they were. Human in all but mind. A terrible perversion of what we could be. Everyone get back, I said, pushing at the air with my hands. You're just encouraging it. The zombie licked at the glass and tried to scratch its way through with its fingernails. I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want it to exist. It can't hurt us in here. Just, everyone, get back. Some of the positives obeyed me, more than I'd expected, frankly. That just gave others a chance to move in for a better look. The thing was naked, its skin covered in sores and blisters and patches of terrible sunburn. It looked like it couldn't hurt a fly. We would have to deal with it when we left, but for the moment, I was willing to just let it bump harmlessly against the glass. Ike, on the other hand, was less patient. Maybe he was just bored. He hadn't killed anything in a while. He came forward, holding his assault rifle over his head. It was the only firearm we had, the only weapon other than knives. The crowd parted for him and made a wide clearing around the gun. Give me some room, he said. I got this. I looked out the window, and in the split second before he fired, I said, Wait, Ike, don't but it was far too late. His rifle sputtered three times with a noise that filled the entire food queen. Three red holes appeared in the zombie's forehead, and it slumped to the ground. At the same time, the entire window pane shattered in a trillion tiny cubes of glass that spilled out across the floor like chipped ice. Positives laughed as they danced back away from the glass. Hot air billowed into the cavernous store, 
There's more. I finished. I pointed out at the parking lot, where maybe fifty more zombies were already staggering toward that giant hole in the glass front of the food queen. I think they heard that, Ike said, his eyes wide. Then he opened up with his rifle, the muzzle flare blinding me as he shot into the oncoming wave of once human flesh. I took my knife out of my belt, knowing that he couldn't get all of them. I glanced over my shoulder and saw the positives behind me, climbing over one another in their desperation to get away from the windows. I looked over at Ike in time to see him fire his last shot. We were still facing more zombies than my panicked mind could count. Go find another weapon! There were kitchen knives in aisle 27, I told Ike. They'll be all over you like flies on puke in a minute, he said. Then get something to help me fight them off with, I spat at him. He didn't waste any more time, but ran for the aisle. I stepped forward, over the broken glass, thinking I would plug the hole in the windows with my own body if I had to. I didn't even think of expecting reinforcements from the positives behind me. The vast majority of them had lived in cities all their lives until they came to the camp. They'd probably never seen more than a couple of zombies, much less fought any. Even the bosses, who were used to violence, had only ever fought humans, and then with their fists. What was coming my way was a lot bloodier than what they knew. I had little time to think. The zombies were on me in seconds, and it was all I could do to slash and stab at them, to push them back as they tried to squeeze in through the broken window. Blood splattered all over me as I cut and hacked, as hands reached in to grab me, as teeth gnashed at my hands and face. They cared nothing for pain, recoiling when I cut them only out of instinct. Nothing would stop them from coming in. Nothing could hold them back for long. Then one of them grabbed me by the throat, and I couldn't breathe. I could feel its ragged nails digging into the skin of my neck. I could barely see as black spots danced in my vision. I lashed out blindly with the knife, but connected with nothing but air. This is it, I thought. This is the end. Except Ike returned just then, with a massive meat cleaver in his hand. It must have come from the food queen's butcher shop, and it was made for nothing but cutting through bone and muscle tissue. It took the zombie's hand clean off at the wrist, and suddenly I was free. I stumbled back, and the horde of zombies came pushing in through the window now, but Ike slashed and chopped all around him in a flurry of steel, and once I'd had a moment to catch my breath, I jumped in too, not even bothering to get up, just jabbing and slashing at the zombie's legs. Still, it wasn't enough. One of the zombies got through, climbing over the mutilated bodies of its fellows. It leapt over our heads and headed for the biggest supply of meat it could find the positives in the back of the store. We can't let it get them, I shouted at Ike. So go, I'll hold these, he told me. I nodded and scrambled to my feet. I couldn't see the zombie in the gloom of the store's interior, but I could hear screaming and I ran toward it, my knife out at my side where I wouldn't stab myself with it if I tripped and fell. Back in aisle 15, the positives had set up a sleeping area and I dashed over their scattered blankets, kicked through their possessions in my haste. The screaming came from my left then, and I ran that way. Up ahead, I saw my people running in every direction at once. In the middle of the crowd stood the zombie, its hands clutching at a woman in a blue shirt. I raced forward and planted my knife deep in its back, low below the ribcage. I must have struck its liver, because it went down instantly. Clear! I heard Ike shout from the front of the store. What? I called back, unbelieving. They're all down! he said, coming around the side of the aisle. You got yours? He looked down at the dead zombie on the floor. Yeah, I guess you did. Fuck yeah! What a goddamn team we make, huh, Finn? We got him, you son of a bitch! We got every last one of- Excuse me? The woman in the blue shirt said. I'm sorry, but- She was holding up her arm. The zombie had taken a sizable bite out of it, leaving a gushing red wound. Suddenly, she went very pale, and her eyes fluttered shut as she fainted to the ground. Chapter 102 The store stocked plenty of rubbing alcohol. 
Ike doused me in the stuff until the fumes made it impossible for me to breathe or see, until all the zombie blood had washed off me. When I'd recovered a little, I picked up a fresh bottle and said, Your turn. Not quite yet, he said. His face was grim, but there was a certain light in his eyes I knew all too well. He looked at the bloody cleaver in his hand, and then down at the injured woman who lay on the floor where she'd fallen. Just let me take care of this. Then I'll clean up. I looked down at the woman. There was a round hole in her arm, just the size of a set of human teeth. She was still bleeding liberally, and her breathing was shallow, but that was probably just shock. She was still very much alive. Hold up, I told him. You want to do it? No. I looked around at the positives, who stood in a great circle around us. Nearly five hundred people, all watching, waiting to see if I had the backbone to do what was necessary. Or rather, what they'd always been taught was necessary. No, I said. Thinking of Bonnie. Thinking of my father. Thinking of everyone I'd known who was killed because they were infected. There was no law requiring it. None was needed. In all the civilized places in America, even in the looter camps, everyone understood. This was what you did. It was a tradition dating back to the early days of the crisis, when zombies outnumbered humans by a factor of ten. It was how we had survived as a species. If there was a chance you were clean, you got the plus sign tattoo, and you became a positive. But if there was no question... If you were definitely infected, you had to die. It was, I realized in that moment, an outdated custom. No, I said again. No, we're not going to kill her. Are you nuts? Luke asked. He pushed his way forward through the crowd. Finnegan, I know you want to save these people, but... But you think she's going to zombie out. Except you know how it works. The virus can take 20 years to incubate. Twenty years. That's a lifetime to some people. That's two decades of life, and you want to take that away from her. It can take twenty years or twenty minutes, Luke pointed out. Then that's twenty minutes she wouldn't have otherwise. He started to say something else, but I shouted him down. This is who we are, I said, holding up my left hand. We're positives. Society has pushed us out because they're afraid of us. Are we going to be afraid of each other? I could see from the looks on their faces, they thought the answer should be yes. But leadership isn't just agreeing with everybody. It's not just about consensus. Sometimes you need to make new rules, new laws. I brought you here, out of that camp. I fed you. I protected you with my own life. I held up my knife for them all to see. It was still pink with diluted blood. And I say she lives. They didn't nod or murmur agreement. They didn't cheer for me. But they backed off. Ike put away his cleaver. Under his breath, he spoke to me. If she zombies out tonight while we're sleeping, or tomorrow in the road, I'm going to finish it. Yes, once she's a zombie, she's not human anymore. And people will say you're crazy. That you're going to get us all killed. Then I'll have to hope she doesn't zombie out tonight or tomorrow, I told him. Here, I said to Luke. Help me get her sitting up. We need to get her awake so we can move out. He didn't want to touch her, but he did as I'd asked. For all his doubts and questions, Luke always stood by me. Everyone seemed to have forgotten that I'd said we could rest for a day in the Food Queen. I think they wanted to be away from that place as quickly as possible. Within the hour, we were walking again. Walking west. Chapter 103 We set out to the sound of rattling wheels. There was so much canned food in the Food Queen that we couldn't carry it all. Luckily, the people who'd built that place had provided us with a perfect means to convey their bounty. Wire shopping carts still as shiny and bright as the day they'd been made. Some had wobbly wheels, and a few collapsed when we tried to push them, but dozens of them worked just fine. I can't help but smile 
when I remember the horrible, rumbling, squeaking noise they made as we pushed them down the highway. It was annoying as hell at the time, but now I think of that time with a certain nostalgia, despite the constant danger, despite the uncertainty of the people I led. I had made a new law, and I was proud of it, proud of what it meant for us. Of course, you can't just declare something true and it becomes a fact. Someone will always challenge you. And that led to one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, but one of the most important. It took two days before anyone questioned my law. Only two days. I watched, feeling helpless, as the woman in the blue shirt moved about the camp at night, the wound on her arm like some terrible new kind of tattoo. Like the plus sign on her left hand, it became a mark of shame. As much as I wanted people to accept her, as much as I tried by sheer willpower to make them take her in, she was shunned. No one would eat with her or let her sleep near them. I brought her forward and had her sleep next to me the first night, but she didn't seem to find that acceptable. I could see why. If she was under my direct protection, that meant she was in danger, and she could never feel comfortable at my side. I watched it happen. I consulted with my advisors about what to do, but no one had any ideas. I watched the whole thing, ready to move at a moment's notice, but when the time came, I wasn't ready. I'll always blame myself for her death. She was found one morning with her throat cut. The culprit wasn't hard to discover. He was a big positive, one of the old bosses from the camp, and he was proud of what he'd done. He showed everyone the razor he'd used, still red with her blood. I protected us all, he announced, and plenty of people murmured agreement around him. Everyone knows it has to be done. Just because Finnegan says otherwise, we know the world we live in. We know the rules. Ike and Mackie stood on either side of me as we listened to him crow. I think they believed I was in danger, that at any moment my leadership was going to be overthrown. Maybe it was but I wasn't afraid just then. I was enraged. I didn't see red. I couldn't hear my heart thumping in my chest. This was a much purer, colder anger, an indignation I'd never felt before. I'd made a law, and this man had violated it. If I'd been the boss of a work crew, or the leader of a gang of road pirates, or a dare, or some warlord of the wilderness— I would have stalked over and slaughtered that man where he stood. I would have ruled by death and violence, and it would have been over. But my anger wouldn't let him off that easily. So we had a trial. I had him brought before me. He came readily, perhaps thinking this was his big chance to push me off my throne. I could see the excitement in his eyes, and it made me sick. Instead of having him beaten or killed, though, I asked him to tell me his story his side of things, to describe in vivid detail what he'd done and why. He was happy to. He laughed as he described cutting the woman's throat. When asked for his justification, he simply said, She was infected, and everybody knows it, and left it at that. You heard me when I laid down the new law, didn't you? I asked. Yeah, of course I did. So you knew this wasn't acceptable? All right. It's time for judgment. I could simply pronounce you guilty, I suppose. But in the old days, before the crisis, they didn't like to do that. And I can see why. It shouldn't be up to just me. He shot me a quizzical look. He couldn't seem to understand. When you broke the law, I said, you didn't just hurt me. You hurt all of us. All of us should have a say in what happens to you. I turned and looked at the positives gathered around us. Pretty much everybody had come to see what would happen. I think this man is guilty of breaking our law. Everyone who agrees with me, raise your hand. I had assumed that every hand would go up, or that none of them would. In fact, it looked pretty evenly divided. A lot of people kept their hands down. A lot of people turned their faces away, like they didn't know what to think. Luke started running around the crowd, counting raised hands. More than half, he said when he was done. I nodded. 
The condemned man jumped up and tried to run for it. Mackey had already moved behind him while the votes were tallied, and now he tripped the man and knocked him to the ground. You're guilty, I said. Maybe not all of us agree, but more than half. You can't kill me for this, the man shouted. I only did what I was supposed to do. I did what anyone would do. Apparently not anyone, I said. Not everyone. Not us. Ike lifted his cleaver. I'll do it, he said. No. Everyone turned to look at me. Their eyes said, what now? No. We're not going to kill him. Blood doesn't answer for blood. Then what are we going to do with him? Luke asked. He broke our law. That means he isn't one of us anymore. Someone, give him a day's worth of food and water. There was a lot of commotion at that. A great deal of confusion. But it was done, as I said. Now, I told him, get out of here. What? What the hell are you? You're not one of us anymore, so you don't walk with us. Head east, if you want, and try to make it back to the camp. North or south, whatever direction you pick. But start walking. Don't follow us, and don't come near us again, or we will kill you. He protested. He spluttered with rage. He threatened me. I'll be dead by nightfall, he said. The first zombie that comes along will get me. You're killing me. You just want to keep your hands clean. You're just too chicken shit to do it yourself. No. I drew my knife and held it up. If you prefer to die, come here and kneel before me and I'll cut your throat myself. I would have done it too. Eventually, he walked. Chapter 104 the rest of us moved on, and we survived. We made do. We moved from one supermarket to the next. There were, it turned out, plenty of them. Most had been looted. We were well outside the military control zone at that point, but a few still had shelves of canned food just waiting for us. We supplemented this meager diet with game when we could. Herds of animals roamed those great empty plains, mostly a kind of wild, scrawny pig that was almost impossible to catch, but that tasted so good when it was roasted over a fire that it was worth it. I created hunting parties, and Ike taught them how to kill. Some of them already knew how to butcher and prepare steaks and chops. We found weapons, in old gun shops and malls. We found what we needed. Little by little, we all learned to survive out there, in the western wilderness, and the miles disappeared under our feet. Sometimes it rained, and we had to take what shelter we could find. Sometimes we were beset by mobs of zombies, and we had to fend them off. But we handled it as best we could. We lost people, it's true. People died under my watch. But I kept to my new law. No one was killed for being infected. Those who zombied out were another matter, of course. And some of us did. We were positives, after all, and some of us had been infected for years. When it happened, it was always bad. But the crazy thing was, when someone did zombie out in the night and bit half a dozen of their neighbors before they were put down, the people didn't turn on me. They didn't blame me for lax hygiene. They worked together at putting the zombie down. They grieved together, and they swore to be more alert, more cautious in the future. It actually brought them closer together. I was learning what every leader since time immemorial has probably known. People will tear one another apart when they're safe. They'll bicker and argue and fight among themselves. But if they have a common enemy, an external threat, they will bond so tightly together, nothing can drive them apart. We walked all through the end of that summer and well into the autumn. And we were okay. I had spent so much of my life being taught to fear, to fear the zombies, to fear other people. That fear, that paranoia, had kept the first generation alive after the crisis. It had been valuable to them. As we got better and better at surviving, at not having to worry about every little thing, I learned that fear wasn't worth the price. The fear had turned some human beings into animals and some into savages. It had turned good people bad 
and had turned a country inward until it was feeding on itself. There was hardship and horror behind us, and more to come. But as strange as it may seem, I was happy in that fragile time. I was joyful, even. A big part of that was Kylie. Though our material situation had not improved much from when we were living together in an SUV in the wilderness of New Jersey, we had both found a kind of hope and belief in each other. Every night we came together, and little by little, we became more intimate. She would let me touch some part of her, some wounded patch of skin. Some nights, it seemed almost absurd, as when she let me touch the backs of her knees. It turned out that Adair had beaten her there once as a punishment, leaving her barely able to walk. She flinched and wept as I stroked the soft skin there, but afterward, she said it was like a healing. Little by little, her armor came down, and she came back to life. It was an incredible thing to watch. I would catch her eye at some random moment of the day, and in the second before she looked away, her eyelids would crinkle with embarrassment or shy surprise, and she would bite her upper lip. Or I would see her play with her hair like a normal woman in a normal world, lost in thought. Most of the time it was just seeing her smile, a cautious, furtive smile. Sometimes it was seeing her weep with the other women, the ones who had lost someone dear to them. Those moments broke my heart. The funny thing is, sometimes you have to let your heart break to remind yourself it's there. I didn't understand at the time what we were building, she and I. I didn't understand what any of us were building, the strength or the meaning of the community of positives. Most of my days were spent just keeping us alive. But with every step we took to the West, things got just a little better, a little brighter. It felt like not the end, but the beginning of a world. Chapter 105 You can't really understand the scale of this country until you've walked across it. You can't grasp the scope, the sheer magnitude of the pre-crisis world until you've crossed its ruins. There was a highway cloverleaf somewhere in Indiana, I think. It has to have been before we saw Indianapolis, a thing of concrete with great arching ramps that lifted over our heads, carrying roadways so wide fifty men could have walked them abreast. The way they soared up, then whirled around to tie into knots made me dizzy. It took us most of a day to walk from one end of that cloverleaf to the other. Villages could have nestled in the great loops of concrete serpent that draped across the ground. It was impossible to imagine why such a thing was needed, to comprehend just how many cars must have headed every day for just how many destinations. How quickly they had moved. It took us weeks to walk from one end of a state to another. Weeks while we burned through our food. People died along the way. We'd met our fair share of zombies along the way, but we'd seen no sign of other human beings. I'd been a little surprised we hadn't seen any looter crews at work, though we stayed far from any developed areas and any structures big enough to be used as looter camps. As for real civilization, we gave the walled cities of Columbus and Dayton a very wide berth, knowing there was no point even trying to make contact with them. They were never going to let us in, not with the plus signs on our left hands, and at worst, they might call in the army to keep us away. Indianapolis was another story, though. I spent a lot of time studying the maps, looking for a good way around, but the highway seemed to go right through the city, and I didn't want to traipse around it through endless fields of overgrown vegetation where any number of zombies might be hiding, waiting for us. Luke, Ike, and I huddled over the road atlas, studying how to proceed. Here are some surface roads that'll take us around, Ike pointed out, but I shook my head. Kylie and I tried that outside of Trenton. It didn't go so well. These main highways are still in good shape, but the smaller roads have fallen to pieces, and they'll be cluttered with abandoned cars, and zombies love to make their nests in abandoned cars. What about this ring road? Luke said, pointing at Route 465, which joined up with other roads to make a rough circle around the city. 
That was my first thought, I said. But we don't know how much of the city is walled off. If we can avoid it, I don't want to get close enough that anyone even sees us. A couple of us should scout ahead, Ike suggested. See how close we can get. I'll go. It'll be dangerous. He couldn't hide his excitement at the possibility. Ike would have preferred death to boredom, and our long trek had been pretty boring as far as he was concerned. I'll go too, I said. Bad idea. We can't afford to lose you, Luke pointed out. So I'll be careful. I can't ask anyone else to go in my place. I won't ask them to do something I wouldn't. Maybe I was just starting to get bored myself. So Ike and I headed out while the rest of the positives made camp, all of them excited and glad for a day off their feet. Kylie saw me off with a deep, soulful kiss. Her eyes flashed with emotion now every time she looked at me. It was intoxicating. We'd come so far, and I'd gotten so used to her dead-eyed stares that when she was alive with me now, no other woman could possibly compare. I wrapped my arms around her and held her close. If you don't come back, she said, you'll be fine. I know this is scary for you, sending me off like this, but she sighed and grabbed my lips to stop me from talking. I was going to say, if you don't come back, I'll take these people south and the long way around the city. You think I need you to keep me alive? Finn, I was surviving in the wilderness for years before you came along. I laughed and hugged her again, and then I headed west with Ike toward the big bad city. Each of us had a shotgun now, looted from a hunter's shop in a mini mall in Ohio. I had my knife, and he had his cleaver. We carried enough food and boiled water for three days and a blanket each. Nothing else. We wanted to travel light so we would make good time. We were still about twenty miles out from the city, but we ate up the ground all that day. I'd forgotten how fast one or two people could move on their own and how the five hundred positives had cut down that pace. Ike and I said little as we hurried along. We saved our breath for walking. It was strange, though. The way we fell into the same rhythm, the same stride, without even trying. I often forgot in those days that he and I had grown up together. We'd become such different people, but in many ways, we were still the kids who fished in the subway and climbed skyscrapers looking for canned food. It felt good to be working with him again, no matter what darkness he'd found in his soul or what I'd found in mine. Then we stopped for lunch and he shattered my mood beyond repair. We had some sliced pig meat and boiled water, the best our tribe could provide. We ate in silence. I was raising a bite to my lips when he said out of the blue, Finn, I don't know where it is you're headed. I don't know what you're looking for out here. But I know one thing. I'm not going there with you. I lowered the food. Suddenly, it didn't look edible. I need you. I said, we, the positives, need you. No. Maybe at first. He sighed and looked at me with such a desperate, longing glance I had to turn away. I'm no good for what you're trying to do. If things keep changing like they have been, eventually you're going to have to exile me. Or kill me. Bullshit, I said. He shrugged. He wasn't looking at me anymore. We'd stopped under a copse of trees, and he kept looking up into their branches, as if searching for the insects I could hear buzzing up there. The last cicadas of the year, probably. Ever since I ran from New York, I've known one thing. I don't believe in anything. I just don't have it in me. I'm not living for anything. I don't know why I'm living at all. Come on, I said. That's bullshit. That's useless thinking. I threw my lunch into the undergrowth. Finn, I'm getting bored again. Helping people learn to hunt was okay, and fighting zombies is good, but boiling soybeans, making laws, it just feels like death to me to sit through all that crap. There's something inside me, something maybe I don't like so much, but it's part of me. It is me, and it talks to me all the time. It says... Why don't you break something, just to see what happens? Why don't you start a fight, just for something to do? All these questions, all these ideas. 
I think if I was born before the crisis, I would have been some kind of criminal. They would have had to lock me up. Now, out here, sometimes you need somebody violent. Somebody who isn't afraid to fuck things up just for fun. But when you get where you're going, I'm just going to be a liability. I had no idea what else to say. We sat and listened to the cicadas for a very, very long time. Neither of us speaking. Neither of us looking at the other. When he did speak, I was so lost in thought I barely heard him. It was funny, huh? You and me finding each other again? After what happened? I mean, what are the odds I would get assigned to that camp? About as good as the odds on me surviving long enough to get there, I said. He nodded and got to his feet. You're like the one thing in my life that didn't completely suck, he said. You're going to make me cry, I joked, though I wasn't feeling very humorous. I said completely. There's plenty of times I wanted to kick your ass. Still do, kind of. Just on principle. He laughed. You could try. He kicked at a fallen tree branch and sent it whirling off into the brush. When I... When I took care of your mom, tell me something. Was I doing you a favor? Or was I hurting you? Both, I told him. We were past the point of lies. Uh-huh. He picked up his pack and started back toward the road. I jogged after him. Clearly our lunch break was over. When the time comes, I'll just go, he said. I won't take the time to say goodbye or let you talk me out of it. I did not reply. We spent the rest of that day moving fast, staying clear of the highway in case it was being watched. On either side, the green tides of overgrown fields shimmered and shook in the autumn sun, and their movement was hypnotic enough to keep me from thinking too much. I knew I didn't want to think very much just then. A couple hours later, we saw the city up ahead of us. Chapter 106 That land is so flat, you can see for miles in any direction. But a strange trick of perception means things are constantly sneaking up on you. Indianapolis, before the crisis, must not have been a discreet city like New York. It wasn't a tight knot of buildings with a clear border, but instead a sort of general increase in development. We started seeing buildings on the sides of the highway, big stores at first, but then smaller houses and patches of parkland. Roads converged toward us, all headed in the same direction. In the distance, we saw the spires of office buildings, shimmering in the heat haze. And then we saw the wall. It must have been built during the crisis, built in a hurry, but by people who still had access to powerful tools and an enormous pool of manpower. It stood across the road, an obstacle thirty feet high, built from stacked pyramids of old, rusted shipping containers. The containers had been filled with construction debris, broken concrete, old bits of rebar, sand, gravel, whatever the engineers had on hand. To hold the containers together, chain-link fencing had been draped over them like a net, and then coil after coil of barbed wire was strung along the wall lengthwise. It was ugly and dirt simple, and bigger than it probably needed to be. It would have kept out an army of zombies forever. Except then someone had come and blown a hole right through it. Where the wall crossed the road, it was broken wide open, the shipping containers torn apart like they were made of cardboard. The barbed wire had been peeled back until it stuck up in the air like frizzy hair. The breach was wide enough to drive two SUVs through, side by side. The torn shipping containers in that hole were still streaked with soot, and a smell of harsh chemicals filled the air as we approached. Ike and I had spent hours watching that hole, sure that someone must be guarding it. Whatever had happened here, the people of Indianapolis would want to fix it, we thought. That hole would make them paranoid. Anyone approaching that opening would be shot without warning. So we moved in very slowly, very cautiously, looking for signs of snipers or landmines or any kind of defenders at all. 
and we kept not seeing them. Something's wrong here, I said, when we were no more than a hundred yards from the breached wall. I mean, a hole in a wall like that is wrong enough, but there's something worse. Something really bad going on here. I really wish I knew what it was. One way to find out, Ike said as he jumped up from our hiding spot. Before I could stop him, he ran forward, straight toward that wall, waving his arms over his head. I'm not a zombie, he shouted. I am not a zombie! Nobody shot at him. Nobody shouted for him to turn back or get down or just fuck off. I didn't see any heads pop up from concealment along the wall. I didn't see anything moving anywhere except for Ike. He walked right up to the hole in the wall. Then he walked through. Jesus, Ike! I said, jumping up from my own hiding spot. I ran after him, intending to grab him and pull him back, pull him out of there, before the good people of Indianapolis figured out just what kind of horrible death he deserved. But when I reached the wall and looked in through the breach, I knew that wasn't going to happen. The people of Indianapolis weren't going to kill Ike, because there weren't any people in Indianapolis. The place was deserted. No, that isn't the word. It had been sacked, razed. Inside the wall, every building had been burned. Wooden structures were leveled, leaving only pits of ash and charred beams. Stone structures were black with soot, their insides gutted and left to collapse. I'd seen destruction on this level before, in Trenton, but their plant life had twenty years to climb over the ruins, softening the sharp edges, hiding the worst of the damage, this was like looking into a mouthful of broken teeth. We shouldn't be here, I said to Ike, but he was already hurrying forward, deeper into the city. As reduced as it may have been, Trenton had not been uninhabited. Much to our chagrin, Kylie and I had seen what people living in a ruin were capable of. I was terrified that any moment someone would appear and start throwing rocks, and this time... I didn't have an SUV or a driver like Kylie to get me out of there. I couldn't just leave Ike in there, however. I desperately wanted to take the shotgun off my shoulder and hold it in my hands, if only to reassure me. But I was worried if anyone saw me like that, they would assume I was a looter looking for an easy score. So I kept my hands where they could be seen as I raced after Ike. I needn't have bothered being so cautious. Maybe Ike had already sensed it. Maybe, attuned as he was to death and destruction, he could sense that this place would not hurt him. More likely, he just didn't care. I followed him deep into the center of the city, where its buildings grew up straight and tall from the earth, too tall to be burned down. Someone had still tried. The lower stories of the office towers were blackened, their windows shattered. The destruction had a sort of haphazard quality there, though whereas the outlying buildings must have been systematically and methodically destroyed. Here, it looked like someone had sprayed fire indiscriminately, almost as an afterthought. As I chased after Ike, he took me right into the center of the city. The buildings fell away to reveal an enormous circular park. It must have been acres wide, surrounded by a broad street. Trees had filled that open area once but they had been cut down to stumps long ago. Now the ground was open, surrounding a monument 250 feet high. It had the form of a massive obelisk, almost as big, I thought, as the Statue of Liberty. At its top was a bronze statue that I could barely make out. It didn't matter what the monument might have commemorated once. It had since been repurposed. Up and down the length of the obelisk, Someone with a lot of paint and plenty of time had created an image of a skeleton 200 feet high. Some attempt had been made to give its rictus grin a cheerful expression, but that attempt had failed. It could not help but look sinister. Its bony hands beckoned us to come forward. At the base of the obelisk were four square fountains, one on each side of the obelisk. It was here that we found the missing people of Indianapolis, or at least we found their bones. 
They must have been piled in the fountains in great heaps, then doused in some kind of fuel and set alight. The skeletons in the fountains formed pyramids twice as high as a man, wider than some of the buildings around us. So many bodies. So many people. It staggered me, literally made me stumble as my knees failed me. The bones were blackened and broken, collapsing to ash as we watched. The stink was overpowering, not the stink of death, which I was used to. This was the stink of burning, and it was still so strong it made my eyes water. Oh, God, no, I said. Oh, no. There could be no doubt that whoever had done this, whatever mad army of zealots, had burned an entire city's people as a sacrifice to their god, worshipped the same deity as the death cultists from the camp. The little skeletons I'd seen, of wire and wood, of sculpted wax, of a dead man dragged out of an abandoned car, had just been tiny images of this 200-foot icon. But where the cultists I'd known had been happy to bargain with lives that were already slipping away, the worshippers here had taken it further, so much further. And they'd done it recently. The bodies I saw couldn't have been lying in those fountains very long. There was still meat on some of them, charred meat that hadn't been devoured by scavengers yet. Ike, I said. Ike, come on, Ike. I wanted nothing but to get out of there. I'd never felt such a sensation of repulsion, of a desperate need to flee. But Ike just stood there taking it all in, studying it, memorizing every detail, nodding in something like appreciation. Chapter 107 Together we headed out of Indianapolis, eastward, back toward the Camp of Positives. Ike and I spoke even less on the way back than we had on the way out. When I got back, Kylie was waiting for me with open arms. I pushed her away, gently, because I didn't want to be with her with the stink of Indianapolis still on my clothes and hair. We can go around to the north, I told Luke and Mackie. The ring roads are clear enough. I want to get as far past the city as I can, though, before we make camp again. So we'll start first thing in the morning. They must have seen something in my eyes, because they asked a lot of questions. I didn't want to talk about what we'd seen. Eventually, they stopped trying to pry it out of me. I didn't want them to know. I didn't want any of my people to see what I'd seen. I did go and find the death cultists in my own camp. They weren't doing anything objectionable that night. There were no sick people nearing death for them to pray over, no bargains to be made at that particular moment. They smiled and waved as I approached, though their cheer faded quickly when they saw the look in my eyes. Where is it? I asked. Your idol. The skeleton. One of them pointed to a little tent off to the side, sheltered from the wind between two shopping carts. I pulled back the flap and looked inside. The skeleton was lying on a blanket, with another blanket rolled up as a pillow for it. Across its torso, they'd laid garlands of wildflowers braided together into chains. I grabbed the skeleton by its ankles and hauled it out of the tent. It flopped crazily as I dragged it out into the road, its lower jaw flapping back and forth as if it were making comical protests to this rude treatment. I had brought a hammer with me. I took it from my belt now and used it to smash the thing to dust. I started with the skull and worked my way down. I felt a little bad for whoever it had belonged to. Whoever it had been, they'd done nothing to deserve this. They'd just died in the crisis like so many others. But the skeleton had stopped being a person a long time ago. I shattered every bone of it, down to the tiny knuckle and toe bones, until it was nothing but fragments and yellowish-white powder. The worshippers did nothing to stop me. They didn't say a word, just stared at me, open-mouthed, as I crushed their idol. I was worried later that there might be repercussions, that they would try to kill me in my sleep, or that they might just gather themselves up and leave, head east or north or south, refuse to stay with me. But no one ever said a word to me, 
and no one did anything rash. It seemed like they were completely fine with me destroying their idol, especially since within two days, they found a new one. Chapter 108 Other than that, I pretended like nothing had happened. Like I hadn't seen anything in Indianapolis. Like Ike hadn't revealed anything to me there. Maybe I watched him a little more closely. Maybe I worried. I tried not to let on. We kept moving because that was what we did. We walked across Indiana as the nights grew colder. We walked through Illinois and into Iowa. It took longer and longer in the mornings for things to warm up, for the days to become bearable. Walking helped, it kept us warm, but it was tough getting going each day. We spent more time sheltered in abandoned big box stores and supermarkets, whether they held anything we could loot or not. Luke and Mackie kept asking what we were going to do when winter came, and I didn't have a good answer. Find somewhere to hunker down, I supposed. Mackie insisted that we start stockpiling food, and I agreed that it was an excellent idea. We had learned by then how to smoke the meat of the wild pigs, so it stayed edible for a long time. For every three cans of food we ate, we set one aside. Most of the time, I was all right. When I was with Kylie at night, everything was okay. In her arms, I had peace, and I could stop thinking for a while. I could just be with her, breathe her in, kiss her skin and feel her relax bit by bit. It was somewhere in that stretch of time that we found ourselves naked together, wrapped up in a blanket, kissing for hours until suddenly we were enmeshed more deeply than we'd ever been before. Our bodies joined together, and I stopped, afraid, worried about what was happening, worried what it would do to her. It's okay, she said, though her entire body was tense. She forced herself to relax, to receive me. Just go slow. Adair was always in a rush. If you're slow, and you keep kissing me, and you tell me you love me, I love you, I said with no hesitation. If I say stop... You have to stop, okay? Okay, I told her. Okay. 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 She didn't say stop. Afterward, she pulled away from me and threw her clothes on and ran out into the cold night, and I knew I shouldn't follow her, even though I desperately wanted to. She went and slept alone that night, and for three nights after that. The fourth night, she came back to the tent we shared, and we made love again and that time she didn't run away. She never ran away again, and she never told me to stop again. She became a refuge for me, and I for her. A safe place, a haven in a dangerous world. I suppose that's the story of every pair of lovers since the world began, but I also think that for every one of those lovers, the story was new, different. What Kylie and I shared was sacred to me which is not to say it made everything perfect. There were still constant problems to deal with. Fights broke out between various groups of positives. One man tried to steal food from our winter stores. We didn't exile him, but the jury was split almost down the middle. So instead, I put him in one of the hunting parties, even though he'd never gone out after the pigs before. It kept him away from the food stores, and it meant he would help replenish what he'd pilfered. Luke thought that was a good solution, though Mackie thought we should have beaten him as well. No, I said. That was how things worked in the camp. We aren't like that anymore. We aren't those people anymore. Then who are we? he asked. A lot of my people still thought of themselves as escapees, as people who had fled the intolerable conditions of the medical camp, but who were just biding their time until they could go home again. They thought of themselves as having a home, away from our little tribe. Maybe, I thought, maybe some of them would leave us and go back and try to take up their old lives exactly where they'd left off. I knew I was never going back to New York. I asked Kylie, and she said she couldn't imagine going back, that she couldn't even remember what Connecticut had been like. The answer was in front of me, a puzzle I could solve. I had most of the pieces, but I never bothered to put them all together. 
but when the time came, it would seem like the most natural thing in the world. Seeds, I said one day. We need seeds. Luke frowned at me. The plants out here are already dying. It's a little late to start gathering seeds. What are you thinking? We need seeds. There will be some left. Soy seeds, corn seeds, wheat, tomatoes, lettuce, and turnips, potatoes. Anything we can find. I don't think potatoes even have seeds, he told me. Find someone who does know. Get all my gardeners together. Ask them. Ask them how we can get seeds now. This is important. But why? Luke and I were walking side by side, trudging along like we had been for many weeks. We didn't even think about what our feet were doing anymore. We'd walked so far. I guess you can eat seeds, but you plant them, I said, as if he didn't know that. You plant them, and food just grows right up out of the ground. Ground. Just like that. I had it. We're going to stop walking, I told him. We're going to find a place, and we're going to make it our own. Chapter 109 Easier said than done. Finding the right place meant leaving the highway. The small towns we'd passed through on our march west had all been woefully inadequate to our needs. They tended to be spread out along the road, a couple of roads huddled around the wide open highway. We needed someplace compact, someplace we could fence in to keep the zombies out while we huddled down for the winter. We needed a place small enough to defend, big enough for 500 of us, far enough away from the main highway that we would be safe from road pirates, close enough to a major abandoned urban area that if necessary, we could go out and loot for canned food when our smoked pig meat ran out. We needed a place that felt right, too. And a place that wasn't tainted by death. Kylie and I typically went out with the scouting parties now, looking for a new home. I would have preferred to leave her back at the camp where she would have been safe, but she would have none of it. Now that she'd come back to life, to herself, she insisted that she be part of every decision. I think she wanted to make sure I picked a place she liked. It was going to be her home too, after all. After my initial reticence, I was glad to have her along. It felt good to be with her out on the plains, out in that wide open landscape. It was a strangely romantic landscape we covered. I will never forget those silent places where the wind blew in straight lines for hundreds of miles, where the moon rose so big on the horizon it looked like an arched portal into a silver world. The houses we saw with windows that hadn't been opened in twenty years, and the way the first tentative fingers of wind would stir the ancient dust inside. Having her along also meant I had someone there to share my horror when we found more evidence of the skeleton cult. Far too often when we chanced upon some likely little town, we had to turn back because we saw the grinning face of their icon writ large across the faces of the houses. I wouldn't let my scouts go near these haunted places for fear of what we might discover inside their silent buildings. It couldn't be as big or as horrible as what had happened to Indianapolis, but even one sign of human sacrifice would be enough to scare my people. I wanted them inspired, not terrified. The skeletons were a message, one I could read. The cult that killed Indianapolis wasn't done. They were sweeping through the West, wreaking their havoc wherever they went. Whatever madness possessed them had not yet been sated. We found a house sitting on a low rise of earth, standing up straight and square against the blue sky. The whole side of the house had been turned into a giant mural of a grinning skull. I didn't like to look at it. Kylie hated the skeletons as much as I did. These are the same people who took Heather, she said. They think the same way, just bigger. A little of the old armor crept into her voice, the deadness the place inside herself where she could retreat to keep away from the horrors. Except now it seemed different. It seemed like she was in control of it, that she could put that armor on or take it off as she liked. Yeah, I said. 
I don't know how the cult got into the medical camp. I thought of Red Kate's knife, the one with the skulls around the hilt, and realized for the first time the cult had already spread as far as the East Coast. I don't know how many of them there are, or what they think they're going to achieve, but it's the idea that's important to them. This idea you can placate death. We'll stay out of their way, she said, if we can. If not, we'll show them they're wrong. She was my strength when I was weak, and I was never more grateful for her than then. It seemed, based on what I saw, that the skeleton cult was moving west. I took my scouting party south, thinking to get away from their influence, and also that we might end up somewhere with more mild winters. We found more skeletons painted on the barns and farmhouses down there. But we found something else as well. Chapter 110 Five of us were in the scouting party, Kylie and myself, Mackie, and two women named Archer and Strong, tough women who had been bosses back in the medical camp. We were all armed with guns and knives in case we ran across any zombies, though it seemed the skeleton cult had done a pretty good job of clearing those out wherever they went. We ate up the ground. We must have walked thirty miles each day, but so far we'd found nothing. Just endless stretches of farmland, none of it useful for our purposes. Either the places we found didn't have enough buildings to house all five hundred of my positives, or they were too close to the highways. At least we saw fewer of the painted skeletons. That was something. It told me I was on the right track. The year was growing old, and the days shorter, and I had to call a stop earlier than I'd wanted that day, because it was getting dark, and we were likely to stumble into a nest of zombies if we couldn't see where we were going. In the last daylight, I climbed on top of a low rise to get an idea of what lay ahead. From there... I could see an old farmhouse just off a decaying road, about a twenty-minute walk to the south, and I announced we would hole up there for the night. The others seemed happy to hear it. Up ahead on the side of the road stood a couple of abandoned cars. We would need to clear them out if there were any zombies inside, so I sent Strong and Archer forward to take a look. I wasn't expecting any trouble. We hadn't seen a zombie all day. My shotgun was slung over my shoulder, so it didn't bang against my hip while I walked. I stopped well clear of the cars and took a drink of water from my bottle, then turned to hand it to Kylie. As she reached for it, something exploded with a loud, flat bang, and I was thrown backward, landing on the road surface on my shoulder. I looked up and saw a puff of black smoke rising from one of the cars. Archer was stumbling around in a circle, clutching her face. Bright blood covered one of her arms. What the hell just happened? Mackie demanded. He was down on the ground, too, crawling on his belly. Archer's hurt, Kylie said, and she ran forward, toward the cars. I shouted at her to come back, to stay clear, but she wasn't listening. I rose to a low crouch and ran after her, thinking I would grab her arm and pull her back. When I was halfway there, the side of Archer's head erupted. Blood and brains leapt out of her shattered skull and bright ribbons. She slumped over and fell down next to Strong, who tried to catch her as she fell. Strong yelled something I couldn't make out. Mackie was still down on the ground, wriggling his way forward, his hunting rifle in his hands. I managed to grab Kylie, she had stopped running by then, and I turned her around, sent her hurrying back toward the others. I heard a rifle shot, and I thought Mackie had fired his weapon, but it wasn't him. A bright spot of blood appeared on Kylie's shoulder. She didn't cry out, but it didn't matter. Someone was shooting at her. I grabbed her and shoved her down onto the road surface and covered her with my own body. Just as another rifle round dug into the pavement, right next to my head. Sniper! Strong kept bellowing. Sniper! Shut up! Mackie said and took his shot. And then, silence. Silence for way too long. Mackie! I called when I couldn't take it anymore when I had to know what was going on. Mackie, what just happened? He came up behind me and yanked me to my feet. Come on, boss. I know you don't like fighting, but I don't think we have a choice right now. I got that sniper, but there may be others inside. I looked down at Kylie, lying in the road. She was breathing heavily and her face was pale. She didn't make a sound. 
but I could see from her eyes that she was in pain. I wrestled my shotgun around until I could hold it properly. I thought about the time back in Adair's SUV, when we'd been besieged by road pirates and I hadn't fired a single shot. How I had exiled people from my tribe rather than executing them. I thought about how much I hated killing. And I thought about how the stupid fuckers in the farmhouse had shot Mike highly, and how I would cut them to pieces with my own two hands. Come on, I said, and ran toward the farmhouse. I'll cover you, Strong said, bringing her own rifle up. I didn't fucking care. I ran right up to the door of the house, Mackie running along behind me, saying something about finding cover, about being smart and taking the slow. I kicked in the door and shoved the barrel of my shotgun through into the darkness inside. A hatchet came down out of the shadows, aimed right at my head. I brought my shotgun up and yanked the trigger. The burst of light showed me a man with a very surprised look on his face, crumpling to the floor. A woman with a revolver came at me next, but Mackie knocked her down with the butt of his rifle. We stormed inside the door and pressed our backs against the wall. Please, boss, slow down, he whispered. I could feel my heart thudding in my chest. My adrenal glands told me to kill every person I saw. I forced myself to calm down, just a little. I lifted one finger and held it against my lips. There were no lights on inside the house, but I could make out a few details. I saw a big front room with a staircase at its far end, stairs leading up to the second floor. I couldn't hear any footsteps. I pointed at the stairs. Mackie moved forward slowly, careful not to make a sound until he was standing directly below the stairs, his rifle aimed upward at the top of the steps. I moved around to one side until I could just see up the length of the stairs. If anyone came down from there, we would have them in a crossfire. I saw something in the corner of my eye. I looked over and saw a stone fireplace set into one wall of the big room. The embers of a fire still burned there, shedding a little light on a skeleton idol about two feet tall. Maybe it was just the firelight, but it looked like there was blood on it. Someone took a step upstairs, a step toward us. Mackie fired a bullet straight up, not even trying to hit anyone. I heard a scream, but a scream of fear, not pain. It sounded like the scream of a child. We did what you said! Someone else, an adult, shouted. We were faithful! You said you would leave us alone! My bloodlust drained away as fast as it had come on. I don't know who you think we are, I called back. But you're wrong. You're not... You're not stalkers? Then why are you killing us? We didn't start this, I said. One of my people walked up to a car outside, and it blew up in her face. That was one of our traps. We got them all over the place for taking care of zombies. That wasn't meant for you. Yeah, well, then you shot two more of us. What choice did we have? Stalkers or not, nobody comes out this way to be nice. I glanced over at Mackie. He gave me a nod. He was still ready to fight if anyone poked their head down those stairs. You worship the skeleton, I said. You want to explain that? You want to explain how come you don't? This wasn't getting us anywhere. Come down from there, one at a time with your hands showing. If we see a weapon, we'll shoot. How do we know you won't shoot anyway? I growled with frustration. I didn't want to do this, but I couldn't see any choice. You killed one of us and wounded one more. I've got plenty of reason to just burn this place to the ground with you in it. Instead, I'm talking to you. Now. One at a time. Hands showing. Starting now. Chapter 111 Kylie's wound was shallow. It bled a lot, but as long as it didn't get infected, she would be fine. Archer wasn't as lucky. Most of her head was gone. The bomb in the car, just a can of gunpowder mixed with nails, triggered when she tried to open the car's door. Had torn her up enough, she probably would have died even if the sniper hadn't finished the job. 
As for the people from the farmhouse, they'd taken their own losses. The sniper was dead, killed by Mackie's bullet. The man I'd peppered with my shotgun blast was still alive, though it looked like he might not last the night. The woman Mackie had hit with his rifle butt might have a concussion, assuming she woke up. The rest of them were unharmed. None of the children were hurt. There were six kids, all of them kneeling in front of the house with their hands on their heads, in a row from oldest to youngest. The youngest couldn't be more than five. A little apart from them, his hands tied together behind his back, was their father, a man of about forty with a shock of white hair that had never thinned. He said his name was Deptford, and he'd been living on this farm since before the crisis. Him and his wife, his two brothers, and their kids. I got the impression that some of the kids were fathered by each of the three men, and nobody had bothered to keep too careful track who was whose. I had no problem with their domestic arrangements. The world was too big and too empty for those kind of judgments. Their religion was another matter. But it turned out that wasn't their fault, the way they told it anyway. I dragged the skeleton idol out of the house and confronted the father with it. He just looked away. In the last light of sunset, I could see I'd been right. There were bloodstains on it. What the hell are you doing with this? And whose blood is this? I got nothing to say to positive trash, the man told me. He looked like he expected me to smack the truth out of him. We didn't come here looking for trouble. We just wanted a place to spend the night. You asked if we were stalkers. What the hell is a stalker? That made him look at me. He seemed legitimately surprised. Them outriders. You know, from Michigan Mike's set. I glanced over at Mackey, but he just shrugged. Whoever this Michigan Mike was, neither of us had ever heard of him. Stalkers, they call themselves. They come on motorcycles, 20 of them at a time, the father told me. They find where people are and they tell them they've got a choice, sacrifice or be sacrificed. They come by again a couple weeks later to see if you've done it. You're not supposed to see them a third time. That's who we thought you were. But we'd done what they asked, so we didn't know why they'd come for us. And so we got a little jumpy, that's all. I looked over at the dead body laying out next to the bombed-out car. That's all, I thought. A woman dead. Another wounded. This Michigan Mike. He's the head of the skeleton cult? The father grimaced in annoyance. You don't know shit, huh? Michigan Mike's just one of the lieutenants. The head of that cult. He's called Anubis. Sometimes the Jackal. He's out west somewhere, supposed to be. Maybe Colorado. Maybe Montana, someplace big and empty. Got an army ten thousand strong. Even the government is afraid of Anubis. He's got religion on his side. He's got a god working for him. The Death God. Everybody either worships his god or they end up on his altars. Where the hell you coming from? You never heard about this. It's been going on for years. I thought of Indianapolis. I thought of thousands of bodies dumped in a fountain and set on fire. Maybe I'd made a terrible mistake leading my people west. Maybe we would have been better off going back to Pennsylvania, where Caxton worked tirelessly to clean up her state. I ground the ball of my thumb into my eye socket, suddenly very tired and scared. I started to turn away, but then I thought of something. You made a sacrifice, right? That's where the blood stains on your idol came from? The father stared at me. Who did you kill? When he didn't answer, I leaned close and shouted in his face, Who did you murder for them? Finally, he looked scared, like he should have all along. Listen, I just did what I had to, to keep my people safe. Who was it? My, my daughter, the lazy one. She wasn't pulling her weight anyhow, and, and daughters... Daughters, it's easy to come by. You can always make more. That time, I did hit him. Smacked him so hard, he fell sideways and buried his face in the dirt. Then I turned and strode away, anger and bitterness filling every nook and cranny in me. I had to close my eyes and wait for it to subside. When I opened my eyes again, Mackie and Kylie were standing in front of me, watching me carefully. I glanced over and saw Strong still watching the prisoners. 
she looked pissed. I'd known that she and Archer were lovers, and these people had taken that away from her. I remembered how I felt when they shot Kylie. If I gave the word, Strong would have killed the entire Deptford clan, then and there. What do we do next? Mackie asked carefully. He must have seen the rage on my face. He's right, I said. What? Mackie asked. Kylie gave me a guarded look. She was very, very interested in what I was going to say next, and how this was going to play out. He did what he did to protect his family. We might have done the same thing if his people came snooping around our camp. Oh, come on, Finnegan, this is... Mackie's eyes went wide with disbelief. This is completely different. How? Because this is them, and that would be us. I could see in his face. He knew that what he was saying didn't make perfect logical sense. He didn't care. I'm not about to forgive him and forget all this, I assured him. The kids can choose for themselves, I said. They can come with us or stay here. Obviously, we can't carry their wounded, so they have to stay. The father stays here. We take all their guns. You're just going to let him be? Mackie asked. They don't get punished? No, I said. No? He demanded. No? Why the fuck not? Because this is us, I said. That's not how we live. Not now, not in the future. This is us. We don't kill unless we have to, and we show compassion when we can. That's our law now. That's my law. Mackie stormed off in disbelief. He'd been one of the good bosses back in the camp, one who didn't beat his workers just for fun. But apparently, there are levels of compassion, and not everyone agrees on where the lines should be drawn. He'd beaten his workers when they needed it. I could hardly expect him to see this my way. On the other hand, Kylie was nodding slowly, as if I'd said something profound and she was working it through. In the end, all but one of the kids joined us. They would have a hard time fitting in with our tribe. They lacked the plus sign tattoos on the backs of their hands that gave us cohesion, but they would have a better life all the same, I thought. The one who stayed was the youngest girl. Kylie tried to talk her out of it, but she wouldn't hear it. She would stay with her father because he needed her. That was her choice. That was another of my laws. People can choose for themselves. If they make bad choices, that's not for me to second guess. Chapter 112 We came away from that farmhouse with a couple new people and a bunch of guns. The family there had stockpiled a significant arsenal during the crisis. That was a good thing. We barely had enough guns for our scouting parties as it was. But the encounter with the family gave us something far more important in the long run. Losing Archer was hard, but her death would not be in vain. It gave us hearth. The children we picked up at the farmhouse knew the local area pretty well. They'd gone out looting often enough, and they knew where clean water could be found, where the wild pigs tended to gather, and, most important to me where all the little towns were. It turned out that my scouting party had walked right past an abandoned town and never seen it. There was a good reason for that. The land around us was as flat as a tabletop. You could see for miles in any direction except where the occasional tree blocked the view. We'd assumed we would find any town just by keeping our eyes open. It hadn't occurred to us that one might be hiding behind the trees. One of the children, a boy named Matthew, led us right there once he figured out what we were looking for. He took us into a little forest that had looked, from the road, like just a single copse of trees. As we got closer, it became apparent that the forest went on for hundreds of acres, an oblong-shaped thicket. We'd seen its leading edge and assumed that was all there was to the forest. It was like an optical illusion. It was first thing in the morning when we entered the forest, but the trees were so thick it was still like night under there. I worried we would stumble upon a nest of zombies, but we didn't see any. 
Matthew took us to a trail through the woods. A nature trail, he called it. A path laid down before the crisis by people who wanted to get away from their cities and see a bit of the wild world. Hard to imagine wanting to leave a city now, Mackey said. He seemed distinctly unnerved by the forest, by its darkness, and by the constant song of the insects up in the branches, by the crunch of dead leaves underfoot. The fact that for the first time in months, he couldn't see farther than a few dozen yards in any direction. I smiled to see him so put off. This was a man who'd taken the horrors of the medical camp in stride, who had faced down zombies and snipers, and a few trees made him feel ready to jump out of his skin. It's just about a mile in, Matthew said. Don't worry, it ain't covered in trees. There's a clearing. And so there was. In the heart of that forest, was a cleared space, maybe a half mile around. The trees gave way to overgrown brush. Up ahead, I saw what looked like a scaffold made of metal pipes leaning at crazy angles, strangled by vines and slowly rusting away. What is that? I asked. Kylie stomped through the brush to reach it. She dug into the vines and pulled up a piece of rubber, about a foot and a half long that had rotted and cracked. Chains were attached to either side of it. It's a swing set, she said. A kid's swing set. We were standing in a backyard, and we didn't even know it. Once I knew what to look for, I glanced up and saw that the vines ahead were clinging to the side of a house. A few dozen yards away was the corner of another house. And another. I pushed through the overgrowth nearly tripping on a fallen bit of fence. Beyond lay asphalt, cracked and colonized by weeds, and beyond that was a street. On either side of the street were the vine-covered faces of more houses, more and more. At the end of the road, I saw a big concrete building with a massive parking lot. I headed toward it. The others came along behind me, keeping an eye out for zombies, until I could make out more details. In big, silver letters on the front of the building were the words, Hearth Township High School. Beyond the school lay a street lined with shops, and another with small factories and warehouses. The vegetation had clambered over everything, vines and creepers reclaiming this place for the world that had existed before humans ever came here. But the buildings underneath seemed largely intact. We spent all day poking through them pushing open doors that had warped and swollen into their frames, climbing stairs thick with an inch of dust. The houses were empty, cleared out of furniture and appliances. The schoolrooms were bare to the walls, though hundreds of child-sized desks had been piled up in the gymnasium. The factory floors were littered with debris, but the walls stood high and wide, and the cool air inside seemed to be holding its breath, waiting for something. There were no skeletons anywhere, in either sense of the word. No dead bodies, but also no sign the cult had ever been here. Matthew seemed unwilling to enter the buildings. That was fine. We left him outside with Strong and the other children to keep an eye out for zombies. I was a little surprised when none appeared. Why are all the houses empty? Kylie asked at some point, and I realized there was something truly strange about the little town of Hearth, nestled in its clearing in the forest. I started to wonder if anyone had lived there at all, or if this town had just spontaneously appeared with no people to build it. I never been this far before, Matthew said when we asked him. My daddy always said this was a ghost place, and so I was scared to come. Ghosts? Kylie asked me, a little fear on her face. Something occurred to me. Did he say it was a ghost town? I asked. Matthew nodded. That's right. That's what he called it. I always figured there must be whole families of them here. Families of all the people that died in the crisis. I laughed. A ghost town. Kylie looked at me funny. I've heard those words before, I told her. I don't know, a story my dad told me? About towns out west, built around gold mines or whatever. When there was no more gold... The people just up and left, leaving the buildings empty behind them. I guess this place was abandoned even before the crisis. 
It must have been empty even then, which would explain why we haven't seen any zombies all day. If no people were here when the virus came, there won't be any zombies here now. Kylie seemed skeptical, but some signs suggested that I was right. In the tiny bus station near the center of town, there was a newspaper dispenser, full now of wet wood pulp and insects, but I found enough of an intact paper to see the date on it, 1998, many years before the crisis. Then there were the empty lots on the far side of the town, what looked like fields of overgrown grass, but here and there amid the vegetation, pipes stuck up from the ground, and broad, paved roads wove back and forth through the wildflowers. Plumbing? Electricity? Who knows what? All set up for houses that never got built, I said. Mackie didn't seem to care about the people who had or who had not lived in Hearth. He was more concerned about the people who might still come to visit. I like all those trees. They'll keep us from being seen, he pointed out. And there's good water here, a stream up behind those houses. But if we're too close to a highway, somebody's going to come sniffing around eventually. There's just one road, Matthew said and it runs southwest about 20 miles before it hits the highway. I looked at Mackie. He shrugged. That's a start. But even if there are no zombies here now, there will be. They'll hear us or smell us, who knows what, and they'll come. We would need to build a wall, a fence at least. I put that thought aside until well on in the afternoon, when I found a hardware store that was still full of tools and gear. The power tools meant nothing to us, and the bucket after bucket of paint we found had long since dried solid. But in a back room, we found giant rolls of chain link, ten feet wide and hundreds of feet long when we laid it out. Enough, at least, to fence off a big chunk of the little town. This is exactly what we've been looking for, I said. This is going to be our new place, our new home. Kylie put an arm around my waist. You really think so? It has everything we need. What it doesn't have, we can build. We can clear out some of those overgrown lawns and plant crops. We can hunt for pigs when we need meat. We'll have water all year as long as we boil it. And there's plenty of firewood for that. This place is perfect. They still weren't sure. We'd seen so many little towns that couldn't be defended. Towns that lacked water or were too close to the highway or that were tainted by having skeletons painted on their walls. Towns full of zombies, towns that were the wrong size, too big to defend, too small for comfort. We'd been searching so long, they'd pretty much given up. But not me. I'd found the place. I'd found hearth. My hearth. At the very center of town stood a municipal building, not exactly an old-fashioned town hall, but it served that purpose. It had a big meeting room, dark now because it lacked windows, but we could get half of the positives in there all at once. It had a combination police and fire station, full of old electronic gear that would never work again, but with walls strong enough to survive anything. It had a little library that was surprisingly fully stocked with books, all of them lined up neatly on metal shelves. And, on its top floor, it had a suite of offices, clearly meant for the people who once ran this town. Offices for people with titles that sounded important, comptrollers and treasurers and school supervisors and, the biggest of all, the mayor. I took that room as my own. I was the mayor of Hearth now, because I said so. I put my things inside, my scant possessions. Then I turned and left the office and found Kylie and Mackie and the rest. This is the place, I told them. Tomorrow, we'll go back and fetch all the positives. This is their new home. Chapter 113 We moved the positives down into Hearth and Waves, because Mackie was worried that somehow a horde of zombies was waiting in the trees, biding their time until there were enough of us to make a decent meal. Zombies don't think that way. They don't think at all. But the fact of it was that the strongest and healthiest of us came first, and we got to work immediately. All day long we hauled fencing around and bolted it to high steel poles, filling in the gaps between houses, bracing the fence with wooden supports. 
We built a big gate where the one road led into town and strung up barbed wire along its top and built sniper nests up there. And in time, eventually, the place was safe. Maybe not as safe as Mackie would like, but it worked for me. The second wave came in, and we started cleaning. It seemed like there wasn't a single house or building in Hearth that nature hadn't invaded. We found whole troops of ants marching in long supply lines across the factory floors. Piles of leaves five feet deep in the basements of houses. The school building was infested with bats in its roof. Thousands of them all sleeping up there in the day, flocking out at night to eat bugs. Maybe we just don't use this building, Luke said. We'll find a way to get rid of them. But not today, Luke suggested. Yeah, I said mentally adding it to my list of things to do. Not today. Some of the buildings were just too far gone, too far along in their decomposition, and we had to pull them down. It was always a moment for excitement and laughing and hooting when a wall came down in a puff of dust and a clattering bang. I hated seeing the houses go. It was like pulling teeth out of a mostly healthy jaw. But I made sure we saved whatever wood and brick and glass we could. In the spring... We could build new houses, new homes. There was so much work I had to spread it around, give people authority over things I wished I could supervise myself. Ike took over the little police and fire station in the municipal building. It was a good place to keep our small arsenal of guns, where they wouldn't be a danger to anybody when they weren't in use. It had a jail cell, too, just a room with a securely locking door, and I knew we would eventually need that. I asked him to be our sheriff, like in an old western, and he agreed. See? I told him when we were alone. You said you wouldn't be here when I found what I was looking for. But here you are. Sure, he told me. It's not like I'm going to set off on foot with winter coming on. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear, but it would do for the moment. Mackie built a kind of firing range and started training more of us how to shoot, he insisted that the snipers' nests be occupied at all times, day or night. I thought that was a waste of manpower, but he couldn't sleep until he knew we were safe. It was one thing when we were on the road, walking, moving around like that. You aren't in one place long enough to get mobbed. This place is a death trap if even a couple of zombies get through the fence. By the time dark fell every night, I was exhausted and ready to collapse into my bed, Still, just a nest of blankets in one corner of the mayor's office. Some nights, I was asleep before Kylie even came in. Some nights, she was there, asleep before me. There was just so much to do, and so few days left before it snowed. Chapter 114 There wasn't enough time, and so much work to do. So many meetings to discuss our plans. Winter came on like the wrath of an angry god. It started snowing in mid-November, and it didn't let up for weeks. The first couple of days, it was actually fun. Snowball fights kept breaking out spontaneously, and eventually I declared that everybody could have a day off so we could have one epic battle in the square in front of the municipal building. I put a whole haunch of smoked pig meat in the lobby and said whoever could get it without getting hit by a snowball could keep it. Soon the building was being stormed from every direction. Kylie and I built a wall for cover and pelted anyone who tried to get close. But Ike beat us all. He climbed up on the municipal building's roof and took us all out with an aerial bombardment. As Kylie and I succumbed, half buried under a constant fusillade from every side, I kissed her cold lips, and she was laughing, laughing even as she flinched and threw her hands up to fend off the incoming missiles. When the snowstorm entered its fifth day, however, spirits began to sag. We ran through our supply of firewood, mostly old, broken furniture, faster than I had thought possible, and that became a new chore we had to complete every day, running out to the woods to gather up whatever had fallen from the trees. Soon... I knew we would have to start chopping them down. That worried me. One of our principal advantages at Hearth was that we were nearly invisible, hidden inside our forest. If we ended up clearing out all those trees, anybody passing by would see us right away. 
It was bad enough we had so many fires going, with plumes of smoke writing our presence across the sky. We made do, as we always had. Most of the positives spent the early winter turning the abandoned houses into homes. In New York, the first generation had all wanted to live on top of one another, filling up just a few dozen blocks of Midtown. The vast majority of the positives were second generation, however, and everybody wanted space of their own. Hearth, at the height of its glory, had a population of more than 3,000, so there were plenty of houses to go around. I stayed in the mayor's office with Kylie. We made a bed of blankets and a little kitchen in the break room down the hall. We might have been more comfortable in an actual house, but I wanted to stay in a central place so everyone would be able to find me easily when problems arose, as they did constantly. As the people were forced to spend most of the short days and long nights indoors, tempers started to flare. Grudges and grievances that had started out on the road but had been put aside in the name of mutual survival suddenly revived and came back stronger than ever. I spent hours each day listening to people tell me how someone else was stealing from them, and then listening to the accused party explain in laborious detail how the stolen property in fact belonged to them. We had fights break out over romantic triangles, and one man beat up another over a woman who seemed disinterested in either of them. People argued over whose turn it was to fetch wood or water or stand guard up in the sniper's nests, where the wind blew right through you. I made sure to take a turn up there myself. I wanted to know just how bad it was. By morning, they nearly had to pry me off the scaffolding, and it was days before I felt warm again. But Mackie was insistent we kept a constant watch at the gate. And in fact, we did get some zombies driven mad and desperate by the snow. So desperate they attacked our fence with their teeth and fingers. We used up some of our small supply of bullets to put them down. Not that they had a chance to get through our wall. It would take a mob of them for that. But I didn't want anyone seeing them out there and getting demoralized. I wondered how long it would be before we looked like a looter camp, with the bones of zombies piled around our gates. That was how it happened, of course, one zombie at a time, wandering right into a sniper's crosshairs. Of course, we had our own homegrown zombies, too. We were positives, and some of us were infected. I had a plan to use the school as a kind of quarantine facility, and it worked, sort of. It relied on people to identify themselves when they started having headaches. For every one of us who voluntarily went into the school, there was one who was afraid to admit what was happening. More than one morning I woke up to screaming as we discovered an entire house of people had been attacked by one of their number who had zombied out in the night. We handled that as we had out on the road, by following our new laws. Zombies were less distressing, however, than the fact that some of our buildings fell apart without warning. The snow piled up on rooftops until it collapsed some of the weaker structures. I had to detail teams to go up on top of every building and shovel it off. A new accumulation gathered within days. Our biggest problem, as it had always been, was food. We had collected as many old cans and as much smoked pig meat as we could over the autumn. We'd known this was coming. Yet by early January, it was clear we wouldn't have enough to get through the winter. We could ration it, cut back drastically on how much we ate per day, but it still wouldn't be enough. Panic started to move through the people like a phantasm whispering in their ears. Hungry people got stupid, and they did stupid things. The little jail cell in Ike's police station turned out to be useful not for holding criminals, but as a place to keep the dwindling food stocks. Otherwise, they were at risk from constant pilferage. I don't understand this level of craziness, I told Luke one day as we shared a single ration between us, as we had so many times in the camp. People should be used to going hungry by now. None of us has had enough to eat since we got our tattoos. Ah, he said, but there's the funny thing about human nature. We did. We had enough to eat when we first arrived here. People can go without forever if they need to, but once they have a taste of something, they can never get enough again. I thought about it for a while. The pigs must still be out there in the forest, 
Some of them, anyway. We can send out hunting parties. You're going to make people go out in the freezing snow and probably get frostbite and have their feet cut off because there might be game? I sighed and glanced at the pitiful remains of our food supply locked up like a felon. That's the thing. In a couple of weeks, I won't have to make people. They'll volunteer to do it. Chapter 115 One day we went to the food stores, and there wasn't enough to feed everyone in town. The next day, there was nothing left at all. We chewed on tree bark or sucked on stones to try to fool our bellies. We slept as many hours of the day as we could so we could ignore the way they rumbled. Nothing really worked, but you had to keep trying. The worst thing about hunger is that it makes you like a zombie. You stop thinking. At first, you just get distracted. Your brain stops working for a few seconds, then a few minutes at a time. That's a bad phase, because distracted people can get killed very easily. But it's not as bad as the next phase, when you start thinking more vividly than ever. But all you can think about is food. You start thinking, there has to be some somewhere. You just know you left a piece of pig jerky in a desk drawer somewhere, or maybe hidden under a blanket. You go and look, and it's gone. You start thinking it must be somewhere else. You can tell yourself all you want, there is no pig jerky, that you're fooling yourself. But then you start thinking somebody took it, that somebody stole your food, and that's why you're so hungry. I had to make a new law. As people started to succumb to hunger, as the dead piled up outside where they would freeze until the ground was soft enough to bury them, I had to make a law against cannibalism. The punishment was exile the worst punishment we had. I don't know if the law was generally obeyed or not. My lieutenants and I were too weak to go house to house enforcing it. Soon enough, I had my volunteer hunting parties. They wrapped their feet up as best they could. They took guns and wooden bows and arrows and sometimes just knives, and they marched off into the forest. Sometimes they didn't come back. The ones that did didn't bring back any pigs. If they found any, they ate them out in the woods so they wouldn't have to share. In my hunger, I thought that had to be the case, that they were cheating us. Later on, I would realize there probably just weren't any pigs to be found. The hunters did spot something, though. They were the first ones to see the helicopters. Just one at a time at first. Small spotter craft with just one rotor and room for two people up front. They moved fast and never stayed overhead for long. Within a week, they were followed by bigger aircraft, twin rotored attack ships and troop transports. When they came close enough, I was told you could see the guns bristling from their sides. I was terrified that they were coming for us, that the army had finally sent a force to round us up, but as the reports kept coming in, it was clear there were far too many of them for that. Sometimes a hundred would go by in a single day. They never came directly overhead of hearth. I thought about hiding from them anyway. I knew they could see for miles with their onboard sensors, both optical and infrared, and that if we could see them, they could definitely see us. But to camouflage our presence would mean telling people they couldn't light fires. The main thing giving us away was our smoke. And if we couldn't have fires, we would freeze. So I could only hope they would ignore us, pass us by on their way to their destination, whatever it might be. Chapter 116 I tried everything I could think of to find food. I tried boiling pine cones and washing acorns until they were edible, even though the books in the library said this was a waste of time. It took more energy to make them edible than they gave back. I tried rendering down leather from the chairs in the conference room in the municipal building. I tried digging for roots in the frozen ground. The people of Hearth watched me with little more than scorn. Those few who were willing to help me grew quickly distracted and wandered off. If they'd had the strength left, I think they would have killed me and replaced me with somebody, anybody, who promised to find food anybody who would lie to them. 
They didn't dare threaten me to my face, but someone did spit on Kylie as she passed by. She refused to tell me who it had been, since she knew the last thing we needed was for me to beat up one of my citizens for revenge. Mostly they stayed indoors and tried not to think about how long it would take to die of starvation. As usual, I was too stupid to give up and die. The thought occurred to me that there must be fish in the stream, and that since it had frozen solid, some fish must be trapped in the ice. So one morning, while it was still dark, it seemed always to be dark in that long winter when it wouldn't stop snowing, I got an axe and an awl and various other sharp tools, and I headed out to where the stream was widest, just outside of the town. I took a pistol with me in case any zombies showed up, though at that point they would have frozen stiff. Zombies aren't smart enough to put on winter clothes. Some of them aren't even smart enough to hide in caves or animal dens and wait out the cold. The snow was three feet deep by then. I couldn't walk through it so much as push through, digging a path with my body. Weak as I was, each step was a nightmarish effort, and I was sweating under my layers of clothes before I'd even cleared the gate. I knew that sweat would freeze, and I'd probably end up with frostbite, but I'd reached the point where food was more important than keeping all my toes. Out at the creek, I stopped and just breathed heavily for a while. I started gathering deadfall for a fire, though I wasn't sure where I would put it. I would need to dig out a sizable pit, or it would just drown itself in snowmelt. I set down my pile of sticks and just stared at them for a while. I remember the snow was an incredible blue in the pre-dawn light a blue that sort of buzzed in my head. Maybe I was just hallucinating from malnutrition and exhaustion. I know I wasn't paying attention to anything around me. A zombie could have walked up right then and started chewing on my arm and I wouldn't have noticed. Luckily for me, it wasn't zombies that found me. I reached down and picked up my axe, intending to chop some ice. The fire was forgotten. Before I could lift the axe, though, a sharp voice barked an order at me. What? I asked, standing up straight. I said, put down the weapon or we will fire. That penetrated the thick fuzz in my head. I looked up, startled, and saw that I was surrounded by soldiers who seemed to float in the air around me. They were wearing snowshoes, and they were on top of the snowpack while I was hip deep in it, essentially standing in a hole. The soldiers were dressed for winter fighting. They had on white jackets over their uniforms. Their eyes were hidden by night vision goggles, all except their commander, who wore a flat cap with birds on it, just like the officer I'd seen at the medical camp. He must be the same rank. I dropped my axe. Slowly I lifted my arms, my bare hands above my head, even though I hadn't been told to do so. What's the name of this town? the officer asked. It doesn't appear on my charts. What is it? A new looter camp? My tongue felt frozen. Hearth, I managed to say. What's that? Speak up, kid. It's called Hearth. It's not a looter camp. The officer nodded. He gestured at his soldiers, and they moved in closer, forming a tight ring around me, as if I might try to run away. Not that I could possibly get far, pushing my way through the snow. They marched me back into town, shuffling along on their snowshoes to keep pace with my trudging. There was no one in the sniper's nests at the gate. There hadn't been in a long time. I led them up to the municipal building and inside, where it was at least a little warmer. Kylie was there, waiting for me to return. When she saw the soldiers, her eyes went very wide. Uh, hello she said as the soldiers spread out to cover the entrance hall. Others went deeper into the building, their rifles up and ready to shoot anyone who gave them any trouble. I, uh, welcome to Hearth, Kylie said. I'm afraid we don't have much to offer except water, but it's clean. You in charge here, ma'am? the officer asked. Well, no, that's, that's Finnegan. I nodded. I was still waiting for my tongue to thaw out. The officer gave me an appraising glance. He didn't seem to like what he saw. I'm Colonel Parkhurst. 
I'm here to recruit new soldiers, that's all. If you have anyone hiding nearby looking to shoot us, I'd advise you to tell them to stand down. No, nobody, nothing like that, I stammered out. The colonel was the first new person I'd seen since coming to Hearth. I barely knew how to react to him. I was glad to know he wasn't here to round us all up and take us back to Ohio, but beyond that I was pretty terrified. Recruiting? You're looking for soldiers? We need every man who can stand up and carry a rifle. He looked me over again. You look like you're about to fall over. It's been a long winter, I said. That must explain why your secretary looks like she's made out of a bag of sticks, he said. I could tell he'd already judged me and decided I wasn't a threat. I was happy to maintain that analysis. She's not my... Oh, never mind, I said. I'm afraid you won't find many volunteers here, Colonel. I didn't say I was looking for volunteers, he told me. He looked around at the varnished wood of the entry hall. Why isn't this place on my chart? We're new, I said. We just got here at the beginning of the winter. He stared at me as if I'd said we flew to Hearth on a magic carpet. You built all this? The town was already here. We made it defensible. Set up homes. We've got big plans for this place. They'll have to wait. Hold on. You started up a new town? All the way out here? I didn't hear about any reclamation efforts this far west. What unit cleared this place out for you? I don't know what you mean. The army didn't set you up here? The colonel asked. My silence was enough of an answer. Jesus Christ, son. You're rebuilding? In the middle of a crisis? On your own nickel? You must have some stones on you. So I've been told, I said. Man alive. That's something. That's really something. The colonel favored me with a smile. Maybe we are having an effect after all. You spend your whole career thinking you're just sitting on the lid of the garbage can. But if puny little folk like you can start to rebuild with nothing but spit and gumption, well, hell, that's encouraging. It's a shame you won't have a chance to keep it going. See how it all turns out. What? What are you saying? I demanded. Sit down already, son. If you pass out on me, I'll have to find somebody else to make my speech to. I'm going to take every mail you've got, including yourself. The army needs you. Your government needs you. There's a war out west, a particularly nasty tin god out there who needs killing. And we've passed the point where we can be choosy about who we take. I was starting to overheat, so I removed my coat and my top shirt. No one shot me, so I guess they knew somehow I wasn't reaching for a concealed weapon. You're talking about Anubis? I asked. The skeleton cult? You'll be briefed later. But yes, the colonel said. You're going to help save civilization, son. That's something to be proud of. I unwrapped the cloths I'd wound around my hands in lieu of proper gloves and dropped them by the side of my chair. I've already got something to be proud of, I told him. This town. I left out the fact that it would probably disappear before the snow melted, that we would all be dead, that didn't matter right then. I'm sorry, Colonel, but I can't let you take my people away. Even if most of them would probably jump at the chance. The army had food, after all. This place is too important. To me, to Kylie, to all of us. We can't just let you... There's no letting me take your people, son. Anyone who refuses to serve is going to get shot. Are you really going to be a problem for me? And that could have been it. That could have been the end of Hearth, there and then, if I hadn't taken the wrappings off my hands. I've got the authority of Washington, D.C. on my side, boy, the colonel pronounced, standing up a little straighter, looking at me down the side of his nose. I have legal sanction to shoot deserters, and as of now... Sir, one of the soldiers said. Begging your pardon, sir? The colonel stared at the soldier, then he raised one eyebrow. His hand, sir. His left hand. I looked down and saw my plus sign tattoo. The colonel took a step back, away from me. It was enough to make me smile. This? I asked, and lifted it to show them. 
I'm a positive. So is Kylie, and everyone in this town. That's why we had to come and make our own place. Nobody wanted us. Not the places we came from. Not your government. It was the colonel's turn to trip over his words. Positives. A uh, town of positives. If I'd just announced I was suffering from the bubonic plague, he couldn't have looked more frightened. He was one of the first generation, after all. What to me had become a sign of honor, the tattoo on my hand, was for him the mark of utter and imminent death. Yes, I said. I'm sorry, but do you have any food with you? Chapter 117 Colonel Parkhurst tried very hard not to show it, but I could see how uncomfortable we made him. I think he expected the lot of us to zombie out on the spot, to rush his men in one big wave of red-eyed madness. When we didn't, he relaxed a bit, but only a bit. Enough to show pity on us, anyway. We must have looked so emaciated, they couldn't believe we were still alive. The colonel's men came among us and handed out the MREs they'd brought with them. There weren't enough to go around, of course. He only had thirty men with him, and they'd only brought enough food for themselves for a few days. Still, hungry as we were, even a scant mouthful of reconstituted pasta or a spoon of beef gravy was enough to revive us a little. He'd brought other things, too, other gifts I didn't care so much about. A few old guns that they didn't need anymore. A hand-cranked two-way radio that would have been nice if I knew anybody else who had one, anyone I could talk to. You're all positives. This, uh, changes things, of course, the colonel said. Of course, I said. You can't have positives in your ranks. It's regulations, you see. The men have to be kept safe. I understand, I told him. I was just glad he wasn't going to scoop up half my population and send them off to die in a battle somewhere out west. It's a shame, too. We really do need everyone we can get. He leaned in close, as close as he dared, and whispered it. This maniac we're fighting, he's just not like anything we've seen before. Anubis took Chicago last year, turned a whole city against us. They handed over all their weapons and half their population for his armies made a deal with him. They would help him knock over Indianapolis, and he would let the rest of them live. My blood chilled a little when I thought of what I'd seen. The fountains full of burned skeletons. The city wall blown open like it was made of tinfoil. Still, nothing to worry you, son, Parkhurst said. He visibly straightened himself up in his chair, recovering some of his lost composure. We're massing troops in Denver even now, and by summer... We'll drive up into Montana, hit him where he lives. We'll have him march down New Pennsylvania Avenue in chains before you know it. I have to tell you, it does my heart some good. You're too young to remember what war was like before the crisis, but this is real blood and thunder stuff. Roman Empire reborn. The light in his eyes was alarming, but only because I'd seen it before. I'd seen it in Ike's eyes when he looked on what had been done to Indianapolis. I'd seen it in Red Kate's eyes most of the time. A certain kind of mad joy, a desperate need to live in a world on fire, a realization, never to be spoken aloud, that the end of the world was a glorious thing, a chance to live life as grand, heartbreaking, show-stopping theater. It was exactly what I'd built Harf to contradict. I was not sad when he announced he had to be going, just as he was happy to get away from the town full of zombies in training. He left us with a promise to return if he could, to bring us supplies and support and communications from Washington, to make us, as he put it, a real town, which apparently meant getting our name on his maps and the right to vote in meaningless congressional elections. I held out my hand and wished him well. He stared at my outstretched hand for a very long time before he shook it. Before he'd even let go, we both looked up because we'd heard a clattering in the hallway. Some of the soldiers reached for their weapons, but before they could raise them, 
Ike had come staggering into the room. He looked bad. He was pale and thin, and I could see by the way he swayed back and forth that he was dizzy with malnutrition. But he found the strength to stand up straight and tall and raise one hand to his brow in a proper salute. Colonel, sir, begging your pardon, he said. Colonel Parkhurst returned the salute. Go ahead and speak, son. You don't need to call me sir, either. Ike shook his head. If you'll pardon me, sir, I do. I was a private first class in the army a while back. Never officially discharged. I was cut off from my unit and fell in with this bunch. But I'd like to return to duty, sir, if I may. I stared at Ike, dumbfounded. I'd never heard him talk like that before. Never seen him act like a real soldier. I also couldn't believe what was happening. Even though he'd warned me the time would come. He was leaving us. A rat jumping off a sinking ship. The colonel made a big deal of checking Ike's left hand. There was no tattoo on it, of course. Ike had never been a positive. He was almost certainly an infected, considering how much of my mom's blood he'd gotten on himself. I could have said as much right then and there, and I'm sure Colonel Parkhurst would have had Ike shot on the spot. Or I could have claimed Ike was a positive who just never got a tattoo. Then, at least, he would have been forced to stay in hearth with me. I met Ike's eye for just a second, just long enough to see the look there. He looked sorry, very, very sorry. But his mind was made up. If I didn't let him go, I think he would have run away the next chance he got. He'd never understood my dream for Hearth. He'd never shared it. He'd stuck around only because he was my friend. And now something better had come along. So I let him go. He flew away with the colonel in a big troop transport. Just one more helicopter heading to the front. I had no idea what was happening out in Denver, out where the army was fighting Anubis, where Ike had gone. We saw fewer and fewer helicopters pass overhead as winter went on. That was all I knew. By the time spring came, we saw none at all. Chapter 118 I made a mark on my office wall for every day that passed, trying to keep a calendar so I would know how long the winter had to go. The snow kept falling all through February. March came, as best I could count the days, but with no relief in sight, the wind kept howling down from the north, from that far-off polar land called Canada that I saw on all my maps. The lack of food claimed many of us, and then disease swept through hearth and took many more. By the time the snow started to thaw, out of the original five hundred of us, no more than three hundred remained, and many of those were at death's door. We'd all lost so much weight, we looked like something the skeleton cult would worship. Kylie's spine looked like a snowy mountain range when I saw her dress in the morning. My muscles withered until it was all I could do to break through the ice on the stream when it was my turn to fetch water. Even when the snow did begin to recede, when the longer days brought breezes that didn't cut to the bone, it was like a cruel joke. So the grass showed up again, yellow and furrowed like an unmade bed. Still, there was no game. Tiny flowers appeared among the bases of the trees, but you couldn't eat flowers. I went whole days without seeing another human being other than Kylie, without speaking even to her. When I did encounter my people carrying water or gathering firewood, they wouldn't meet my eye. They'd given up hope. They'd even given up on being angry at me. They were just waiting to die. This, this futility, this waiting, it was what I'd turned my back on. The idea, so prevalent among the first generation, that the world was done with humanity, and we were just holding on by our fingernails before the inevitable, all-too-welcome plummet into the abyss haunted me. I'd wanted to make a promise, a vow, to live, to really live, and I'd brought us all to the brink of death. Even Kylie had stopped believing. One good thing about starving to death, she said one night, her voice as flat as it had been when I met her. 
I don't get my period anymore. My body doesn't have enough blood left to spare. I tried to join in, to make a joke of it based on something I'd read in the township library. Just before the crisis, there was an obesity epidemic, I said. They were all so worried about being too fat, about ruining their health because they couldn't stop eating. The old magazines are full of stories about it. So the zombie apocalypse was just a fad diet, she asked. I started to laugh, but she stopped me. Finn, don't bury me here, she said. I, what? Her face was scrunched up with apology and guilt and sorrow and worry. She looked nothing at all now like the girl who had taught me how to loot houses back in New Jersey. She looked more like a ghost, pale and insubstantial her eyes bloodshot and furtive. I don't want to go to sleep where I was hungry and scared. Take me back to the road, to the place we made love the first time. That's where I was happy, for a while. I couldn't speak. I couldn't handle the thought of her dying at all. I couldn't stop thinking about my hands sinking into the hard, frozen ground my nails scratching away at the dirt to dig her grave. I couldn't stop seeing the first handful of black earth scattered across her closed eyes, her scarred face. In the morning, I went back to the forest to get wood, to make a fire for her. I smashed the ice on the stream, so thin and brittle now, and brought water back so she would not be thirsty. It took me most of the day. The next morning, I went back and did it again, too stupid to give up. And the next. There came a day when the stream had no ice, even at its edges, no snow on the ground around me. I stared down into the clear running water and saw a death's head staring back, a gaunt, hollow face, my face, eyes the color of old, faded newsprint, dark shadows underneath, and another face, too. A face with tusks and bristles and a snout. I startled, jumping back, looking up, just in time to see the wild pig, the pig that had come down to the water to drink, running off into a stand of new undergrowth. The pigs were back. Chapter 119 The positives came out of the houses one or two at a time drifting out like ghosts. None of them could seem to figure out what to do with their hands. Their clothes hung on them like shrouds. Their hair was lank and long, as if they had all zombied out during the winter, changed into something horrible. But their eyes weren't red. And when they smelled the smoke, they began to smile and shout and run. Before dawn, I'd taken a hunting party out into the woods with the best weapons we had, we had expected to find one or two pigs that would run as soon as they saw us, run so fast we couldn't catch them. We found a herd, hundreds of them, maybe thousands. I think they had migrated south for the winter, headed for places the snow couldn't reach, where the plants hadn't died off. I could only imagine such balmy and pleasant lands. Maybe the pigs had eaten everything down there, leaving the ground stripped and bare. Maybe they had come back north just to mate. It didn't matter. They filled clearings in the forest. They stood out on yellow ground beyond the farthest trees. More of them than I could count. We took as many as we could carry. Enough meat for twice the population of Hearth. We bled them and gutted them, cut off their heads and their hooves. It was nasty, messy, smelly work, and we laughed like demons as we carved into their bodies. When you're that hungry, butchery is nothing. It's fun. Covered in blood, stinking of shit, we brought the carcasses home. What turns my stomach to think of now was, at the time, the grandest thing in the world. We dug fire pits in ground that wasn't frozen over anymore. We burned wood until we had hot coals, and we roasted all that pig until the smell made the entire town crazy. Some of them grabbed at the pigs on the spits, tore at the flesh before it was even fully cooked. Some people sat and waited, forks in their hands, plates on their laps, their knees bouncing up and down in anticipation. 
We ate so much we got sick. We ate so much we rolled on the ground in pain, but with smiles on our faces. We laughed and made jokes and rubbed our swollen bellies. Some of us danced and sang and clapped to keep time. And then we ate some more. Spring had come, and winter was over, and it was good. Chapter 120 With spring in the air, the real work of Hearth could start again. We had survived, more than half of us, the greatest test we thought we would ever face, and we approached the new year with surprising optimism and joy, considering all the death and privation we'd just escaped. Maybe because of it. There is a point where tragedy becomes inspiration. I had read in the library of the Black Death of Europe, and how when it finally ended, a continent-wide party had broken out that lasted for years. Hearth went through much the same transformation on a much smaller scale. With our bellies full, our thoughts turned to other pleasures. There were new romantic rendezvous being whispered and giggled about every night, and more than one fight broke out over who was with whom. We sang and told stories around a bonfire almost every night, and Kylie even organized a dance by torchlight. She had found a book on dancing and taught us all new steps. Even the clumsiest among us took a turn, with much laughter and clapping of hands. We ate well, gorging ourselves until we started to look like humans again, and less like skeletons. Our cooks had built a still, which I pretended not to know about, and jars of moonshine started showing up everywhere. Which is not to say we weren't industrious. We worked hard through the last weeks of March and all of April. There was plenty to do. The winter had claimed a couple of houses. The roofs collapsed under all that snow. Dozens of us came together to repair them, to put the houses back in order. The fence was sagging at one point, and Mackie was certain that zombies would show up any day now that the world had thawed out, so we labored tirelessly at shoring up our defenses. We built new furniture and tools for tending the few crops we managed to plant, drying racks for cured meat, window shutters to replace broken panes of glass. There were plenty of woodworking tools left in hearth, good pre-crisis stuff that never wore out or broke and we made good use of it. One man named Grumman even started turning out little sculptures in his spare time. Carved pigs and bears and even miniature zombies that were surprisingly lifelike, and these started showing up in every house as decoration. We had very few seeds left. Most of them had been eaten during the winter. But what we did have, we planted and tended more lovingly and with greater attention than I imagine food crops have ever been shown before. Soon, we had squash plants sprouting from the earth, and the start of tomato vines and tiny saplings that would one day become fruit trees. We desperately needed to vary the crops and improve our diet. I knew from my reading what would happen if we tried to subsist on pig meat alone and I sent out parties to scour the forest, looking for edible plants of any kind. I suffered and fretted constantly over where we could find the seeds to start growing some kind of grain, and beets for sugar, and even fiber plants like flax or cotton, so we could eventually make our own clothes. There was a week when I was obsessed with bees, reading all I could on apiculture and how to build hives and how to catch queens, though we never did find any. Bees would have given us not just honey, but wax for candles and for waterproofing rain jackets. We would have them someday, I was sure. It was Luke, though, who had the brilliant idea to catch some pigs and put them in a corral inside our fence. If we could breed them and raise them inside town, we wouldn't have to spend so much time hunting. Catching them turned out to be a dangerous and, I'll admit it, hilarious proposition as we raced around them, waving our arms and spooking them into running between hastily erected fences. Far more of them got away than we caught, but eventually we had a small herd. Luke forbade anyone from slaughtering his new pets. He wanted to see if he could domesticate them. Little by little, Hearth stopped being a place we'd found and taken over, and became more and more a place we built with our own hands. We started putting up small sheds in the undeveloped lots, 
places to store tools, smokehouses, woodsheds to keep our firewood dry in the rain. We built a lot of outhouses that spring to replace the open pit latrines we'd been using. We made changes to the existing buildings as well, putting up veneers over rotten siding, cutting rough shingles to replace the broken and weather-worn roofing we'd inherited. We even made paint by grinding up rocks from the stream and mixing the resulting powder with pig blood so we could cover up the peeling walls of our houses. The work and the plentiful meat put muscles on all of us. We worked all day, and when night came, we fell readily into our beds. Kylie and I barely had time for each other, with all our responsibilities, but we found a few minutes every day to talk or just hold hands or lie in each other's arms as we lingered in bed before getting up in the morning. My love for her grew with every day that passed. So, too, did her belly grow. It didn't show for a long time, as she put back on the weight she'd lost over the winter. It was hard to imagine any of us getting fat. We were working too hard, but she developed a cute little pot belly that I loved to kiss. Then she mentioned that she still wasn't getting her period, though every other woman she talked to in town had started menstruating again. When she started throwing up all the time, I think we both knew, but neither of us would say a thing. Then, one night in late May, as we lay in bed, I reached down and put my hand on her stomach. I expected her to push it away. She'd started to get self-conscious about how big it was. Instead, she put her hand over mine, our fingers meshing together. She closed her eyes and started to cry, and I kissed away her tears. And that was when I felt it. Something moving inside her. A tiny foot kicking in dreams. A new life. A new citizen for Hearth. Chapter 121 The summer came. It seemed to fly by. There was never enough time to do everything I wanted to do, everything we needed to do. I was determined not to be caught short again when winter returned, to have enough food put away that we wouldn't suffer like that ever again. So I pushed people. They started to grumble that maybe it was time to just relax, to enjoy the fruits of their labors. So I announced that we would have an election, that anyone who wanted to could run against me and be the one who said when we worked and when we rested. A couple of people did throw their hats in the ring, as the saying goes. None of them got more than a handful of votes. I'd freed my people and brought them here. I'd kept them alive. A lot of people thought I'd made the right decisions. Suddenly... I was officially the mayor of Hearth. Mayor, I said to Kylie that night. They love you. You saved them. You saved us, she said, putting her hands on my shoulders. Real towns have mayors, I said. This is a real town now. You've earned this, she said. And then she started to undress me. We found plenty of time for each other that night. I had announced that the next day would be a day of rest, a celebration of our first election. Just about everybody slept in that morning, including me. When I did wake up, I lay in my blankets for a long time, stretching, staring at the ceiling with a big smile on my face. Kylie was up and about. I could hear water boiling in a pot nearby, but I let myself be lazy, just for a little while. Eventually, I figured I should get up and see what Kylie was doing. I dressed and stepped out of the office and found her making soup. I've been reading about canning, she said. What's that? It's how you get canned goods, obviously, she said with a mocking look. You put food in the cans, seal them up, and boil the cans. That kills any germs inside. And there's no way for new germs to get in, so the food never goes bad. Really? For all the cans I'd opened in my life, it had never occurred to me to wonder why the food inside wasn't rotten after twenty years. I'd always assumed it was just some pre-crisis miracle technology. This sounded too simple. I'm going to need cans, of course, she told me. We can reuse old ones if they're clean, but we'll need to find a way to make new lids. She shook her head. I'm still figuring some of this out. I nodded, though. It sounded like a worthwhile project. If we could can our own food, winter would never be a time of starvation again. Make a list of all the things you need. 
There might be some useful stuff in the hardware store, she suggested. I smiled. This was supposed to be our day of rest, but of course, the two of us could barely sit still these days, not when so much work needed to be done. I kissed her, then headed out of the municipal building and into the center of town. A big group of people were there, kicking a ball around a patch of grass, having fun. I stopped to watch for a minute. It was just so good to watch my people enjoying themselves. I was there when I heard an old, familiar, totally unwelcome sound. A mechanical roar. The noise that engines make. Motorcycle engines. Everyone fell quiet. Everyone heard it. Everyone looked over toward our gates, toward where the road entered hearth. We saw dust moving there, a pale cloud gathering as something disturbed the road surface. Then one by one, the motorcycles emerged from that cloud, twenty of them. The riders wore leather jackets and pants painted with white bones, as if to show where their skeletons were. Their helmets had dark visors so we couldn't see their faces. The stalkers had come. Chapter 122 They stopped immediately outside our gates, turned off their machines, and lowered their kickstands. For a while, they just sat there astride their bikes, not moving. I headed over to the gates, putting myself between the stalkers and my people. A crowd followed behind me, pressing up close but never stepping in front of me. Eventually, one of the riders climbed off his bike. He removed his helmet, making a big show of it as he unstrapped it and lifted it away from his long blonde hair, which he shook out with a flip of his chin. He looked me right in the eye and smiled. Hello, he said. I nodded back. I'm Costa, he said. Is this hearth? It is. Costa's smile grew broader. Oh, good. You're not on the maps, you know. It took us forever to find this place. Do you think we could come in? No, I said. You're not welcome here. I know who you are. That's funny, since we've never met. Can I ask your name? Finnegan. Finnegan, Costa said, as if he was tasting my name, licking at it to see how it felt in his mouth. Listen, Finnegan. You say you know who I am. I think what you meant to say was that you know what I am. And you're right. I'm a stalker. A herald of the church. In this case, it was Michigan Mike who sent me. You know that name, I imagine. I've heard of it, I admitted. Good, good. Costa looked like he'd just seen a trained seal balance a fish on the end of its nose. I half expected him to clap in approval. Well, he asked me to come here specifically. Most of the time, we stalkers just ride around where the road takes us, looking to see what we can find. But this time, Michigan Mike gave us specific orders, the kind you don't disobey. So I'm going to have to come in, one way or another. He shrugged apologetically. Are we really at an impasse? I racked my brain, trying to think of what to do. The stalkers were all armed. In fact, they were carrying the same kind of assault rifles as Colonel Parkhurst's men, as the soldiers in the medical camp in Ohio. Government issue. I knew what those rifles could do to a crowd of people. The stalkers could just shoot through the fence and kill half of Hearth before they ran out of bullets. If I let them in, though, I knew what they'd come for. I knew that they would try to make a deal with us bring us into their cult, their church, and thereby earn their protection. And I knew what that protection would cost. As long as Costa kept talking, though, he wasn't shooting. Open the gates, I called out. Behind me, I could feel my people holding their collective breath. I was their mayor. This was my responsibility. I had to do what it took to keep Hearth alive. Whatever it took. Chapter 123 The stalkers wheeled their bikes inside the fence and took up strategic positions in the main square. One of them kicked the ball out of the way. 
There was no opportunity for me to signal Mackie or call for everyone to grab their weapons. If I did so, Costa would order his men to start firing long before any of us had our guns. Everybody go home, I shouted, but the people of Hearth were slow to respond, only a few moving toward the houses. Up on the top of the gate in the sniper's nests, the sharpshooters on watch hunkered down, keeping themselves out of sight as best as possible. That was something. Costa took my arm and steered me toward the municipal building. As we neared the doors, he spoke to me in a low, soft voice that maybe he thought was soothing. It wasn't. I've done this before, Costa said. I know what you're feeling right now. You do? I asked him. You need to assert your authority. You got where you are by keeping these people in line, and now that I'm here, your position is threatened. I'm making you look weak. Sadly, that's unavoidable, especially when I'm really here to strengthen you. By forcing my people to worship your god. Costa made a face like he'd just bit into an onion. Oh, we're off to such a bad start already. I don't like to argue theology on these initial visits, but let's make one thing clear. Death is not a god. It's an impersonal force of the universe. An abstraction for a philosophy more than anything. Shall we go inside? We'd reached the door of the municipal building. Inside was the home I shared with Kylie. No, I said. No, we'll talk out here. Why not? It's a pleasant day, Costa told me with a thin smile. He sat down on the steps in front of the door and patted the concrete next to him. I sat down. My job is never easy, he said. I didn't take to this line of work because I wanted a cushy position. I did it because I believe it's important. I make people's lives better. That's my reward. You make people sacrifice one another, or you kill them. In the name of the greater good, yes. He leaned back on his elbows. For a long while, he said nothing. He just looked out at the crowd that still milled around the square watching them, smiling at them. Michigan Mike, he said finally, wanted me to let you know something. He's proud of you. You've achieved a great deal all on your own. This place, Hearth, it's impressive, considering what you had to work with. We're proud of what we've made, what's ours. The Christians say that pride is a sin, Costa told me. You're no Christian. No, Costa laughed at the thought, which is why I think pride is a good thing. A man should take pride in his work. It spurs him on to do more. You could do more, Finnegan. You could do so much more. Michigan Mike wants to help you with that. You think I've come here to convert you. You're wrong. Oh, I raised an eyebrow. I was certain I knew how this was supposed to work like the people at the farmhouse, like the people in all the little towns we'd seen along the way, like the people of Chicago and Indianapolis. We were supposed to be given a choice. Convert to the skeleton cult's dark religion or become sacrifices in its name. If the cult had something else in mind for us, though. No one expects you to actually become a devout little member of the church. The church doesn't ask anyone to be faithful, just obedient. I think if you spend a little time thinking about things, you'll come around to my point of view. But if you spend the rest of your life thinking we're a bunch of lunatics worshipping a false idol, well, that's your loss, not ours. I'm glad to hear it, I said. Costa slapped me on the shoulder. You're not going to give me an inch, are you? You're going to play this tough guy act for all it's worth. All right. Then let's talk business, not religion. Michigan Mike is now the Grand Master of four states. Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. He's the most important man in the church short of Anubis himself. A man like that has a lot of problems. I'm sure you can understand that, Finnegan. I'm sure you have problems of your own. When he heard about Hearth, his first thought, of course, was to crush you. Get rid of a potential threat. But he's a wise man, Mike. He thinks everything through twice. That's how he got to such an exalted state. He started to think maybe a live ally is better than a dead enemy. Isn't that wise? I didn't answer. 
Costa didn't seem to mind. One of those problems he has is all the positives he has under his control. Now, the church is a very inclusive institution. We take anyone who comes before us with humility and an honest heart. But there are some prejudices in this world that even the church can't overcome. The people under our protection, the people of Chicago and Milwaukee especially, don't want positives living among them. They're too scared of what could happen. Now, Mike can't just send his positives to the camps in Ohio or California. Those are run by the government, and Washington doesn't have much use for religious folk these days. So Mike needs some place to send his positives. Some place where he knows they'll be taken care of. Out of sight, out of mind. You, of course, offer the perfect solution to this little problem. You want me to take all your positives? I considered it. That was what Hearth was for, after all. To take all those unwanted people and give them a home. More people meant more hands to share the work, too. Normally, I would be happy to have our community grow. Of course, this meant accepting hundreds, maybe thousands of positives who were already devotees of the skeleton cult. People who worshipped death. They would outnumber us. Those of us who had escaped the medical camp. In the next election, they could just take over the town. Still, I'd built Hearth on a principle that positives should be allowed to live decent lives. Saying I take them, I asked. What's in it for me? We leave you alone. You can continue your little social experiment here in total peace. I turned to actually look at him for once. Wait. You're saying that if we accept your positives, you won't bother us at all? You won't come around demanding sacrifices or tribute or anything? That's what being obedient gets you, Finnegan. That's why we're the fastest growing church in America. You get your reward in the here and now, not in some fanciful afterlife. Freedom from persecution hardly seemed like a reward. To me, it felt more like a basic right. But the offer was surprisingly tempting. Admittedly, it meant making friends with butchers, with people capable of slaughtering entire cities. But it meant Hearth wouldn't end up like Indianapolis. I closed my eyes. I tried to think about what he was offering. I thought about what it would cost me if I said no. I thought of whether I'd be able to sleep at night if I said yes. The thing is, when you lead people, when they count on you, it's not your own values you have to worry about. It's not what you can live with. It's what your people need, what they can put up with. Well, I said, that sounds pretty good. Costa jumped up and lifted his hands in the air. This is what I love, dealing with rational people. You don't know what a good decision you've made. All right, all right. I imagine you'll want to get going then. No point sticking around here. Sure, sure, Costa said. I'll get my people moving, just as soon as we're finished with one last thing. My blood went cold. We're going to need a show of obedience, of course. There are rules about these things. You don't have to worship death. You don't even have to respect the church. But you do have to play by our rules if you're going to live in our state. What are you talking about? I asked, though I was pretty sure I knew. Normally, when I come to a town like this, I ask for a decimation. Do you know what that word means? A lot of people don't. It means a sacrifice of one in ten. A tithe of your population. But that seems excessive since we've gotten along so well. What do you say we just take ten? I could only stare at him. Ten of my people? As a sacrifice? There is a point to all this, you know. Michigan Mike needs a reason to trust you. He needs to know you're one of us. So I'm going to let you pick the ten. And I'm going to have you do the culling. Chapter 124 Me? I said in a very small voice. Yes, Costa replied. He put an arm around my shoulders. I know it's going to be hard, but think of it this way. There are, what, 300 people here? Ten of them die and 290 of them live. Come on, 
Let's go tell them how it's going to be. They deserve to know. Maybe some of them will volunteer. We always like it better when the sacrifices are volunteers. Death likes it better that way. I turned to stare at him. What did he really believe? Did he truly think there was some great record book somewhere? A list of names of the dead? A balance sheet where when one name was crossed off, another was permitted to remain? I could accept it when we were in the camp, when death was always on top of us. I could accept that desperate people would become so warped in their minds that they would truly believe you could make a bargain like that. But this was no desperate man. He looked well-fed. He looked healthy, and other than a thin layer of road dust, his clothes were clean. He had power, and yet, did he really still believe it? You can't ask a question like that and think you can trust the answer. So instead, I asked, tell me something. Tell me why. Costa grinned at me, but his eyes were narrowed. Why what? Why do all those people have to die? I shook my head. Not just the ten here, all of them. All those sacrifices your god demands. Death is not a god. It's an impersonal force, Costa said. We give it a shape, a face, as a way to help explain Anubis's teachings. Okay, sure, I said, but that doesn't answer my question. Costa stood up and looked down at me. He dusted off his pants. I can give you two answers. The theological answer first. Anubis is our strength. He rebuilds the wilderness, returns it to a place where people can live. He hunts down zombies and roots out cannibals and the larcenists. To do this, he needs the strength that death grants him. All those people must die to give power to his arm. I didn't even bother looking at him while he said all that. There's a practical answer, too, he went on. Yeah? Yes. It brings us together. If you choose and call ten of your people, you will be taking an act that cannot be reversed. You will have that sin upon you for the rest of your life, do you see? You will be implicated, and that means no matter where you go, no matter what you do subsequently, you will forever be part of the cult. Ten people have to die so I can join you, I said. Yes, it's a ritual, but it isn't illogical. In a place this size, one death is nothing much. People die all the time, but ten will be remembered. I rose to my feet. Together with Costa, I walked out into the square. Despite my instructions, almost no one had returned to their houses. They still stood around, biting their lips, wringing their hands, wondering what was going to happen next. A lifetime of peace for one savage, terrible act. For ten lives. Except it wouldn't end there, would it? If I paid fealty to the cult, if I implicated myself as he'd said, it would be forever. The next time they came through town, the next time Anubis needed strength in his arm, would they ask for more sacrifices? And what choice would I have but to give them what they asked for? I would be one of them. Hearth would be part of their empire, and everything it originally stood for would be lost. Costa lifted his arms to get everyone's attention, and then he began to preach. Death, he intoned and waited until everyone was looking at him, is greedy. Death is impatient, and death is willing to make a deal. The nineteen other stalkers all lifted their hands in the air, a salute to their faith, which meant they took their hands off their guns, just for a moment. I'd made my choice. I don't think I could have made any other, despite the consequences. I grabbed my knife from my belt, the knife I'd carried since I left New York, and I buried it in Costa's chest. Hot blood spurted between us. He looked very surprised. Snipers! I shouted, but before I even had the word out, I heard gunshots. Some of them came from the snipers at the gate. Others came from just over my head. While Costa and I had been talking, Mackie had made his own decision about whether we should join the cult. He'd headed up to the top of the municipal building with a couple people he knew were excellent shots. They had our best rifles. They were ready, and they fired before the stalkers could even react. One of the stalkers fell to the ground, a smoking hole in the back of his motorcycle helmet. 
Another spun around, his arm covered in blood. Over at the gate, the snipers I'd called for weren't much slower in reacting. I don't know how many stalkers they took down before the general shooting started. I threw myself to the ground, rolling Costa's body over me like a shield. He was still twitching. Bullets whizzed and hissed across the square as the people screamed. The stalkers lifted their assault rifles and started shooting blindly, some aiming for the snipers and for Mackie, some just firing into the crowd. No! I shouted, but I knew there was no chance of getting through this without casualties. I heard someone wailing in grief. I heard other people moaning in pain. One by one, the stalkers fell, their rifles jumping from their hands, the faceplates of their helmets cracking with white stars, their bodies chewed up by shotgun blasts and revolver bullets and eventually by awls and hatchets and woodworking tools as the people turned on them. One of them, maybe the last one alive, ran for his motorcycle. Bullets chewed up the back of his leather jacket and his blood flowed across his gas tank. But he got the machine started and he raced for the gate. Don't let him get away! I shouted, jumping up and running for the square. Don't let him get out or he'll tell them what happened! But it was already too late. The motorcycle shot out through the gate and the snipers couldn't get a bead on the stalker once he was out in the woods. He got away. The smoke took a long time to clear from the square. Chapter 125 Two of us were dead, cut down by stalker bullets. One of the snipers and a young guy who had run right at the stalkers, attacking them with just his bare hands. Fourteen more citizens of Hearth were wounded, some badly. They were all expected to live if infections didn't get them. They'd wanted ten deaths, and they'd gotten more than twenty since all the stalkers were dead. I didn't know how they expected death to feel about that. Maybe the one who got away had thoughts on the matter. I'll never know if I made the right decision. It was what I needed to do at the time when I stabbed Costa. I couldn't have done anything else, which will never ever let me off the hook for those who were hurt or who died. Just then I wasn't thinking about who to blame. There was so much to do right away that grieving had to wait. We pulled our sniper off the gate and dragged him over to where we'd piled the other bodies. They needed to be buried right away. We pushed the motorcycles deep into the forest, into leafy shadows, and covered them with tree branches and fallen leaves so they wouldn't be seen from the air. It won't matter, Luke said. They'll come back. They'll find us again. I went through the stalkers' things, the contents of their pockets, and the saddlebags on their motorcycles. They didn't have a radio or any way of contacting their superiors. My hope was that the lone stalker who got away wouldn't make it back, that he would die out in the wilderness. It was a lot to hope for, but if you want to believe something enough, it starts sounding possible. They're experts at wilderness survival, Luke insisted. He'll make it back. We scrubbed the blood off the houses and the front of the municipal building, patched the bullet holes, filled them over, painted the walls around them until they couldn't be seen, made sure there was no trace of what had happened. They'll send more. They'll send a lot more of them. Too many for us to fight. I whirled around to face Luke. God damn it, what else do you want me to do? By that point, night had come, and we were discussing strategy in the main square. Luke, Mackie, Kylie, and me. The rest of the positives were all in their houses, dealing with what happened, each in his or her own way. I couldn't think straight with Luke telling me again and again that we were doomed. I thought maybe somebody else might shut him up. Mackie, I said, you haven't said anything yet. His eyes were two cold stones in his head. He had saved us. He'd fought for Hearth. I thought he would back me up now. He didn't. Luke's right. More of them will come. It's not a question of if, but when. And next time, they'll send a hundred. If we kill the hundred, they'll send a thousand. Until we can't fight back anymore. Kylie stood up and slapped the table with one hand. Enough! We did what we did. We need to think about what's next. About what we're going to do next. And what's that? Luke asked. I have no idea, Kylie admitted. I do, Mackie said. 
Chapter 126 I did everything I could to convince them not to do it. I made a big speech in the town square, begging them not to. Mackey's told you all his plan by now, I said. They had all come out. This was far too important for anyone to miss. Even the wounded were propped up in chairs so they could listen. I could have ordered him not to discuss it with you, but that's not who we are. I doubted he would have obeyed me anyway. I sighed and looked out at their faces, at their eyes. These people had followed me through hardship and pain. They'd worked with me, built a town with me. In case you haven't heard all the details, his plan is to leave. Just pack up everything he can carry and walk back east. Head back to the medical camp. I know you remember that place. I know you can't forget it, just as I can't. I want to try to convince you to stay. Now Mackie will tell you how much danger we're in here. He's in charge of security. He understands what a threat is and that the best way to deal with it is not to be there when it arrives. That's smart. It's good planning, and I won't tell you he's wrong. But I want you to think about what you'd be giving up, what you would leave behind. This place, Hearth, it's special. Not because it's got a big fence or snipers watching the road. Every place in the world has that. Not because we've got pigs in a corral or enough jerky to get through the winter. You could have that anywhere, if you worked for it. No, Hearth is special because it's us. It's become who we are. I led you here, not so I could find you a safe place. I led you here because I knew you could be Hearth. You could be this town. I believed in you, in us, in our ability to become more than what we were, to do more than just survive, to show the world that positives can build something real and meaningful and lasting. If you walk out the gate now, if you just give up, you'll be letting that dream die. If you go back to the medical camp and knock on the door and say, we're sorry, we were mistaken, we can't make it on our own, then you're accepting that you're nothing more than what they told you. Positives. A danger to yourself and others. Not even 100% human. Maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you never felt the dream the way I did, and maybe even now you're thinking this place isn't worth defending. But I do. So I'm going to stay. No matter how many of you leave, I'm going to stay. I hope you'll stay with me. That's all. In the morning, Mackie was packed and ready to go, but he took his time about it. He spent a good hour talking to the snipers he'd personally trained, then going over the weapons stored in our armory, making sure they were in good shape. I found him there. He didn't say a word as I approached. He just sighted down the barrel of a hunting rifle and frowned. When they come, he said, go for headshots. Make every bullet count. Trust your snipers and get them training as many people as they can. I nodded. We'll do our best. He turned around until he was facing me, but his eyes never quite reached mine. It's not too late for you to come with us, he said. It's not too late for you to stay. But both of us were wrong, and we knew it. I'd made a speech about staying. If I turned my back on Hearth now, no one would ever respect me again, least of all myself. If he chose to stay now, he'd be letting down all the people who wanted to go. In the end, we shook hands and wished each other luck. Then he walked out the gate, with fifty of my people walking behind him. Luke, Kylie, and I watched from the top of the municipal building as they filed out of town. Down in the main square, a crowd of people who had decided to stay were gathered to jeer and mock the ones who left. I didn't like it, but I knew it would bring them closer together. In a way, they were just showing their pride and their faith in hearth. Anyway, I was too busy watching the horizon, wondering where the attack would come from when it did. Chapter 127 we got a little space of time, a little breathing room. I tried to make the best possible use of it. Our best sniper was Strong, the woman who had accompanied Mackie and me to the Deptford farmhouse. Mackie had trained her personally, but she'd shown an aptitude for marksmanship even he couldn't match. More than once while standing sentry duty, 
She had seen a pig in the forest beyond the gate and pegged it from 200 yards. Given the shoddy condition of our rifles, that was an incredible feat. Following Mackie's advice, I asked her to train as many people as she could in how to shoot. We couldn't afford to waste bullets that we had no way of replacing, but in the hardware store we found a couple of old BB rifles. Strong snorted and rolled her eyes when I showed her the toy rifles, but she did as I asked. Soon the peace and quiet of the town was replaced by a constant whizzing, plinking noise, and you had to be careful where you stepped so you didn't slip on the BBs that littered the main square. Kylie led a group whose job was to turn out as many hand weapons as possible. The town's hardware store kept surprising me with all the treasures it contained. Kylie's group laughed and smiled as they brought out hammers and pickaxes and pitchforks. There was even a barrel full of pruning hooks that looked like weapons straight out of a book on medieval warfare. We had a woman named Lucy who had been a radio operator in New Hampshire before she was sent to the medical camp. I showed her the little wind-up radio Colonel Parkhurst had given me, and she said she could make it work. I asked her to try to get in touch with anyone who would listen. I doubted very much that any of the nearby walled cities would respond. Why would they want to help a bunch of positives? But if there was a chance of getting help from somewhere, I needed to try. I had other people work on our wall. We had put it together in a hurry, designed it to keep out zombies. It was still vulnerable to one stalker with a pair of bolt cutters. Looking it over, I couldn't help but see plenty of places where someone with access to a pickup truck could have just driven right through it. I spent a lot of time imagining how I would get through it if it were my job, trying to second-guess the cultists. We did what we could, reinforcing the wall with corrugated tin or just plywood, but I couldn't help remember the gaping hole they'd blown in the wall of Indianapolis. We could never build anything so strong as that, and it had barely slowed the cult down. There were times when I thought Mackie had been right, Times when I looked at Kylie, hard at work sharpening a garden trowel on a grindstone, and wondered if I'd consigned my unborn child to a terrible death. I tried not to let it show on my face. There was a surprising amount of laughter in those days. People acted like they were preparing for an attack that would never come. Like it was absurd that anyone would ever want to destroy sleepy little hearth. Maybe the positives were just used to being in danger. Or maybe... They just didn't want to think about what was coming. Kylie had her own idea of why everyone seemed so cheerful. They believe in you, she said. We were lying in bed after a long day, and I had been stroking her belly. Now she turned to face me. You've gotten them through so much already. They think you're unbeatable. Then they're idiots, I whispered. She laughed and put an arm around my waist, pulled me closer. Finn! They're just feeling what I felt when I first met you. They see in you what I saw then. Oh? What's that? We we're brought up thinking the world is this horrible place. That everything is bad and getting worse. That just barely surviving is so much work it might not even be worth it. But you... You don't live in this world. No? I asked, surprised. Where do I live? A better one, she said. It's why we follow you. We think you'll take us there with you. And so far, it's working. We fell asleep holding each other. In the morning, we got up and got back to work, and everything was normal. Everything was the way it was supposed to be, until we heard the motorcycles buzzing in the distance. Chapter 128 it was mid-afternoon. I had been working up in the snipers' nests on top of the gate, rigging up pieces of sheet metal that the snipers could use as shields. I had people on top of the municipal building, watching the forest for any sign of movement, but the sound was our first sign. I think my heart stopped a little when I heard that sound. I turned and waved at the watchers on the roof of the municipal building. One of them nodded back, indicating they heard it too. Luke came out of his house, holding a triangle and a little mallet. As silly as it looked, we knew the sound the instrument made would carry all the way through town. We'd trained pretty hard for this, and recently enough that everybody remembered what they were supposed to do. 
Positives started streaming out of the houses and the factories, all of them carrying their weapons, moving to their assigned posts. Strong and her snipers came swarming up the ladders on either side of the gate. We've got it from here, boss, she told me. I nodded, but I wasn't looking at her. I was still scanning the forest all around, looking for the stalkers. I hate to say this, she told me, but you're just going to get in our way up here. Hmm? I turned around and looked at her. She seemed calm, ready, much more ready than I felt. I started to make an apology, intending to head down to ground level and leave her in peace. But then I stopped myself. You'll have to work around me, I told her. I need to see this. Not that there was anything to see. The trees that surrounded Hearth, which I had once thought would protect it, now blocked my view of the road. Maybe, I thought, we should have taken some of them down, cleared a space around the town. It would have made life easier for the snipers, given them better fields of view. It's amazing how effective you can be at planning when it's already too late. The noise of the motorcycles kept getting louder and louder. I caught a glimmer out in the woods, just a flash, maybe a reflection off a headlight or a piece of chrome. I heard something creak and looked down and saw I was holding on to the wooden railing, so tight I was about to snap it. I forced myself to let go. Over there, Strong said and pointed deep into the woods. I could make out a dark shape. You want me to kill that motherfucker? Hold on, I said. I knew the cultists weren't stupid. If they'd sent another stalker group, another twenty people, then their leader would see soon enough how outnumbered he was. Maybe he would know better than to attack, and we could avoid killing anybody today. One of the other snipers stood up and pointed into the trees at a spot near the main road. There! I couldn't see what he'd pointed out, though I strained my eyes trying to. Over on top of the municipal building, someone shouted, Boss! And I turned to look. The watcher there was pointing south at the far side of town. Then he turned and pointed east as well. They were coming at us from every side. There was only one road leading into Hearth. They must have worked their way through the forest to take up positions on the other sides, surrounding us. Tell me when to start shooting, Strong said. I nodded. I had a sudden feeling this wasn't just one stalker group, that there were a lot more than twenty people out in the woods. So far, they hadn't moved to attack us. Maybe we could get a jump on them by shooting first. Maybe... Then a horrible electronic squawk rolled across the town, a noise I hadn't heard since the loudspeakers at the medical camp called my name. The wail of feedback. I clamped my hands over my ears so I wouldn't be deafened. I was a little heartened to see Strong do the same thing. The feedback died out, and then a voice echoed up out of the forest. Stones? You in there? You want to talk about this before it gets nasty? I knew that voice, but I couldn't believe it. I would never thought I would hear it again. I looked down into the main square of town. Kylie stared up at me, looking as mystified and frightened as I felt. She knew that voice, too. I hadn't just imagined it. I looked out over the forest, but I still couldn't see anything. Come to the gate! Alone! And we'll talk! I shouted. Red Kate chuckled. Sure, Stones. Whatever you want. Chapter 129 She'd changed her look. Her hair was cut very short. Her face was dirty with road dust, except for a clean patch around her eyes where she'd worn goggles. She'd traded in her furs for a leather jacket with white bones painted on the sleeves and back. But when she smiled at me, when she gave me the wicked grin I remembered from the very first time I'd met her, I could see she hadn't changed a bit. It really is you, she said, and she held out her arms as if she would hug me through the gate. When Costa's guy limped back to camp and told us what happened, I begged and begged for this detail, just in case he had it right. And look, it's really you. Hello, Kate, I said. It's good to see you, she said. I must have sneered in disgust because she said, No, really. I miss the old days sometimes. 
You joined the skeleton cult? I asked. She rolled her eyes. Apparently, she said, and then she snorted with laughter. I told you last time I saw you. I knew being a road pirate was just going to end with me dead on the side of some dusty blacktop. I came west thinking what I needed was organization. People to watch my back. And now you're leading a stalker group. A little more than that, Stones. I've got a hundred guys out here. I can get reinforcements if I need them. A hundred. Just like Mackie had said they would send. I tried not to gulp in fear. We outnumbered them, but they would have a lot more firepower to work with. They trust you with that kind of command? She leaned close, into the gate, her fingers weaving through the chicken wire. I showed what they called leadership potential. You know what that means when the cult says it? I don't think I want to, but you saw me last where? Pennsylvania? You saw the crew I had back then? A lot of hard road from there to Denver, where I hooked up with Anubis and his people. By the time I got there, everybody was dead except me and Andy Waters. You remember Andy? I do, I said, picturing the road pirate dressed in tan leathers. Good guy. Stuck with me through thick and thin. Think he might have been in love with me or something. Anyway, I was talking about Denver. I showed up there and they saw this, she told me. She touched the hilt of her knife the one with the skulls around the grip. Turns out, it belonged to one of their badass people, what they call an evangelist. They told me that anybody who touches an evangelist is marked for death. Yet somehow you're still here, I pointed out. I could see the score. This is the cult that thinks death is willing to make deals, right? One life for another. You didn't cut Andy's throat on the spot? Yeah. Then I held him while he bled out. I think he understood and forgave me. If not, well, fuck him. He's dead. Jesus, Kate. She shrugged dramatically, making the arm bones painted on her shoulders lift and fall back. It looked like a gesture she might have practiced in a mirror. You feeling me, Stones? You get the point? Andy was a guy I liked. You, you're some punk I owe a beating. Now, how's it going down? Are we going to have to kill you all? I forced myself to stand up a little straighter. No, I said. You can retreat right now and we won't chase after you. She laughed. Good old stones. <laughs> okay, here's the deal we're offering. Basically the same that Costa was sent to make. We dump all our positives here, then we leave you in peace, blah, blah, blah. But I have to kill ten of my people, I said. What? Oh, no, no, Stones. No, no, no. No. That was what we offered the first time. Then you went and killed an entire stalker crew. She clucked her tongue at me. Not nice. Shows that you're not willing to go along to get along, huh? I refused to react. This time, we need a real decimation. Ten percent of everybody in your little town gets sacrificed. And you too. You get to be executed publicly in Denver. I think they're talking about doing a blood eagle. You know what that is? A blood eagle? No, I said. It's how the Vikings used to execute people. They make a long cut down either side of your spine. Then they pull your lungs out and drape them across your back. Supposedly, while you gasp your last breaths, the lungs flutter and it looks like the wings of an eagle. That's what you're offering, I said. You know my answer. I hope I do. I really, really hope you're going to say no. No, I told her. She almost squealed in glee. Chapter 130 I should have had her shot before she could go back to her people. Regardless of the strategic value of taking her out, it would have given me a lot of satisfaction. But I'd invited her to come talk and it wouldn't have been right shooting her in the back. If I ever wanted to live in this better world Kylie had spoken of, I needed to act like I was already there. So I watched her disappear back into the woods. And then I turned around and started giving orders, not that I needed to. Everybody knew their roles. We'd practiced enough that they got in place smoothly. 
I looked around at their faces and saw determination. I saw courage. I saw people willing to fight for hearth. And then, nothing happened. Oh, we heard a lot of motorcycles roaring around in the trees. We saw glimpses of people moving around outside of town on foot, though never for long enough that we could get a bead on them. But they didn't attack. For hours, they completely failed to engage us at all. Every minute, my people crouched in readiness. Every hour, they spent waiting for the battle to begin. They got more tired and confused and complacent. I wanted to tell them to stand down, to rest. But I knew that the second I did, Kate would attack. So all I could do was move from place to place, telling people not to lose focus, not to worry, that it would come soon. I'd never thought of Kate as a tactician. I thought her style was more aggressive and less coordinated. But maybe I should have known better. She was a great manipulator. She understood human psychology very well. So she waited to attack until darkness fell. After so many hours, even I jumped when I heard rifle shots. Long, sustained bursts of automatic rifle fire coming at us out of the last purple dusk of the evening. I don't think anyone was hit in that first salvo. But the next one cut holes through a house on the edge of town, and the third attack wounded a positive down by the southern end of Hearth, a young woman who was armed with nothing but a ball-peen hammer. We all heard her scream. There was chaos in town, as people ran this way and that, as the muzzle flashes of the assault rifles sent long daggers of light dancing between the houses. I heard people shouting for help, bellowing in pain. But my people weren't running in panic. They knew exactly what to do. We'd known the cult might attack by night, that we needed to be able to fight in the dark. We'd made hundreds of torches, just pieces of cloth wrapped around an old chair leg or even a stick. We set them ablaze and tossed them over our wall, lighting up the ground just outside of town. The stalkers hadn't been expecting that. Thinking they were protected by the darkness, they hadn't bothered to seek cover out in the trees. When the light of the torches found them, they were just standing there, rifles in hand, clearly in view of our snipers. Strong and her team made every shot count. They took down at least four of the stalkers before the others figured out what was going on and ran for the safety of the trees. The torches didn't burn for long. As they started to gutter out, the stalkers began creeping forward again. But Strong had good eyes, even at night, and she picked off a fifth stalker who thought he was being clever. And then we just lit more torches. We had plenty of them. A lot more torches than bullets and tossed them over the wall. After that... Red Kate pulled her people back out of sniper range, which meant well past the point where her assault rifles could harm us. They fired off a few bursts every ten minutes or so, just to keep us awake, but nobody else was hurt that night. Chapter 131 We had a hospital set up inside the municipal building. Its thick stone walls would protect the wounded. I made a point of sitting up with those who had been hurt, holding their hands, telling them it was going to be okay. None of the injuries looked like they would be fatal if we could keep the wounds clean of infection. Kylie came and took me away from there, about an hour before dawn. Five down, I told her. Ninety-five to go. Ninety-six. Don't forget Red Kate, she said. Oh, I'm saving her for last, I said. I kissed her, and we started walking, just ambling through the town, as if nobody was trying to kill us, as if it was perfectly safe. I figured that might help steady some frayed nerves, if people saw us like that. Despite the hour, I knew plenty of people were still awake. You think we have a chance? Kylie asked me quietly. I don't think there's a point in worrying about that question. In truth, I knew we were royally and completely screwed. Kate could bring up reinforcements, she said. I didn't doubt it. So even if we took down the stalkers outside our wall or forced them to run away, it would just be a temporary peace before the next group came. And after that, there would be still more. The cult, I figured, could afford to just throw stalkers at us until we were all dead. Our one hope was that it wouldn't be worth the cost, that crushing Hearth would take too many of Anubis's people, and he would decide he didn't care about us after all. 
It was a slim thread to hold on to, but I would take what I could get. Tomorrow they'll come at us for real, I said. We'll have a better idea then how this is going to go. Kylie just nodded. She understood. Nothing mattered except the next day. Chapter 132 The next day was hell. The attacks began at dawn and never let up. Red Kate never sent more than a few of her stalkers at us at a time, but they came from every side, and they knew exactly how to keep us terrified. A motorcycle would come roaring out of the trees, the driver bouncing over tree roots and dead branches, while a rider on the back would take aim at our wall with his assault rifle. The bullets the stalkers fired moved fast enough and hit hard enough that they could tear right through the thin wooden walls of our houses. Only a tiny fraction of them actually hit anybody, but they seemed to have ammunition to spare. I ordered my people into the center of town, into the most defensible houses, but that just made the attacks more frightening, because we couldn't see where they came from. There was no warning at all as bullets shattered windows and tore through flesh. The wounded seemed more shocked than in pain as we hurried them over to the municipal building. We fought back. The motorcycles weren't designed for riding through the forest. Something about their tires, Kylie thought. They moved fast, but not as fast as their drivers were used to. Strong said they were hard to target, but she did us proud. She caught one rider and made him drop his assault rifle, then caught the driver before he could turn around. I actually saw that one. He threw his arms up in the air and fell backward off the bike. The machine kept going, only stopping when it ran up against our wall, its front wheel bouncing and bumping against the barrier of corrugated tin. I have no idea who got hurt more that day, us or them. I only know that the municipal building started filling up with the wounded, that you could barely walk through the shelves in the library for all the people lying in the aisles. I'll admit, I was still glad to go in there and see them, because I knew I was relatively safe behind its brick walls. It wasn't easy, though, to convince the wounded people that everything was going to be okay, that we would make it through somehow. I wrapped bandages around limbs shattered by wayward bullets, helped our doctors, basically just positives trained in first aid, as they cleaned out bloody wounds. I met with Garrett, who was in charge of the hospital, and he showed me the three people who had died that day. He had them laying out on a conference table in a room at the back of the building. I studied each of the cold faces, committing them to memory. People who had died for Hearth wouldn't be forgotten, I promised. We would build a monument in the center of town to remember them. When I'd finished there, I went back out among the wounded. I smiled and grasped every hand that was held out to me, and then I was out again in the sun, listening to the constant chatter of the rifles. At dusk, Kylie and Luke and I ate a cold meal on top of a house near the center of town. We were ready for Kate to pull the same trick as the night before, with her stalkers firing blind in the dark. We had plenty of torches ready. But as the sun went down, the noise of the day actually receded. The gunfire stopped, and we could barely even hear any motorcycles. The quiet actually worried me, because it was new and therefore dangerous, then the peace was shattered as Red Kate turned her bullhorn on again and feedback made us all wince. Stones, she said. Stones, I just got some great news. I've got a present for you. I think I'll wait until tomorrow to give it to you, though. I want it to be light out so I can see the look on your face. I must have bristled because Kylie reached over and touched my arm. Don't let her get to you, she said. Well... I did my best. Chapter 133 I tried to count my blessings. Red Kate didn't seem to have any rocket launchers or explosives, nothing that could cut through our wall, the way the cult had blasted its way into Indianapolis. She didn't have any tanks or helicopters. Clearly Anubis didn't think we were worth the expenditure. What she did have, though, perhaps her most fearsome weapon, was time. She could sit out there for months, if that's what it took, long enough for us to starve to death. We only had so much food stored inside the town. 
our corral of half-domesticated pigs wasn't going to last. She could also just keep pouring bullets into the town, and eventually she would hit everybody. Or we would get scared enough to surrender. Obviously, there was no great incentive for me to do that. I didn't want to die by bloody eagle, but in time, some of my people were going to decide that losing me might be worth it. They would turn against me, and there would be nothing I could do. It was really just a matter of time. So in the hour before dawn, when I stood in the sniper's nest, watching the first light glimmer on the leaves of the trees, I was feeling pretty hopeless. Behind me, Strong set up for the day, checking her rifles, squinting at each bullet to make sure it wouldn't jam in the breach. She had a lot fewer bullets left than I'd expected. How much longer can you keep shooting? I asked her. She ran her fingers through the bullets in the ammo box, jingling them together, maybe counting them. A couple of days, if we stay picky about our targets. If they mount a big assault, come at us all at once. This'll last maybe an hour. I nodded, then turned to look at her directly. Strong looked tired, but resolute. Tell me something, I asked her. When you had a chance to leave with Mackie, you stuck around, even though you knew you might be killed. Why? She took a deep breath before she answered. I thought about it. I considered going back to the medical camp, she shrugged. Food's better here. I started to speak, to ask her for the real reason, but just then we heard motorcycles moving out in the woods. Both of us ducked and got under the metal shields. Strong reached for her rifle. They're coming closer, she whispered, and I nodded. It was still dark out in the woods. No light at all was touching the forest floor. Strong got her rifle ready, but she didn't even bother bringing the scope to her eye. Not when it was so unlikely that she would get a good shot. The noise of the motorcycle got louder still, and then... It was all around me, and the bike zoomed into view just a few dozen yards away on the road. There was just one stalker on it, dressed in leather and with the face shield of his helmet down. He was holding something, but it wasn't a gun. It was about the size of a bowling ball, and my first thought was it must be a bomb. He threw it at the gate. Strong brought her rifle down, but she didn't fire. The rider was already gone. I stared at her wondering if we were both about to die in a fiery explosion. But we didn't. The thing the rider had thrown just lay there, sitting in the road just outside the gate. Eventually, I worked up the courage to climb down the ladder and take a look. By then, the sky over the woods was a deep pink color. The sun was coming up. I leaned up against the gate and peered through the chicken wire. I could just about make out the features of the object. Then all at once, I knew exactly what I was looking at. It was Mackie's severed head. Chapter 134 I couldn't stop staring at the head. I called for some people to come help me open the gate, just for a second, so we could retrieve it. Then I held the head in my hands and just wondered how it had happened. How it was possible. Kate was kind enough to fill me in. We found them on the road about 50 miles from here, she said through her bullhorn. On foot, like fucking idiots. They tried to run. Can you believe it? They tried to outrun us. We didn't even bother with a decimation. We just cut them all down where we found them. Kylie came and took the head away from me. We'll give it a proper burial, she said. I didn't respond. I wanted to hear more from Kate. I wanted her to give me a good reason to run out and kill her with my own two hands, then and there. Don't know if they would have begged for their lives, Kate said, though that would have been amusing. Did you send them to get help from the army? They didn't get very far. I started moving back toward the gate. I had my knife at my hip. I wrapped my fingers around the grip. I shouted for them to open the gate for me. In my head... All I had to do was walk out there and challenge Kate to a knife fight. I would kill her. And then all her stalkers would be so impressed they would just leave us alone. Obviously, I wasn't thinking very clearly. Obviously, they would have just gunned me down as soon as they saw my face. Fortunately for me, Luke was at the gate, and he told everyone to ignore my orders, to keep the gate closed. 
I fell down on my knees in front of the gate. Suddenly all the strength, all the rage went out of me. Suddenly I couldn't even stand up. Out in the woods, Kate had one more thing to say. If you make us come in there, Kate said, we'll do the same to all of you. Every last one. If you open the gate now, well, it'll still be pretty ugly, but 90% of you will get to live. 90%! That sounds like really good odds to me. I looked up at my people. There were maybe ten of them gathered around the gate, all of them staring at me. After a while, I told them to get back to the safety of the houses at the center of town. Some of them took their time about it, but they all went. Luke and Kylie helped me over to the municipal building. You need to sleep, Luke told me, and maybe you should eat something. You don't look very good. I'm fine, I said. Kylie tried to rub my shoulders. I shrugged away from her. I'm fine, I said again. I went inside, into the little morgue we'd set up. The smell in the room was unbelievable. We had no way to refrigerate the bodies. I saw the ones who died of gunshot wounds. I saw Mackie's head sitting on a table covered with a cloth. I sat there with the dead and wondered if I was making a terrible mistake, if I'd been wrong all along. I never doubted myself more than at that moment. Chapter 135 Kate gave us an hour to think things over, before she started in with the flying raids again. The stalkers would come zooming out of the woods and fire off a burst from their assault rifles, then run away before we could react, just like before. Like they could keep it up forever. At least we got better at keeping our heads down. That day, nobody came into the municipal building to join the wounded. Though one young woman did get grazed by a bullet, the wound wasn't bad enough for her to leave her post. Unfortunately, the raids weren't Kate's only strategy. She had plenty of tricks to play on us. For instance, she tried to burn us to death. She didn't have any high explosives with her, but she had extra fuel for her motorcycles. She armed one of her stalkers with Molotov cocktails, then sent him at us just before dusk. Strong managed to shoot him dead, but not before he threw a bottle of flaming gasoline at our wall. Flames jumped up around the panels of corrugated tin there, quickly spreading to the wooden buttresses on the inside of the wall. I sent everybody I could muster with buckets of water and blankets to try to put the fire out before it could spread. I got up on a nearby roof to direct their efforts. If they missed even an ember or a smoldering bit of cloth, the fire could start up again at any moment. Up there, I was exposed to gunfire, but I didn't care. I stood up there for most of an hour, coughing on the smoke and baking in the heat, pointing and shouting. And it was all just a diversion. Kate must have known that it had been a wet summer, that the fire wouldn't spread too far. Otherwise, she might have just sent more firebombs our way. No, she had something completely different planned to keep us on our toes. While we desperately fought the fire that was consuming one section of our wall, she sent in a bunch of stalkers to dismantle another section. They must have been studying the wall the whole time because they knew exactly where to hit it. One area had just a thin piece of sheet metal mounted on a couple flimsy strands of barbed wire. It was more than enough to keep out a zombie or two, but stalkers with tools cut through it like it was a lace curtain. They bent up a section of the sheet metal to make a gap, then wriggled through like snakes, one after another. Who knows how many of them could have got inside the wall if Garrett hadn't spotted them. He'd come outside to take a break from his duties in the hospital and saw a flash of black leather and started screaming for all he was worth. I told Luke to take over for me, then climbed down from the roof and ran as fast as I could for the municipal building. I saw others running alongside me, but I didn't even stop to check who they were. By the time I reached the central square, six stalkers were already gathered there, standing in a loose formation, ready for us. Garrett was dead on the municipal building steps, his throat cut open. I came racing at the stalkers. I had a shotgun, and I brought it up and fired one barrel, then the other, not even thinking about the fact they had assault rifles. My shotgun blasts cut one of them in half, but the others were already opening fire. It didn't go well for either side. Just to my left, a young woman caught a bullet in her cheek. 
She turned and brought a hand up to the wound, and the next round caught her in the wrist. A third bullet hit something vital in her abdomen because she was dead before she stumbled and hit the ground. I watched it all, as if it were happening somewhere else, far away. On my right, somebody else was also dying, but I didn't even see it until afterward. The guy had been one of our best pig hunters. He'd been vital in keeping us alive on our journey to hearth. I dropped the shotgun, no time to reload, and whipped my knife out of its scabbard. Roaring like a lion, I slashed through a leather jacket. The stalker tried to jump back, so I lunged into him, stabbing him again and again. Around me, others were fighting with kitchen knives and sledgehammers, crushing bones, carving into flesh. Blood slicked the ground all around us. Another stalker tried to crawl in through the gap in the wall, and we butchered him right on the spot, lying on his belly in the dirt. Without even pausing for breath, I shouted for people to bring wood and corrugated tin and barbed wire to repair the fence, to stop any more of them getting in. Somebody must have told me I was wounded, that I was hit, but I kept shouting orders because I knew that the second I looked down, I was going to lose all my energy, all the momentum. Eventually, though, I did have to look down. Then I dropped to sit in the mud and the blood and finger the hole in my shirt. Eventually, Kylie came for me and took me to our little hospital. Chapter 136 I just don't know. Garrett was the best at first aid, and he's... He's in the morgue now, Luke said, staring at my wound. I don't think you're going to die. He made it sound like a question. The wound had stopped bleeding, at least. The bullet had torn open my stomach, just below my belly button. It looked bad, like raw meat, but we both knew the real problem. There was no corresponding hole in my back. The bullet was still in there. We had no idea how to remove it, or even if we should. So Luke had sewn me up with a piece of fishing line that he'd soaked in rubbing alcohol. It hurt like hell, almost more than getting shot. But it didn't take very long. Afterward, I tried to stand up again. I could still feel my feet, which I took as a good sign, but the second I put weight on my legs, my whole body just cramped up with agony. It was unbearable. Luke helped me lie back down, and for a long time I could do nothing but stare at the ceiling as my pulse pounded in my ears. This was going to be a problem. I could bark orders at people just fine while sitting down, but if I couldn't be up, moving around town, checking on things, those orders wouldn't mean much. I have to be able to walk, I said. We have some stuff for the pain, Luke told me. Pills. They're twenty years old, so they might not work anymore. They might even be poisonous. Fine, I said, as if he'd said they might make me drowsy. Plus, the one thing I do know for sure about first aid is that the more you move around, the more likely you are to reopen your wound, or the bullet in your gut could move and tear something that will kill you on the spot. It's not safe, Finn. Where are the pills? I asked. Nobody in Hearth was safe just then. Any of us could be killed by a random bullet at any time. He went and got them for me, though he shook his head in disbelief. When he came back, I took the bottle and looked inside and saw thirty or so old, crumbly white pills that smelled like pig urine. I put one in my mouth and swallowed it on the spot. While I waited for it to take effect, I said, Luke, why do you always question my decisions? You always have, ever since we met back in the medical camp. Because I'm smarter than you and I know better, he told me, smiling. Seriously, I said, though I smiled back. Most people want me to just make a call and stick to it. They want somebody who will tell them everything's going to be okay, or that they're special and worthwhile. But not you. You disagree with almost everything I say and do, and yet you've stuck with me, even when you didn't have to. If you'd gone with Mackie, that would have been a lousy decision, as we see now, he replied. He scratched at his nose for a second. Finn, I could tell right away, I mean, really early on, that you were going to be trouble. I figured you would end up as the boss of a work crew. I had no idea you were going to take it this far. You were going to be powerful, though, and in my experience, powerful people like it when the people around them agree with everything they say when they fawn over their leader. I didn't want to be like that. 
I wanted to always tell you the truth. I was a little afraid you would hit me for some of the things I said to you, but you never did. You weren't like any of the bosses I knew. I guess I stuck around wondering when you were going to change, when you were going to decide you were personally more important than the people who followed you. He shrugged. I'm still waiting. That day comes, I'm out of here. By the time he'd finished saying all that, the pill I'd taken had kicked in. It hadn't gone bad in the twenty years since the crisis. If anything, it must have gotten stronger. It took all my pain away, all right, which was very welcome. But it also left me feeling loopy and disconnected from reality, which could be just as bad as the pain had been. I handed Luke the pill bottle. Too much, I said. You keep these. When I ask for one, give me half of one, okay? Don't let me have more than that. And if I start acting really stupid, you cut me off entirely. Got it, boss, he said. I nodded. It felt like I was underwater, and all my motions were slowed down, exaggerated. But I got up on my feet, and I could walk without pain, which meant I could work. Chapter 137 Just before dark, Kate stopped sending her motorcyclists in to harass us. Maybe it was just costing her too many men. Strong and her snipers were getting very good at hitting moving targets. I told my people to keep inside and keep their heads down anyway. We didn't know when she would start up again. What we did know, what I was sure of, was that she had something else planned for us. That she wasn't going to just leave us alone. And I was right. It took Strong's sharp eyes to see what was going on. The call came down, and I went to the gate right away. Strong ushered me up into her sniper's nest, the best vantage point we had. She told me what to look for, and still I could barely see it. It looked like Kate was building something, a big wooden contraption. She was setting it up in a clearing about 200 yards from town, a little open space among the trees. I could barely see it, though, for the intervening foliage. I thought maybe it had a long arm and a central pivot, and there were some metal parts attached to the sides. Springs taken from the suspension of one of her motorcycles, maybe. It was dark before she finished building the thing, so I didn't get to see the finished product. I did, however, get to find out what it did, and all too soon. It was a catapult. It was designed to throw Molotov cocktails right over our wall, right into the midst of town. The first projectile sailed maybe a hundred and fifty yards before it clipped the side of a tree trunk and shattered. Half the town came out to watch the tree flare into a bright cloud of crisping leaves and dark branches silhouetted against the blaze. I shouted for everyone to get back inside, but they all ignored me. The second Molotov hit our wall square on. I was glad then that everyone was out watching because I had to organize them into another fire brigade. We'd learned a lot about how to put out fires the first time Kate tried to burn us alive, and we made short work of it this time. But even as we were putting the fire out, another missile came arcing over our heads with a grumbling noise, and then a shrill clatter as it burst against the hard earth of the main square. I headed over there, waving for a team with blankets to follow me, but by the time I'd arrived, the flames were already guttering out. The gasoline bombs used up their fuel quickly, it seemed. Unless they hit something that they could ignite, they weren't too dangerous. That was a pretty big unless, though. Hearth had so many wooden homes, so many piles of firewood or old, dried-out furniture. If a fire broke out in the southern part of town, where the older houses were, we might not be able to put it out before it spread through street after street. I called for my blanket team to head down there, to the old houses, and stand guard. Our best chance was if they were on the scene when a firebomb hit, so they could take action before things got out of control. I grabbed a team who carried buckets of water and had them spread out around the main square with instructions to watch for the next bomb. Then I turned around and... And... I can't even remember what I was going to do next. Maybe it was the pain pills, but it's all a blank. All I do remember is someone shouting my name, right in my face, and waking up, on my feet, to find myself in the main square. 
The fact that I couldn't remember how I got there scared me. But I couldn't focus on that at the moment. I turned and looked and saw a positive who was saying something to me over and over. The army, he said. The army, the army. I couldn't believe it. When I would told Lucy to work the radio, to try to raise some help, I'd assumed it wouldn't ever come to anything. But was it possible? Could it be that the army had come to save us? A bunch of positives? A big smile started to spread across my face. What about the army? I asked. Lucy has them on the radio, he said. You need to go talk to them. Chapter 138 Lucy, our radio operator, was in the municipal building, in the office of the town's former comptroller. She had our toy-like wind-up radio on a desk in front of her, and she was turning the crank as fast as she could. When she saw me come in, she looked up with very wide eyes. It's, um, a colonel somebody for you, Finnegan, she said, and held the radio toward me. I don't know how to work this thing, I said. Do I turn the... I can hear you just fine, son, the radio said. I took it from Lucy's shaking hands. Colonel Parkhurst, I said. You can't imagine how happy I am to hear from you, sir. We've been trying for days. I know, son. I know. And I can see you're in a real pickle over there. I frowned. You can see through this radio? Does it have a camera in it? No, no. I'm looking at satellite imagery. I can see your town full of positives there. And I can see the stalkers camping just outside. What the devil is that thing they've got? It looks like a catapult. Now that's new. Sir, I said, I don't actually understand what you're talking about, but it sounds like you've got things just about right. Can you... How's your wall? It's holding up okay? For now, I said. And you've got water? That's crucial in any siege-type situation. His voice faded off into a crackling hum. Lucy jumped up and reached for the crank on the side of the radio, and I realized it had run out of power. I turned the crank wildly until I could hear the colonel again. Medical supplies, he said. Sir, I missed some of that, but I'm very happy you answered our call, because we could really use some help right now. Couldn't we all? He asked, and even laughed a little. I'm in New Mexico right now, son. New Mexico, fighting the cultists. You understand? They came sweeping out of Denver like the devil's own, and they're pushing us back toward Texas. If they take Texas... They'll have our oil, and without oil, there's no gasoline. Without gasoline, we'll have no more helicopters, do you see? No more helicopters. That sounds bad, sir, but if you could just send us one helicopter with a bunch of soldiers in it, that would, that would really help us out. It wasn't so much to ask, I thought. That was what the army was for, wasn't it? To protect us from zombies and looters and cultists. Just one helicopter. Son, the colonel said. I want to help you. I'm glad to hear it, I said. I want to. But every single man we've got is needed right here. Without gasoline, without helicopters, there is no army. And then what happens? That's the end of the United States right there. If we can't move our people around, the whole continent will get divided up by Anubis and people like him. No, son. I can't spare a single troop, much less a squad. I closed my eyes. I didn't want to see Lucy's face. I didn't want to see anything. Colonel, I said. I... I'll beg if I have to. Please. If you don't help us, every single person in Hearth could die. I wished Lucy didn't have to hear that, but it was going to be evident to the entire town soon enough anyway. Colonel, we need you. Son, you've got to hold out the best you can. Keep your water supply clean. Keep morale high. Just hold in there long enough and... He started to fade out again then. I didn't even bother turning the crank. I handed the radio back to Lucy. She took it and set it carefully on her desk. You did an amazing job getting through to him, I told her. But maybe we should put you on a firefighting team now. I, uh... I don't think we need a radio operator anymore. No, she said. I guess not. I tried to give her a brave smile, even if I wasn't feeling it. Maybe we 
keep this just between us, okay? I asked. Sure, she said. Chapter 139 That next day, Red Kate mostly left us alone. I had no idea why, but I was thankful for it. Maybe her catapult broke. But at least I had a little space of time when I wasn't running all over town, literally putting out fires. When I realized things would stay quiet, probably until dawn, I found Kylie and let her help me into a bed. I even managed to get some sleep. Pain woke me up. I called for Luke, and he gave me half a pill, then left before I could order him to give me the other half. While I waited for the medicine to kick in, Kylie held my head in her lap and stroked my temples. I touched my forehead to the warmth of her pregnant belly, and that helped. How's our food supply holding up? How long until we starve? I asked. Don't worry about that now, she told me. She shushed me and rubbed my ears. When we run out of bullets, Kate will know. She'll realize we can't shoot at her anymore and she'll just have her stalkers snipe us through the gate. That's not happening right now, Kylie said. She can stay out there forever. We're trapped in here. We're safe in here, you mean, she told me. I swiveled around until I could look up into her face. If I die, don't, she said. No, listen. If I die, I need you to take charge, which means, Finn, she said, shut the fuck up. I blinked at her. I thought about what to say in response. Then I just nodded, closed my eyes, and nestled closer, touching her with as much of my body as I could. Chapter 140 Whatever the reason for the short respite, by nightfall, Red Kate got it fixed. Soon she was keeping up a steady stream of gasoline bombs, about one every minute, we kept putting the fires out, but it was just a matter of time before she got lucky and one of the Molotov cocktails hit something vulnerable. I don't even know what caught on fire first, but soon enough, a house was burning, roof to foundation, in the south part of town, and then three of them were, and then the fire was everywhere. My teams worked valiantly trying to put out the blazes, some of them rushing straight into the conflagration. I knew they would get themselves killed. The fires were just too big, too out of control, so I ordered them to fall back. That was when I heard Luke shouting for help. I hurried toward him as fast as I could, and when I got there, I found him already ordering my teams around, telling them to throw their water on a house that wasn't even on fire. For a second, I thought he'd gone crazy, but then I realized what he was doing. He was trying to keep the fire from spreading. You bunch, he said, pointing at a blanket team. Drop those! Blankets won't cut it anymore. You see that shed? He asked. I want you to tear it down. They looked at one another, not at him. I could see they were skeptical. But I gave him the benefit of the doubt. Do what he says, I shouted, and they moved. Sometimes it helps to have the mayor on your side. The shed in question was right in the path of the spreading fire, but it was made of corrugated tin. It was in no danger of catching on fire but I watched as they used claw hammers and pickaxes to tear it apart. And then I saw what Luke was after. Hidden inside the shed were a bunch of jugs and bottles looped together with pieces of rubber hose. It was a still. If the fire had gotten to it, it might have gone up like a bomb. Luke moved in and started carting away the various pieces of the still, in the process getting a lot of alcohol on his shirt and pants. When he started running back in to grab more of it, I grabbed his arm. Get away from the fire, I said. He looked down at himself and laughed. That would be a pretty dumb way to go, huh? I'll see to this. You go see how far the fire spread on the other side of town. He nodded and ran off without another word. I organized a team to finish cleaning up the still, then asked for some help getting up on a roof so I could see the extent of the damage. It was already devastating, and it looked like it would get worse. The whole southern third of town was on fire. I didn't hear anybody screaming. Those houses weren't occupied, since they were too close to the wall. Too close to stray bullets fired by stalkers on motorcycles. So I'd had the people who lived there moved to more central housing. I could be thankful for small mercies, at least. The smoke started to get to me after a while. The flames dazzled my eyes, 
and as drugged up as I was, I started feeling very lightheaded. I had my team bring me back down off the roof, and I headed north toward the municipal building. I had to get every single positive organized, get them limiting the spread of the fire. Luke would have good ideas about that. I needed to organize rescue parties just in case anyone was trapped down there. I needed... I came up short when I reached the main square. Maybe seventy people were there, all of them staring southward, staring at the column of smoke and fire twisting over Hearth's southern half. They were dumbfounded. I realized how calm I'd become. Maybe that was the pills, or maybe it was just because I knew somebody had to stay in control. Somebody had to keep making decisions. But yeah, when I thought about it, Hearth was on fire. It was too much. It was just too much. If I started thinking about it, I would cry or scream or something. This could be the thing that broke us. The final attack that destroyed us. Except I wouldn't let it be. It's just houses, I shouted at the gathered people. Some of them looked at me in horror. Just houses? Hearth, I said, isn't houses. We can build houses, rebuild all of them. But if we don't get to work right now, there'll be no point. I need teams of people to fetch water. I need teams to dismantle structures. I need... I needed a lot of things. One by one, the people in the square began to snap out of their trance and give me those things. Chapter 141 The fire burned all night, spreading despite everything we tried. Luke was nearly killed when a flaming house collapsed right next to him, but other than some superficial burns, he came through okay. Within minutes, he was back in charge of the crew dismantling a small factory on the east side of town. We had no way to stop the fire. Nothing more effective than buckets of water and blankets to smother the embers that scattered everywhere every time a house sagged and collapsed into the street. There weren't even enough of us to take care of what problems we could fix, much less think about how to stop the conflagration. Every single one of us, every positive in hearth, worked tirelessly, bringing water from the well, throwing buckets of dirt on smoldering piles of rubble, dragging wounded people out of buildings that were at risk. Some people did die in the fire, trapped inside buildings they were trying to save. Dozens of others were burned or suffered such bad smoke inhalation they had to be taken to the hospital in the municipal building. I kept moving as best I could through all of it, though my wound and the pills made me dizzy, made me sway in the heat of the fires. I blacked out a couple more times, but I didn't tell anybody when it happened. I tried not to worry about it. I just got back to what I had been doing. I think a lot of people were in that same condition, half-dazed, half-sick, barely able to stand but unable to stop working. Nobody was going to stop now. Nobody was going to just lie down and admit defeat. Even when we realized it was probably the end of us. Even when we saw what the fire had done to the wall. Whole sections of it were just gone. Either it collapsed when the fire burned out the wooden supports, or the corrugated tin just melted from the intense heat. Where the wall still stood, it sagged on broken timbers or leaned at crazy angles. The only thing stopping Red Kate's stalkers from flooding into the town was the fire itself, and that wasn't going to last. As out of control as it was, there was only so much fuel for it to consume. The section of houses where it had begun was nothing now but a colossal pile of ash and burnt timbers. It wasn't even smoking anymore. I brought Strong and her snipers down from the gate and had them set up on the top of houses in the part of town that hadn't caught fire yet. I gave them all the guns and ammunition we had. Maybe, I thought, maybe we had a chance. We had piles of sheet metal and corrugated tin from all the sheds and workshops we'd torn down all the buildings we'd dismantled, trying to slow the fire down. If I could get my people to run over to the wall, through the ashes, if they could get there in time to put up new wall sections, they didn't have to be particularly strong or well-fastened. They just had to look like one continuous wall. If, if Kate didn't burn down the rest of the town, if my people could stand up under the strain, if, if, if... All my hypotheticals disappeared at once 
when I heard the motorcycle engines biting and snapping at the smoky air. Kate had seen that the wall was down. The stalkers were coming. Chapter 142 The first bike came right through the flames, roaring through a great plume of black soot and white ash. It hit a collapsed timber like a ramp, and the bike jumped into the air, flying over a pile of burning rubble. Flames licked along the sides of the machine, but the stalker jumped clear before the motorcycle caught fire. It went skidding across scorched pavement, blue flames shrouding its gas tank. The stalker rolled up to his feet and ran right at a positive holding a blanket. She lifted it up as if it were a shield, but the stalker just slashed at her with a long knife carving deep into her arm. I started hobbling over to help, but another motorcycle was already buzzing toward me and another over to my left. They burst out of the smoke faster than I could keep track, some of the stalkers jumping off their bikes as soon as they were inside the wall, others roaring great circles around us like they were herding pigs. One came at me with an assault rifle in his hands, and I lifted my shotgun and fired right into his dark face shield. It turned white as it shattered, and then blood poured out around the man's neck as he lifted his hands toward his face. I kicked him over and pointed my shotgun at the next stalker I saw. He had a metal pole in his hands that he swung around so fast it knocked the shotgun right out of my hands. He came at me, the pole blurring in the air as it spun, and I knew if it touched my face or my chest, it would hit fast enough and hard enough to break bones. But even as he brought his pole up for the fatal swing, a positive in a flower print dress stabbed him in the kidney with a carving knife. He fell down in a heap. My savior helped me up, dragging me to my feet with both her hands. She couldn't be more than five feet tall. It took me a while to see past all the soot on her face and realize it was Lucy, the radio operator. Thanks, I said. Grab that assault rifle. I pointed at the one that had belonged to the stalker I killed. Then I bent to pick up my shotgun. All around us, positives were drawing weapons, getting ready for the next attack. There was no doubt in our minds that more stalkers were on the way. We could hear motorcycles buzzing just beyond the cloud of smoke that wreathed the southern part of town. I saw four stalkers down on the ground, all of them dead. Two positives were down as well, but one was just wounded, blood washing the ash off his hands and arms. I shouted for somebody to help get him to the hospital. Lucy turned the assault rifle over in her hands. I can't get this to work, she said. I traded her, my shotgun for the assault rifle. Ike had carried a rifle when we left the medical camp, and he'd shown me how it worked. This one had skulls painted on the stock, but otherwise looked the same. It felt strange, though, a little light. I checked the sights, then ejected the clip to check for jams. There was only one bullet in the clip. I was certain the stalker hadn't fired his weapon, that I'd killed him before he could shoot. I looked around and saw that of the other three stalkers we'd killed, not a single one of them was carrying a firearm. They'd brought hand weapons, knives, and the metal staff. Sometimes an idea just comes to you, a thought a conclusion. Sometimes it's like the thing that was just waiting for you to notice it, all the pieces in place, ready for you to come and see the bigger picture. I shouted for Luke. He wasn't far away. Two more stalkers had come through at a different part of the fallen wall, he told me. They were both dead. One of them had been carrying an assault rifle. I checked its clip and found two bullets inside. Just two. Come on, I told Luke. Get all your teams together. But the fire's still burning, I shook my head. I know how Kate thinks. This wasn't the last of it. There'll be more of them coming through any second. Let's go get ready for them. Chapter 143 Red Kate liked to pretend she was a wild animal, a thing of chaos. But she waited a good hour before she made her next attack, which gave us all the time we needed. She came into town through a gap in the wall big enough she could have driven tanks through it. Most of her stalkers came on motorcycles, but she came on foot. She inspected a piece of corrugated tin that used to be part of the wall. She tore it down and tossed it aside, nearly hitting one of her stalkers. She had a big, nasty smile on her face. She knew she'd won. Hearth was hers, and there was no way we could keep her out. No way we could stop her from despoiling the town. 
from obliterating the population. I wonder if she believed, even a little. If she thought she was doing the cult's work, that she would be giving strength to Anubis when he needed it the most in his war against the Washington government. I doubt it. I think she just liked the fact she had a job where she got to burn down people's homes, loot their belongings. She was a maggot on the corpse of the world. She told me as much. For a little while at hearth, I think I had started to show that the world wasn't quite dead, that maybe we could bring it back to life. She was here to prove me wrong. The stalkers spread out through the streets of the town, their assault rifles up and ready. Most of them had left their bikes behind in the ashes. A few raced here and there, scouting ahead. Some of them carried knives or staves or even clubs that looked like machine parts, like components removed from motorcycle engines. Some carried heavy metal chains. They were ready for whatever kind of fight we wanted to give them. It was impossible to see how they felt about this, with the face shields of their helmets down. Were they excited, salivating for the kill? Were they feeling devout? Were they scared? Did they just want to get this over with? Maybe they were confused as they moved farther and farther into hearth and nobody ran out to give them battle. Maybe they started to relax a little, to think that we'd all died in the fire or something. I could see Kate's face. I saw how she looked when she got to the main square and hadn't found anybody. I saw her when she got to the gate at the north end of town, the gate that led to the road and the highway beyond. It was standing wide open, swinging a little in the wind from the still roaring fire. The sniper nests on the top of the gate were empty. No sharpshooters waited on the rooftops, looking to line up a good shot. Kate saw that the town was open, defenseless, and she screamed in thwarted rage. No, you didn't, Stones! She shouted. No way! No way you just walked away! You don't get to do that! Not again! She drew her knife, the one with the skulls on the hilt, the cult's knife. She pointed it at the empty gate. I will hunt you down, she vowed. I will find you, and I will cut your fucking eyes out. Makes sense, right? I mean, Kylie had even suggested it to me. That we pick up and go east, find a safer place to start over. I'd realized something when the fire tore through half of the town. Hearth wasn't the houses, or the land, or even the name. It was the people. The positives. We were Hearth. If we had to run, we could run. We could go somewhere else, start a new life. The dream didn't have to die. At least, at least that was what I wanted Kate to think. I knew it would make sense to her. She couldn't understand what this town meant to me, that I would never leave it. I had sent Strong and her snipers with the last of our ammunition around the edge of the camp, skirting the wall on the outside so they could come up behind Kate and her stalkers once they were all inside the town. The rest of us were inside the buildings on the main square, keeping our heads down, waiting for the signal to attack. We stayed when we could have run, I whispered to the terrified people crouching all around me on the second floor of the municipal building. We stayed knowing we would have to fight. This is the time. We're going to fight because we are Hearth. Any second now, the signal would come. Any second. And then we would fall on them with all the fury and rage of a people besieged. And we would end this for once and for all. Except, of course, it didn't work out that way. Chapter 144 The signal was supposed to be two gunshots in quick succession. I'd told Strong to put them right in Kate's heart if she could. I waited and waited for the sound of the shots, but they never came. Instead, one of the stalkers tripped on a piece of debris outside of a burned-out house. He dropped to all fours. Then, as he stood up, he started shouting. One of my positives, a boy maybe thirteen years old, came running out of the house. The stalker must have seen him. The boy cut the stalker's leg with a sharpened adze, but the stalker just smacked the kid backward into the street. 
He drew a club from his belt and stepped into the shadows after the boy. I couldn't see what happened next, for which I was thankful. I had no time to think about it. I could see Red Kate running across the main square, shouting orders at her stalkers, and I knew she was on to us. Spread out! Find them! Don't let yourselves get boxed in! My turn. Go! I shouted, running down the stairs, slapping people on the back as I passed them. Go! Let's go! Positives poured out of the municipal building, jumping out of every window. Right in front of me, I saw a woman land on top of a stalker and smash in his helmet with a rock until he stopped moving. I pushed my way out of the front door as positives rushed past me, armed with knives and tools and whatever they could carry. It wasn't how I wanted it to go down. It was a mistake, though one I'd been forced to make. I don't know how it could have gone differently, but I had hoped, I had gambled, that Strong and her marksmen would engage the stalkers before we had to. I'd figured out one secret Red Kate really didn't want me to know. She was almost out of bullets. It was pretty obvious when I thought about it. She'd talked about reinforcements, but they never came. She had no heavy weapons. I figured that Anubis couldn't spare any more materiel to use on us, just like the army wouldn't. She only had what she could carry when she came to Hearth, and that couldn't last forever. She had stopped raiding Hearth with assault rifles and turned to firebombs instead. When her people did get inside the wall for the first time, they'd come at us with hand weapons or with assault rifles that carried only one or two bullets each. She must have burned through her ammunition even faster than we did. But like us, she'd been smart enough to ration what she had. She'd kept a reserve enough for each stalker to kill a couple of us. Had Strong been able to drag her into a protracted firefight right at the start of this battle, we could have forced Kate to use what bullets she had left. Then and only then were we supposed to fall on them with our improvised knives and clubs. Now we had been forced to reveal ourselves too early, while she still had enough bullets to go around, if her people were careful with them. Even as I ran out into the main square, my knife in my hand, I knew I was running toward a bloodbath. Chapter 145 I heard the sputtering sound of the assault rifles immediately as they chewed through their last bullets. A positive standing right next to me was cut down, a guy in a plaid shirt that turned black as his blood leaked through it. He grabbed my arm as he fell and nearly pulled me down, I shrugged him off and ran into the melee. There were stalkers everywhere and screaming positives, and half the town was still on fire. I ignored the bullets whizzing all around me and threw myself into the fight. I found a stalker, and I slashed and hacked at him with my knife, the knife that still had Costa's blood ground into its blade, the knife I'd taken from Red Kate. Another stalker came at me with a shovel, I cut low and sliced through the thick muscles of his thigh, and his screams echoed inside his black helmet. He tried to cut my foot off with his shovel, and I stabbed again, up and under the bottom rim of the helmet, aiming for his throat. I think I cut his face instead. He reached for it with both hands, seemingly not comprehending that the helmet was in the way. A bullet scored my left shoulder, and I cried out a little at the sudden pain, but it didn't even slow me down. I turned and saw bodies lying before me, turned around again and found two stalkers trying to flank me. I lunged, and one of them jumped back, but I knew the other one would get me. He had a knife almost as fancy as the one Red Kate carried, and I expected it to drive right through my guts and out my stomach at any second. When it didn't happen, I spared a moment and saw that he was dead, knocked down by a positive with a sledgehammer. I nodded my thanks and moved on. I tried to focus on keeping my people alive. I wasn't always successful. I couldn't get to Lucy in time. The radio operator had a ball-peen hammer in either hand, and three stalkers were trying to get close enough to take them away from her. She smacked one of them across the kneecap, and he dropped. She hit another on top of his helmet, and it was enough to disorient him, to make him lower his guard so she could smash in the right side of his ribcage. The third stalker had a long chain. He whipped it around her neck and pulled, and she stumbled, falling down the steps in front of the municipal building. I could hear the pop 
as her neck snapped. I squeezed my eyes shut in rage, but only for a moment. There was plenty of killing left to do. I found a stalker carrying an assault rifle and stomped right toward him, not caring if he shot me. He pointed the weapon at me and shouted for me to get down on my knees. When I just kept coming, he actually threw the gun at me. It bounced off my chest. I didn't even feel it. He was defenseless when I got to him, completely unarmed. I pulled his helmet off and slashed his throat until he bled out. I was in no mood to be merciful. These assholes had burned down half of Hearth. They'd killed my people. Even if we surrendered, they would still have killed a tenth of us. And me. They didn't get any sympathy. They certainly weren't giving any. I walked right past the corpse of our chief swineherd, Harry. He had been a good kid. Cheerful, even when we were starving in the winter. The stalkers had smashed his face in until I recognized him only by the glasses twisted across what used to be his nose. I saw them cut down Jane, who used to sing for us to keep us entertained on our long walk from the medical camp. She had a voice so sweet it was like listening to the wind sigh through the trees on a moonlit night. The stalkers broke her legs, then stabbed her four times in the back as she tried to crawl away. And then I saw them surround Luke, my old friend from the medical camp, chief among my advisors. Luke, who'd shown us how to keep the fire from consuming the entire town. Three stalkers came at him at once. I raced toward him, and my blood ran cold because I knew I wouldn't make it in time. Ran faster until I thought the wound in my belly would open. Ran right past a stalker who tried to knock me down with a club. I collided with one of the stalkers who had pinned Luke down, knocked him sideways, away from my friend, lashed out with my knife and hamstringed another of the three. The third one had his hands wrapped around Luke's throat. He was going to strangle Luke, but before he could, I jabbed upward, and my knife sank through yielding flesh inside his rib cage. He let go of Luke and was dead before he hit the ground. Luke tried to say something, but I shook my head. The stalker I had knocked sideways had already recovered and was coming at me with what looked like a sickle. I slashed at him, and he jumped backward. Finn! Luke croaked out. Finn! The sickle came around, shimmering in the air, orange with reflected firelight. I leaned back, almost falling on my ass as its point tore through my shirt. He was fast. He recovered almost instantly and aimed another swing, this time at my legs. I stabbed downward with my knife and impaled his arm as he started screaming. I grabbed him and threw him aside, even as the other stalker, the one I'd hamstringed, started grabbing at my ankles. Luke brought one boot down hard on the stalker's back, then kicked his helmet a few times for good measure. Finn, he said. I had to wrestle with the bloodlust singing in my head before I could acknowledge him. What is it, Luke? I said, and I think some rage must have remained in my voice because he flinched backward. Jesus, just say it! Finn, he couldn't even look at me. Finn, Red Kate. I turned around and she was standing right there smiling at me. Hi, Stones, she said. She pulled a pistol from her belt and smacked me across the face with it, stunning me. Then she flipped it around and shot Luke right through his left eye. Chapter 146 I didn't lose consciousness. Black spots swam before my eyes, and I heard a high-pitched tone that was loud enough to deafen me, but I could still kind of see, and I wasn't completely unable to use my muscles. I couldn't stop Kate, though, as she plucked the knife from my hand and shoved it into her own belt. She put the barrel of her gun under my chin and looked me right in the eye. You figured it out, huh? That we were low on ammo. Not low enough, I said, judging by the number of my people you got. I glanced out over the main square, not moving my head, not giving her any reason to pull her trigger. Though we seem to have done okay for ourselves, there were a lot of bodies out there. Not so many people standing up, but the majority of the living looked like positives. Yeah, well, this gun's still pretty full. You understand? Sure, I said. She frog-marched me to the nearest house, just a few yards away. She shoved me inside and sent me sprawling. Stay down, she said, on all fours like a dog. Got it? I made no attempt to jump up and lunge for her. I'd seen how Luke died. The pistol was no joke. Jesus, 
Luke. Luke was dead. He'd come so far with me. He'd been by my side so long. I depended on him. Kate got my attention with a kick to my ribs. Looks like you won this one, she said, pacing back toward the house's front windows. She gestured for me to come and take a look. That meant getting up into a sort of half-crouch, but she allowed it. It wasn't like I could do much while she kept her gun trained on me the whole time. She wanted me to look through the window and see what was going on out there. I did take a quick look. I saw the remaining stalkers had taken up a defensive position, standing back to back in the middle of the square. They slashed and clubbed at anyone who tried to get close to them. The positives surrounding them kept moving, testing them, looking for an opening. On the far side of the square, I saw Strong, with one of her snipers leaning on her shoulder for support. They both looked pretty beat up. Originally, the plan had been for her team, which had numbered four people, to come through town hitting the stalkers from behind. Clearly, they'd met more resistance than expected. But the fact that two of them made it into town meant there was no reserve force of stalkers out there. The battle was over. We'd won. Red Kate, however, clearly intended to live to fight another day. Not if I can help it, I thought. Once I'd taken in the scene in the square, I glanced down at her belt. My knife, the knife I'd taken from her my first day in the wilderness, was right there. I could grab the hilt, pull it free, bury it in her heart in less than a second. Of course, she could pull her trigger a lot faster than that. Outside in the square, someone shouted for attention. I looked back out there and saw Kylie, her huge pregnant belly preceding her. There was blood on her shirt, but it didn't look like her own. She waved her hands in the air and called for peace. You can live, she said to the stalkers, if you all surrender. Some of them threw down their weapons immediately. A few kept slashing and jabbing. Without their friends supporting them, though, they were vulnerable, and my positive swept in and finished things. Some of the stalkers just had their weapons knocked out of their hands. Some were butchered like pigs. I didn't like that much but I wasn't in a position to make new laws about being graceful in victory. Besides, for me, the battle wasn't over yet. Chapter 147 Hey! Red Kate shouted as the positives got the surviving stalkers down on the ground and started tying their hands. Hey! Kylie! When there was no response... Kate smashed the glass out of the window and leaned her head through. Hey! she called. Kylie looked over and saw us both framed in the window. I saw fear and confusion wash across her features. I think we might need to make a deal, Kate said. Kylie came closer. I tried to warn her away with my eyes. I didn't want Kate shooting her out of spite. But Kylie came within ten yards of us and stared in through the window. Our eyes met and I saw she knew I was in trouble. You make any moves I don't like, Kate said, and Stones is dead. You understand? Kylie nodded. I know the score here, Kate told her. I get that you can just flood this house with your little friends, throw people at me until one of them gets me, but I figure my hostage gives me a little room for negotiation. Kate pushed me forward until my head was out the window, too. She stuck the barrel of the gun against the top of my head. I could feel the agitation in her, feel her heart thudding against my back. Are you listening to me? Do you hear me, whore? Kylie nodded. Yes, I hear you. What do you want? Me and my guys walk out of here, unharmed. That's it. We just walk away. Kylie's face lost all expression. I knew what that meant. Well, Kay, what's your answer? No, Kylie said. Kate couldn't believe it. She flinched against my back, her whole body convulsing at the idea that Kylie might defy her. No. What do you mean, no? I've got your guy right here. Your fucking baby daddy. Don't you care if he lives or dies? Of course I do, Kylie said. Then, but I also know, Kylie went on that if anyone is willing to die for Hearth, it's Finn. So the answer is no. Kill him or don't. You aren't leaving here alive. 
Chapter 148 Kate went rigid with fear. The gun in her hand moved, just a little, so that the barrel wasn't pointing at my head. Then she lifted it and pointed it at Kylie instead. No! I shouted. No! I reared upward, definitely reopening my wound, but I didn't care. I had to get in the way of the shot. Kate fired her pistol. The blast deafened me, and I could feel the bullet digging through my flesh, down the side of my neck and across my shoulder. It didn't hurt at all. Not at first. I shoved into her with my shoulder, and the gun flew out of her hand. In the same moment, I grabbed my knife out of her belt. I brought the knife up, and I could distinctly see the eagle engraved on the blade, flashing in firelight. Kate wasted no time. She drew her own longer knife, the cult's knife. I don't know what Kylie saw outside. I don't know if she ordered our people to attack or if she told them to stand back and let me finish this personally. Either way, the effect would be the same. It would take a couple of seconds for even the closest positives to get inside the house to help me. I was on my own until then, and in that time, this would all be over. Kate brought her blade high as if she would stab me in the face or the throat. I went low, aiming at her legs. Maybe I intended to take her alive. I have no idea. I wasn't thinking in words or even fully formed thoughts. I saw Kate's blade come down toward me, and I twisted out of the way. She danced back to avoid my strike. Suddenly there was space between us, room to maneuver. She started to sidestep, but I cut her off with a feint. Ike had trained me how to fight with the knife. He'd shown me what they taught him in basic training. There were two kinds of knife fights, he'd explained. You could dance around each other, slashing each other until one of you bled out. Or you could go for a single attack, right for the kill. With all the strength I had left in me, all the rage, all the adrenaline, I lunged forward and stabbed right for her heart. She was fast, much faster than me, and she brought her arm down to block my attack. Her blade cut through all the flesh of my wrist and knocked my blade down below the level of her heart. But I had enough momentum going that my lunge couldn't be stopped. My knife sank deep into her abdomen, just below her sternum. I could feel its top edge rasp against bone. I had to let go. One of the muscles in my arm was completely severed, and I couldn't control some of my fingers anymore. I took a step back and watched as she dropped her own knife. She stared down at herself for a second, as if she couldn't believe what had happened. Then she grabbed my knife and pulled it out of her body. Blood spouted from the wound, jetting across the floor and splashing on my shirt. It gushed out with the rhythm of her pulse. She gulped noisily, and then coughed and red bubbles flicked her lips. Got my lung, she wheezed. Jesus, all I wanted. The word turned into a gasping cough that spilled blood all down her chin. All I wanted. I never got to find out what she wanted. She was dead before the door slammed open. Dead before positives started running in from the back of the house. I could hardly believe it. After so long, Red Kate was dead. I felt exactly the same way as I had when I saw Adair die. Like at any second, she was going to stand back up and terrorize us some more. She was, like Adair, a fixture of the wilderness, of the world after the crisis. She was supposed to live forever. Except the world was changing, and she wasn't going to be part of what was yet to come. The world hadn't ended. It wasn't dead. There was no room for maggots like her anymore. Kylie put a tourniquet on my sliced up arm, kept me from bleeding out. Others carried me to the hospital in the municipal building. Somebody fetched the pain pills. So much motion, so much activity all around me. I didn't care. Didn't pay much attention. Hearth was safe. Chapter 149 Of course, it might all have been temporary. All I'd fought and bled to achieve, all the positives who died defending Hearth, all of it might have meant nothing. I'd killed Costa, 
and twenty stalkers, so they sent Kate and a hundred. Next time, maybe, they would send Michigan Mike or Anubis himself, legendary figures I could barely imagine, with an army of thousands. Maybe. We were pretty scared, I'll admit, when the helicopters came. It happened three weeks later, and the whole time we'd been waiting, hoping. The aircraft landed on the open ground out near the highway, five of them setting down like giant birds coming to roost. It was already dusk by then, so we couldn't see the paint on their fuselages. Couldn't tell if it was army green or a pattern of skulls. So we were ready. We were armed for whoever came, even though we knew we would never survive another battle like the one we'd fought against Red Kate. It was dark beneath the trees, as the first emissary of this new force arrived. I could see him only in silhouette as he approached. I tried to calm myself as he came closer. Then he walked up to our front gate and gave me a big smile and said, Finn, it's me, buddy. Finn, let me inside. It was Ike. Ike, my partner from my subway fishing days. Ike, who'd gotten me out of the medical camp. Ike, who'd walked away when I needed him the most in that bad first winter. I let him in. I let him and all his fellow soldiers in, and they were amazed to see all the gravestones in the main square, but they were also amazed to see we were still alive. For my part, I was startled to see that Ike had a scar all the way down his side from his armpit to his ribcage, a souvenir from the battle he'd fought in New Mexico. He pulled up his shirt to show it to me. A stalker put about six bullets in me, he said. I lost my spleen and my gallbladder, but... As long as I don't eat spicy food, they say I can have a pretty normal life. I did a quick calculation in my head. He was 15 years old. I showed him my own scars. The one on my stomach was almost healed, though he never did get the bullet out. The damage to my hand was a lot worse, and I didn't think I'd be using it anymore. But I had a spare one. Wow, Ike said as we toured the half of town that had been destroyed in the fire. We'd had time to rebuild our wall, but nothing more. Not yet. I kind of wish I'd been here to see the fighting. I turned to stare at him. You could have been, I said. I forced myself not to say that he had abandoned us when things got tough. He looked so stricken anyway, so embarrassed that he'd left us when we could have really used his help, that I relented and pulled him into a hug. His unit had brought some medical supplies with them, just what they normally carried, first aid kits, really. We desperately needed everything they could spare. So many injured still. So many in makeshift bandages, arms and slings. So many fighting off infections that might have killed them. There was stuff in those medical kits we didn't even know what to do with. The soldiers didn't want to touch us, of course. We were still positives. But they showed us how to clean out gunshot wounds, and how to fight off sepsis, and how to administer a course of antibiotics. If that was all they came to do to help us heal, I would have been grateful. But they had a different mission. Part of it was taking our prisoners away. The stalkers who had surrendered in the main square, 27 in total, had been languishing in the municipal building's library, locked in with our books. We had fed them and given them water. We'd tried to tend to their injuries, but they were too terrified we would infect them. Three of them had died even before the army showed up. I didn't cry about it. There was no big ceremony. The stalkers were herded into one of the helicopters, and it flew away. I knew I would never see them again. The commanding officer of the soldiers, a Texan named Lieutenant Groves, explained why they'd brought so many helicopters and troops. We weren't sure who we would find here, he said. Not to put too fine a point on it, we expected y'all would be dead, and that lot would be in charge. He laughed. Colonel Parkhurst hoped we'd find you still here, but we doubted it. A hundred stalkers ain't small potatoes. I can see why he respects you so much, taking them all down with what you got here. Give the colonel my thanks, please, I said. I think we can do better than that. Chapter 150 I'd never flown in a helicopter before. 
I have to say, it wasn't the best experience of my life. I was sick most of the time. I couldn't hear a word over the noise of the rotor, and every time we changed course, I thought we were going to fly into a mountain. When we slowed down over Denver and then hovered over a place called Cheeseman Park, I wasn't fit to talk to anybody, especially after I looked out over the skyline of the city and saw grinning skulls painted on every skyscraper, at least the ones that weren't collapsed in piles of rubble. The army had just finished taking Denver back from the cult, and from what I saw, only part of the city had survived. The helicopter settled down to the ground, and they let me lie in the grass until I felt like I wasn't going to vomit. The soldiers laughed at me, but I didn't care. When I felt better, they took me into a stone pavilion that was covered over by camouflage netting. Inside, I saw a table with a big map on it, and a soldier who was busy drawing little red crosses on the towns and mountains it showed. It made me think of Adair's marked-up atlas, which had helped us so much in New Jersey. There was nobody else in the pavilion. I figured we were waiting for somebody else to show up. Maybe to pass the time, the soldier straightened up and looked at me for a second, then pointed at the bandages wrapped around my forearm. That looks like quite the wound, he said. This? I asked. I shrugged. Worth it? I looked at him for the first time and saw how old he was. Not just worn down by time and circumstance, but chronologically old. His skin hung in wrinkles from his face, and he was so thin he looked like somebody had hung an army uniform on a broomstick. I didn't know enough about the army to understand their insignia. He had four stars on his shoulders and a bunch of medals on his chest, so I guessed he was kind of important. He had a name tag on his uniform that said Clark. We heard about the battle you fought. Ours was a little bigger, he said, making a sweeping gesture to indicate the city around us. But maybe they weren't that dissimilar. This is my hometown, you see. It's a place I love. A place I've fought for many times. First the zombies, now the cult just like you fought for your hearth. I'm from New York originally, I told him. He nodded. I actually knew that already, Finnegan. I know a fair bit about you. I checked your records, saw your birth date. Somebody helped me do the math. He pointed at my left hand. That tattoo's out of date, you know. What? I was just beginning to suspect that we weren't waiting for someone else that this was the man they'd brought me so far to meet. You're twenty-one years old. It's been more than twenty years since you were potentially infected. That means you're not a positive anymore. He gave me a gentle smile. If you'd like, I can have you flown back to New York. You can start a new life there. I laughed. Seriously? Oh, yes, the man replied. Thanks, but... I don't know. For one thing, I've been exposed to so many zombies over the last year or so, I can't imagine I'm actually clean. I've got to be infected, right? And for another, well, you know so much about me. You must know I've already made a new life for myself in Hearth. With the woman I love. And soon a baby, he said, and a beatific smile lit up his face. It was like he'd never been happier in his life, than imagining Kylie and me and our baby. Exactly what I expected you to say, of course. I just wanted to let you know you had options. All right. I have a lot of things to see to, but while we have this chance, I wanted to ask you one thing. Okay, I said. What can we do for you? I shook my head. I don't understand. You're a hero, young man. You and your town took care of a hundred stalkers, troops of the cult we didn't have to fight here. Beyond that, there's the fact that you're rebuilding. It's been twenty years. I've spent all that time putting out fires, fighting insurgencies, achieving nothing. In the last year, you created a new walled town and showed that it could thrive. I respect that, more than I think you know. Okay. I said again, not getting it. What I'd done? 
It hadn't been so I could help the army. It didn't seem to matter. Not to him. You're not a soldier, so I can't give you a medal. But I'd like to give you something to show my respect. Something for your town. What'll it be, Finnegan? Do you need a water purification still? Guns to fight off zombies? A herd of cattle? I thought about it for a second. We can get or make all those for ourselves. If we don't know how yet, we'll learn. He nodded approvingly. I'll tell you what we want, actually, I said, having a sudden inspiration. We want people. People? You have a medical camp in Akron. I, uh, I kind of emptied that one out. But there's another one, somewhere out west of here, I think. In Pasadena, yes. I took a breath. I want the people from that one, too. The Positives. That's who lives in Hearth. Positives, he said. He smiled. Then he held out his hand for me to shake. He laughed for a second, then held out his left hand, since I couldn't use my right. Chapter 151 It took a while for them all to get to Hearth, all the patients from the camp in Pasadena, but they're here now. All the positives who were still being shipped to Akron, too. They come here now instead, in twos and threes, flown in by army helicopter. And Hearth grows. It gets bigger every day, and we're not afraid of the coming winter. It grows another way, too. In case you're wondering, it was a girl. Kylie gave birth to a little girl, just a little over seven pounds, easily the most beautiful child who ever lived, if you ask me. We named her Heather. We didn't tattoo her little hand, and we're not going to. This is Nick Podell. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Positive, a novel by David Wellington. This program was produced by Elgin Productions. The director was John McElroy. Executive producer, Caitlin Gehring. Text copyright 2015 by David Wellington. Production copyright 2015 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.